Hello and welcome to the Bond Revisited podcast with me, Tom. And me, Joe. The podcast where we rewatch the Bond films one by one, discuss them, and then rank them alongside the other Bond films to build our definitive list for the Bond franchise. You are listening to episode 11, where I'll be revisiting the film Moonraker. So it's been brought to my attention that I don't think people like this film, Joe. Who says such a thing? I, I don't know. I can't believe it, but apparently this is one of the like most hated films out there. I can't quite believe it, and I also can at the exact same time. <laughs> uh, it's, it's quite funny, actually, because earlier today I was browsing Hot UK Deals. A little plug for them. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> you got and coincidentally, uh, the exact same day we're recording this, Moonraker on Blu-ray came up on the list. Oh, okay. Which it doesn't often, for some reason. Uh, but it came up being like, oh, on Blu-ray, £2.74, I think it was. So I was like, oh, there's a load of comments on there. Let's take a look at that. And it was a bit like they weren't talking about the deal and the price or anything. It was just a big war in the comments between like, this is the worst Bond film I hated. And other people saying, no, it's great. I love it. It's one of the best. How could you? Uh, so very, very divided opinions in that comment section. So are you saying you haven't got a referral link to share to our listeners? I don't know. I'll send an email <laughs> during this and see what happens. But uh, okay. no, but sadly not. I, I, it's funny because, uh, yeah, I, I've heard of sort of similar and I've read similar sort of viewpoints of, of really kind of the, the whole sci-fi aspect of this film and, and just people hating it. But the thing I got from watching this recently is that I can't believe just, just how similar it is to The Spy Who Loved Me. It's It's so flagrant in its carbon copy uh it, it's like it's funny how two such similar films can be so wildly different with opinions well it's very similar yes like there's so many things they just ripped out of the last film and put into this one but for me anyway and maybe this is jumping ahead it did have a very different feel to it and i almost feel like the way we're watching these films that it might actually be better like someone might get on more with moonraker if they watched it in a vacuum and didn't watch after the spy who loved me because like the spy who loved me was the big hit and then this is the carbon copy that also did a load of things different so it's kind of like comparing the two one is always going to come less favorably which is well moonraker yeah that is true i think especially given that we have just watched the spy who loved me a lot of the the similarities or where they've tried to do it but not quite as well really shines through Hmm. it does make me think like obviously we approach this ranking and this podcast by doing it in order there is a part of me that kind of would be very interested to see what if we had done this by like just doing a random order put all the names in the list randomize them and then just watch them in that way and see how the list was built up well, that was one of the, when you first came to me with this idea about doing this podcast, that was one of the things I thought we, we might do is do it randomly. But uh, yeah, I think that would have ended up with a very different, well, obviously a very different um, uh, list right now, given that we'd have watched different films. But the final order probably would have been different too. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm very curious about. Like, we obviously didn't do that because that would be way too confusing for people, I think. Like, if you just want to hear what we think of the Bond films and you're like, okay, so I'll check out Dr. No, but okay, that's episode 21, what? Uh, (laughs) uh, But yeah, I think it would be a different list. I think it would be very different because then you just, you don't compare the films in the same way. And this is another one where we talked about The Spy Who Loved Me is copying off You Only Live Twice, but we've seen it before and we're going to see it again. But yeah, it's another one where it just copies a lot from another film. So now as we go into this, we're just going to compare them. Yeah. And I just want to make it very crystal clear right at the top of the podcast that I'm going to sound very hypocritical because I'm going to be, as I'm discussing this with you, I'm probably going to be bashing the film a lot of times and saying things didn't really work and this was kind of crap. I'm fairly sure it's still going to go quite high on my list regardless. Well, that's what I got wrong last time, didn't I? I thought you had this above The Spy Who Loved Me. But where did you actually have Moonraker? Was this at number five? Uh, This was at number four. It was right below, right below The Spy Who Loved Me. Wow. Wow. Because yeah. I don't think I listed it at all in either of mine. So I didn't think it was at the very bottom or at the very top. So it's interesting that you had it as high as four. I know, right? <laughs> it's mad. <laughs> uh, so I guess ex- expectations were high from your side. It's actually one of the more recent films I had watched before starting this uh, ranking. Kind of like how you had said with The Man with the Golden Gun. Um, this was one that I'd only watched maybe a few months 
yeah, a few months Every ago. Every second so. Sunday for you, this <laughs> film, isn't it? So it, it was quite fresh in my mind and I kind of knew what to expect, which I think helped. Wow, okay, so you'd seen it recently and then said, yes, that is my number four film. Yeah, yeah, it stayed there. <laughs> okay, that's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's a little bit different because I watched this back in 2012 for 007 Legends and I remember being like, there's stuff I like about it, but it's a bit silly for my taste. But it has been like 10, 11 years since that point. And also, I am warming to this cheese a little bit. The Roger Moore cheese. Mm -hmm. Like, not not so much Diamonds Are Forever, obviously, but I have enjoyed some of those elements more than I thought I had. So going into this one, I was like, okay, I kind of roughly know what this is, and this is a silly film. I'm going to try what I did for Diamonds Are Forever unsuccessfully and just take Moonraker as it is and try and enjoy those silly elements that I've enjoyed in the large Roger Moore films and just try and take it for what it is. I think you've enjoyed some of the cheese more than I have, surprisingly, in the past few that we've watched. So, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you're being very open to that. Well, I'm a very open-minded guy, Joe, as you know. Oh, yes, as everyone says. <laughs> okay, well, let's just get into this. So, we have the circles, and at this point, I always think it's the music different. I think I might just have to stop caring about the music of this, because oh. it's just driving me insane that I don't know if it's different or not. But I think the music was different this oh, time. See, of course it was. <laughs> of course it was. I, I heard it slightly... I just heard more of like... In my notes, all I put was it like made like a, a, ting, a ting noise. Like there was like a little triangle or some little sparkliness to the Bond theme that I didn't recognise before. Huh. So... I think it was a slightly different Bond kind of gun barrel. Sorry, not the Bond theme, but John the gun Barry, barrel. what are you doing to us? I know, he just likes to keep us on our toes. I appreciate it. So, yeah, John Barry is back for this one. I don't know if that's why. Maybe it was different last time. Even Maybe it wasn't different last time. I don't know. But, yeah, I'm going to have to disconnect from this a little bit. But uh, the walk is the same. Roger Moore comes across. He does his little shot. That's all the same from the last film. No difference there. Unless you want to tell me otherwise. And I missed it. Nope. No, all good. No diamonds, no sparklies. <laughs> no, still the slow turn. It's still there. Ah, there we go. So, yeah, so we start off with a plane in the sky uh, with a spacecraft or a space shuttle, shuttle on it. And on this space shuttle, it says Moonraker in big, bold letters. And we see a couple of pilots. So this like plane is just shipping this space shuttle uh, somewhere. And we have these two pilots. One is English and one is American. And we get some dramatic music kick in. And it shows two of the people inside the space shuttle that's attached to the plane getting out of, like, these future beds. Yeah. I don't future know. Beds. Like, <laughs> yeah, like those Star trek -y sort of future sort of like beds. Like pods. Yeah. yeah, like pods. Like Planet of the Apes is, is what I was thinking. Uh, and... <laughs> In my notes, I just put, they be creeping. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, that is one of the things. I knew this was coming, and it, I forgot just how quickly you do see it because of this is pre title sequence of the the fake zero-G, <laughs> which is, often is just people moving slowly because that's all they could do, really. I mean, it's 1979. So, yeah, just like slow moving to simulate low gravity. Mm, see, I didn't even really pick up that that was what that was supposed to be. Because they're still in Earth's atmosphere. Why would they be slow like that? Oh, maybe, maybe they were just tired. Like Maybe they were aching from the sleep. I don't know. Later on, you definitely get that. Maybe, oh, maybe I was yeah. a bit premature. Maybe they didn't want the spacecraft to creak like kids <laughs> sneaking <laughs> through the house. Don't want to wake the parents. Those creaky floorboards of the space shuttle. Oh, yeah. They didn't have the budget for it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so they're in the cockpit. They, they were hiding in there. They get out of... Well, they get into the cockpit. Apologies. So they were hiding in the spacecraft. They get out, they go into the cockpit, and they take off, basically. They they get everything going, they get the engine on the space shuttle off, and shoot forward, and the jets from the space shuttle blow up the plane. Um, yeah. Which is a very nice explosion. It is. Say. And did you recognise that the, the, the British guy flying, who says, like, oh, always trust the RAF, that sort of... It's got a young guy. It's the same guy from... The Spy Who Loved Me that immediately dies after saying, I'll go in <laughs> at the end. Oh. The same actor. So he came back to life and then died straight away again. <laughs> he's had, what, like two minutes of screen time between the two films and he's died yeah. in both. 
Yeah, not great. Um, not great innings for that guy. <laughs> yeah, he's the Sean Bean of the Bond franchise. He really is. <laughs> Poor guy. But yeah, so the space shuttle leaves, and we cut to Bernard Lee or M on the phone. I say Bernard Lee because I believe this is his last appearance, right? I think you told me it that is. before. Yeah. And I have to say, I love the guy. He is looking quite old here. He's looking quite pale, I found. He looks kind of a bit, like, gaunt and, yeah, like, not not well, clearly. Yeah, he doesn't look okay, um, which is kind of... It's a bit sad to see. Uh, it's definitely very bittersweet every time you see M in this film because it's, like, really nice to see Bernard Lee as M and M is still great in this film, but it's just he looks quite weak and tired and we kind of know where it goes so yeah it was quite like the fact that this is like the first scene and you see him straight away i was like oh man that's yeah i'm just sad (laughs) yeah um but he he basically is on the phone and gets told what's going on and it's it's the same gag as last time where he's like i'm gonna put my best man on it don't worry about that so he goes over to Money Penny and says, "Why is Bond? Uh, what's going on with the Africa job that Bond's on?" And Money Penny says, "He's on his last leg, sir." Of which we cut to Bond stroking a woman's leg and kissing oh. her. So good, so good, so genius. I, I will <laughs> say that, like, th- this is I don't I don't mind, I don't mind them reusing. Like, Spy Who Loved Me was a big hit. Very successful, brought the series the series back to some sort of you know success and stability, so they thought. So right, let, let's just copy and the same director we should add as well. It's, it's Lewis mm. Gilbert once again, but um, so I get that. But this is the exact same shot, like literally down to the angles where you see M open his door and Money Penny through the doorway. It's just like could they not maybe have done something a little bit different? It's just oh, it's just too much, too much. Oh yeah, definitely. Like we talked about it last time how well we we don't really hate these jokes, but they do them so often that it's just kind of becoming a bit much. And the fact that Moonraker starts off with that exact type of joke just ripped from Spy Who Loved Me, just tweaked a little bit. It's like Yeah. It 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 made me laugh because of how like blatant they were doing this. Like <laughs> it made me laugh for the wrong reasons. Yeah, same. Uh, so yes, yeah, so Bond's in the plane with this young woman kissing her and we well actually we zoom out to see that they're on a plane um, a different plane from before and then oh let me get this right so he's he's kissing the woman the pilot then shoots the controls of the plane and then comes out but also the woman has a gun and points it at bond I think I got that in the wrong order I think the woman says ah I've got you bond and has a gun and then the pilot comes out I don't blame you. This this literally this happens so they waste absolutely no time. This literally happens in the span of about ten seconds, I wanna say. It's mad yeah. how quick. Yeah, so the the tagline of this film is something like uh where all bonds end, this one begins. And I believe it's kind of referring to this sequence and this stunt. Because oh, it's okay. it's like Goldfinger, right, on the plane, and usually Bond kinda ends the films on these planes and we get the whole Bond on the plane double cross. And then a big action sequence. So I'm assuming that tagline is referring to this. I didn't, yeah, I didn't put those two together, but that's, yeah, that makes sense. But yes, yeah, so we got the pilot with a gun and Bond with a gun. And the yeah, the controls have been completely shot out. So Bond attacks the pilot. They have a little bit of a fight, very quick fight. And the door of the plane opens up entirely. That just goes and Bond is hanging out of the plane. We get some shots of outside of the plane and Bond hanging out the door, just hanging on as the pilot's trying to kick him out. Uh, and we get some very blatant shots there. I would say does not look like Roger at all. Yeah, no, that's 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 fair. It's 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 not. It's right, I'm not going to judge too harshly. I don't blame him. And you don't hang Roger Moore out of a plane. Um, But yeah, they try and zoom it out. And it's cool that we get these shots of outside of the plane and people hanging out of it. That in itself is quite cool. Uh, But you can just tell by the hair that that's not Roger's uh, mane. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so uh, James Bond is being pushed out, but he does the old flipperoo and the pilot kicks out. But importantly, the pilot is wearing a parachute and Bond is not. Uh, So the, the pilot is basically 
by destroying the controls, he's planning to kind of kill Bond and crash the plane or crash the plane with Bond on it. But the pilot jumps out of the plane. And as Bond climbs back in after the pilot jumps out, Jaws is there. What? <laughs> wow. No indication uh, before this point. Jaws is there and just pushes Bond out and yep. smiles. <laughs> he's a happy guy. Yeah, he can teleport, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about the supernatural element of Jaws, but they do... Well, I think this is the only time they do this whole teleporting thing, but it is very kind of supernatural, the idea of this just massive person on a tiny plane somehow being able to hide and then just show up. Well, listen, we've seen how well Jaws can hide in wardrobes on trains, so he's just got a lot of practice. He knows what he's doing by now. Yeah, the, he's figured it out. Whatever his trick is, he's figured it out. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. It is very similar to the closet scene. I didn't really put that together, but it is the same bit, isn't it? Pretty much, yeah. Hmm. So yeah, so Jaws pushes Bond and smiles and shows off his metal teeth and just sees Bond fall. And so we've now got the pilot falling and we got Bond falling from this massive height just going down in the sky. And Bond sees the pilot and starts tracking over to him or tracks him down. And at this point, the Bond theme plays and it's all very exciting. And Bond gets to the pilot, grabs him. They have another bit of a fight uh, trying to grab the gun and they just start spinning in the air. And we get a lot of different cuts showing all of this. A lot of different like outside cuts showing them falling. A lot of shots of in first person. I think we've got some like green screen or blue screen or whatever you want to call it. We get some of those as well. Lots of different shots um, with their fighting and... Did you notice with the Bond theme here that, like, they extend it in a way that sounds really bad? I did not notice that, no. Oh, so they added in, like, an extra kind of, uh, what would you call it? Not a bar. Like, like, like a stanza. Yeah, like, they redid the end bit. Like, they did it twice, but for some reason the edit was really bad. So it's really obvious where they kind of shove it in to play it a second time. Oh, is that when they need it for when Jaws comes in again? No, no, this is here. Oh, right. Okay, so it's just just bad. All right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just, don't worry about it. It's just bad. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, but eventually Bond gets to the guy and gets the parachute off him quite awkwardly, but I guess that's what needs to happen, right? He needs to be able to, like, take off the guy's parachute and puts it on, um, which eventually he does, and Bond then kicks the pilot away, and the pilot's like, ah as Bond puts on this red and yellow parachute, which I'm assuming the red and yellow is a callback to The Spy Who Loved Me as well. Mm, oh, oh, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because his ski gear was red and yellow, and now we've got Moonraker where he's falling, and his parachute that he steals is also bright red and bright yellow. Yeah, maybe. I think so. So then he's trying to put it on, he's having a bit of trouble with the buckle, but Jaws has also jumped out of the plane. <laughs> oh, Jaws. <laughs> he couldn't get enough. Uh, and he starts falling, and then the Bond theme starts playing again. So we had it playing before, we get some weird edit where it stops, and then it now kicks in again, now that Jaws is falling, and mm -hmm. it's like, okay. Um, but we also get some shots of Jaws falling, which it, it's not fair to say, but also clearly not the actor. <laughs> like Clearly some other dude falling, and not um, Richard, I, I can't remember his name, but clearly not that guy. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely a very um, kind of... You can spot him. <laughs> uh, yes. Richard Keel is, is, is his name, the actor. Like They picked him because he is very distinctive. And even if you are like going like, through the air, crazy fast, lots of fast motion, you can still see it's not him. And it was kind of a, a bit... I've said this before, but like it was a it was a stunt that was doomed to fail, especially for people watching it on Blu-ray in high quality. Oh yeah, that that's fair. Like if you were watching this on TV, you wouldn't even notice. Like, yeah, and it's not actually really a big deal. It's just there's quite a few times where they show like Jaws's face as he falls, uh, but like not zoomed in, but like at an angle, and it's like yeah, that's not the guy. But still, it's fine. Uh, so yeah. Jaws catches up to Bond, grabs him goes for the old bite but at this moment bond pulls his parachute jaws goes to pull his but he just breaks it 
And we see a circus below. <laughs> of course. Of course. We have circuit yeah. music playing, and Jaws is like, ah! Uh, and then he lands in the circus, and it deflates, and that takes us to the to the credits or the intro sequence. So I really enjoyed this. Really? Uh, okay. I thought this this height kind of aspect to it and having people falling like this was really quite intense. Uh, and it really worked for me. Like, yes, there's there's some issues with the music where I think the way they use the Bond theme, like I think it's a great use of the Bond theme. Like, yes, play it during a stunt like this where you have people falling and trying to get to each other. But it sounded a bit weird. And yeah, I wasn't into the circus bit at the end. And yes, the actors are a little bit off. But I think the idea itself is really strong. And I think it is really kind of striking to see these people falling and the idea of Bond just kind of falling with a parachute trying to kind of catch this other guy like that in itself is like okay let, yeah let's go uh very kind of exciting start to the film so i yeah i really enjoyed this sequence uh, it's funny because i remember when i kind of reviewed this film in the past i i said that i, I love this this pre title sequence kind of just for the same reasons you said like this is such it's a cool idea you know stealing someone's parachute in midair um so cool and the fact that this was done for real, it's that's one of the things you can always, you know, you can give it to the 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 crew that did these films is that they did do a lot of stunts for real. We've seen it numerous times, um, just like the ski jump in the last film. This one, they just I think they did like eighty odd skydives to get all the footage for this, um, and it's great. But I don't know what it was about this time watching it. There was just a, such a such a disconnect for me in terms of I can. I can, you know, give give the film its credit for for doing this stunt, but I just couldn't. I was not. I know it's kind of silly to say for a Bond film, but I just wasn't very grounded in in the film. Like okay. that was so clearly it's so clearly not Roger, and it's so clearly not Jaws, and I know that shouldn't really bother me, but for this time it just did, and I, I just didn't feel anything because it was so. Like these sort of stunts, where it's such a night and day between these big wide open shots and then you've got the close-up inserts of Roger and and Richard that are done on the sound stage and it's like really jarring it didn't work for me this time and I think also coming from watching The Spy Who Loved Me so recently and where they got Jaws quite quite good I think as like a menacing character by the end it was a bit more comedy whereas this film it's like this character is comedic right from the get-go there is no they're not even trying to make him seem very menacing anymore, apart from maybe one scene we see later on. But that's because of the costume, less so him. It's like they're just going all out with, this is a comedy character now. He is not meant to be a very intimidating, scary henchman, which I just think is a bit of a shame. But I think any other time I would I would really like this. But this particular viewing it just didn't sit with me. I'm sad. Yeah. That's a weird one to kind of figure out because, of course, with these films, like, say we, we jump back to Dr. No. And you got the car chase scenes, and you can it looks terrible because of the rotoscoping. Like, mm-hmm. but you know, neither of us was like, oh, well, that looks terrible, so we're going to put it down in the ranking, or we're going to think lesser of it. You kind of it's a film from the '60s, early day, small budget, you accept it. But it sounds like with this film, you kind of aren't seeing it in that same light, and you're like h- holding it to a higher standard. Yeah, I think. I mean, it, it is a lot to do with the fact that they did bring Jaws back because they knew it was a fan favorite character but he's uh, he's just not as good in this film like it's just just like <laughs> well, I was going to say objectively I can't really say that but but for me it's just n- nowhere near as good in this film compared to the previous one. Oh okay so it is more about jaws rather than the, the uh, stunt itself. Um I don't know. It's um, it's a confusing mixture of feelings. I really want <laughs> I really want to like the stunt more but at the, at this time I didn't. Yeah, I suppose we'll move on, but that is very interesting because you only watched this a few months ago. <laughs> I know, and I loved it then. <laughs> very strange. But yeah, I guess there's something about watching these back to back, which makes you see this in a different light. I think so. I think that must be it. Mm-hmm. But no, I, I loved it. I, I very much enjoyed it. Uh, I think Spy Who Loved Me is better, but I think the fact that this is quite a practical effect of, and you know, a very simple one really and quite practical makes it more impressive for me. Yeah, um, and it made me think of Mission Impossible Fallout. If you ever saw that film, 
Um, they did a skydiving stunt. And I think there is just something very cool about seeing those sort of stunts in these sort of spy films. It's just a, it's just a very good fit. Cool spy guy falls from large height, has to grab somebody else, and it's all very dramatic. Yeah, definitely a good idea for uh, the the opening of the film, for sure. Hmm. So after Jaws's crash landing into the circus, where we even get a bit of like circus drum roll, um, that kicks off the title sequence, which um, is of course Moonraker, the song performed by Shirley Bassey for the third time. Um, I'll talk about the film first. Uh, sorry, the song first rather than the visuals. But I, I'm going to hold my hands up and say that I recognise that this is probably to most people the, the weakest Bassey song. Right. I really like it still. I actually might put this one above Goldfinger. I really like the Moonraker song. It's not it's nothing very interesting. Again, it's quite a slow, um, gentle, ballady type song. But it's just something about it I really like. Ah, uh, yeah. I I'm gonna be a bit more basic and say I don't like it. That's fair. As it, I I mean I, I do understand that because it is really it's not it's not up there in terms of the like, memorability of Goldfinger, and I think Diamonds Are Forever is 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 better for me. But I still really like it. Can't well, this is the romantic on. era, isn't it? Like, this is very much following on from what we saw with The Spy Who Loved Me, where it's more of a slower romantic song, and we've had those throughout Bond, but this is kind of carrying on for that. Which I don't dislike that side of Bond and the Bond themes. I think my problem with it is that. I don't think it plays the Shirley Bassey strength at all. Mm, that, Where like Goldfinger yeah. allows her to really show off her voice and even Diamonds Are Forever uh, to a certain extent as well. Where this one feels like they're trying to fit like a what is it, a square block in a circle hole or something. Like it's, it's forcing Shirley Bassey to sing this slower paced romantic song probably because nobody does it better was such a big hit and now they're trying to get someone very famous to do the similar sort of style and i don't think it fits her very well so i wouldn't say she does a bad job or anything but i think shirley bassey she needs a big hook she needs like a big memorable hook and it doesn't have to be goldfinger you know diamonds are forever didn't have a a massive hook but this film has no hook at all and to me, that kind of means it just kind of plods along and never really goes anywhere. And it's like, it's fine as background music, I guess. But as an actual Bond theme, that's supposed to kind of get you into the film. And especially over that opening, it just doesn't quite work. And I think we've just heard that romantic style of Bond theme better before. Um, sorry, Shirley, but I don't think <laughs> you were the one for this. To be fair, I, I'm sure she would probably agree with you. I was reading that I think she was given this song quite last minute so she doesn't really i was seeing like reading a quote that she doesn't even feel like she has ownership of it it's not her song in the same sense as diamonds are forever and goldfinger which makes sense to why maybe she didn't sing it during that the bond orchestra thing that we went to but um yeah i, I still really like it even though i, I fully accept all of those <laughs> those criticisms because they are valid it's just a soft spot for it in terms of the actual visuals though for the title sequence i gotta say it's really similar to spy who loved me and I, again, I just think they were quite dull. It was, I, I can't really even tell you anything that was dramatically different. A lot more silhouettes. Oh, there was one thing I liked, actually. Tell a lie. There was one thing I liked, which is where there's this one shot of like a woman doing sort of like a Superman pose, almost silhouetted. And then, <laughs> yeah. and then she suddenly like fills up with dots. And I was like, oh, are they bringing back the dots? Have I forgot about the dots? I'd like to see some dots. Give me some dots. And then no, they do it once and then they never do it again. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, they do have some dots, but it's not in the same, like, Doctor No sense. And I thought they might do something quite cool with the dots and, like, I've said dots too many times, um, bringing in, like, sci-fi, like, some like uh, visual tech stuff into it, maybe mixing that. No, nothing. So I really don't have much to say about the, uh, the visuals. I think it was just more of the same. It's just naff. And, like, what are they doing with these? Like, how have these been, like, just not very good for this many films? Yeah. Like, the last one that I think was good was Live and Let Die. Yeah. We've had, like, multiple films where it just seems like they've kind of given up a little bit, where it's just so basic. It's just, like, just put some blue lights and a bit of smoke and we'll have some women's silhouettes. They'll do some... Anyone got a trampoline? I guess we'll just use that this time. 
and they can just do some flips and we'll just zoom in into one of their faces. It's fine. And, oh, yeah, that's a lovely picture of Roger. We'll throw it in. It, <laughs> it just seems so, like, half-hearted. Like, they just don't really give these their own identity anymore. Like, all of the last four one, like, could have just... You could have swapped them and they would yeah. have worked because they're all so similar and just so forgettable. There's just no strong individual visual identity anymore and it's just kind of disappointing because we know how good they can be that's yeah it's true it's true i'm now waiting until we get to one that that does have that again i, I really hope it's soon i can't think off the top of my head so uh, it might be a nice surprise when the time comes but i don't think they need to do that much that's what bothers me about it where we get a little bit of the whole space theme because we get like one picture of earth or something like we get a little bit of that but they have the themes in with the films themselves. Like each uh, film has a strong theme that they could have incorporated into this. And you could have just said like, right, get a load of silhouetted women and then we'll just get a load of spacey pictures or something. Like that, that yeah. would have been enough. But yeah. they just don't for some reason. And they just keep it really generic. And it's like, it's right there. It's like what you were saying with the man with the golden gun. Like it was right there with the fun house <laughs> to do so many cool things. And they just don't. And I just don't get it. No, me neither. It's sad. Um, <laughs> it is sad. It's sad. But let's move on. Because uh, what else I find sad is is how the film then begins after the title sequence. Only for a little bit. But it, it cuts to... Um, Bond back in London, uh, back in MI6 offices, going to see M. So you get a bit of a money penny scene right at the beginning, and I just, I think it was this film where I've now realised that if you'd have asked me before doing this ranking, oh, you know, how's like the money penny Bond uh, relationship with with Roger Moore? I would have said, oh yeah, it's you know, it's good. It's I like them both. You know, it's just as good as Sean Connery. But actually, it's like no. It's definitely not. I really don't think they have... I, I just... There was nothing between this scene. I can't even remember what Bond says, but it's just... I feel like there's no chemistry between uh, Lois Maxwell and Roger Moore, especially not in this film. And it's kind of a shame because I, I, I remembered them being better together, but yeah, it's just not. Well, there was the recurring joke that... Well, they did twice, where Bond describes what he's done in the mission... And she just doesn't believe him. Oh, yeah, that's so it. It's like, yeah. oh, you're late, James. And it was like, oh, yes, I was falling out of a plane without a parachute. And she's like, hmm. And <laughs> Bond's like, well, I did. <laughs> and I that's did. it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. But yeah, it is odd. Like, there is no chemistry between these two. I think some of it is, like, I, I said this a few films ago, and I still believe it. Like, she is starting to look a bit old. Like, it's a bit... Like, I'm not saying if she was young, it would work, because we've seen Roger Moore with young women. That's not a great combo either. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> but, but, like, again, the way you saw Money Penny with Sean Connery, like, this is, like, 20 years ago, almost. And trying to recreate that same relationship and chemistry with a different actor, like, 20 years later, it's just never going to work. And they just haven't found a way to kickstart it again with something a bit fresh and different. Yeah. I'm not saying they needed to recast her or anything, but they just haven't found a good new spin on it. So it's always just kind of feels a little bit lesser than what we had with Sean. Yeah. It feels like they didn't really even try with this, but I guess they're just moving on. So yeah, Bond goes in to see M and in M's office, you've got Q as well. And also the minister that we saw from the last film, Frederick, Frederick Gray. They're all there. Uh, basically to talk about what we saw in the pre title sequence about... He was in um, uh, the... Live and Let Die as well, wasn't he? Was he in Live and Let Die? Maybe it wasn't that. I'm sure he's in a different film as well. I might be he might... wrong. He might be in some more later on as well. He... Yeah. He's in more of these films than I remember, actually. I definitely recognised him like straight away. I was like, oh yeah, that guy. Yeah. Um, they're here talking about what we saw, so the shuttle being, well, being kidnapped, although they just see it as missing because they've... They have Q kind of show a, a TV screen of, of the wreckage where the, the plane crash landed and they've searched and there's no sign of the shuttle. So they think it's gone missing. And that's really kind of it in terms of like the briefing. They just kind of tell Bond, yeah, go and investigate. Where is, where's the shuttle gone? It was on loan from America. So we kind of need to find it sort of deal. Uh, and then we get Q showing off a little gadget 
which I really like this gadget, and I'll, we'll talk about this this later on because it does come up a few times. But uh, he gives Bond a dart gun, a little um, kind of wrist dart gun that is activated by nerve impulses. I think he says so. All you have to do is like flip up, like Spider Man kind of, I suppose, and shoot out some some dart guns. He's got some poison tipped ones and some sleeper darts, I think. And Bond has a go demonstrating by shooting shooting one at M's painting which i can't remember m's line but i do like i just love this m I'm, I'm so sad it's his last one i really do like his expressions and his reactions to things even though bond just really does seem the most careless in front of his boss that we've seen him so far mm. and he says like no thank you <laughs> but it's the way he delivers it he doesn't just say no thank you it's he's actually quite our character like he's a lot more mellow and calm this m uh, than mm. we've seen in the last few films yeah, but I will say I was wrong about the Minister of Defense. He it was the spy who loved me, but we do see him for pretty much the whole Roger Moore era at this point. It seems. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought he'd come back. Yeah, yeah, uh, but yeah, I, I like this gadget as well. It's always nice when they do something with the watch. It does seem almost a little sci-fi about the nerve impulses especially because Q just puts it on Bond and it's like, it's triggered by nerve impulses and then Bond just shoots it. And it's like, okay, like, that's <laughs> a bit. Mm, all right. He picks things up very quickly, Bond. Oh yeah. Yeah, he's very smart, that one. But we also do get in the scene, like similar to the other ones, Roger Moore being very cocky as well. Where it's like, yeah, as he walks in, he's like, don't worry, sir, we need you on this. And it's like, oh, Moonraker, sir. And then just goes off about Moonraker and talks about drag industries um, a small detail i quite liked in this scene as well where q kind of like there's a mirror and it goes down and they play some footage um and it says most secret on the like oh, yeah. on the footage which yeah, i was like yeah. that's a very british way of <laughs> <laughs> it's not like top secret or like you know super you know it's nothing like that it's like oh it's terribly private you shouldn't <laughs> don't be peeking out <laughs> i want to see that secret. now I want to see terribly private on documents. <laughs> <laughs> no, get rid of the few eyes only. Terribly private. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also, I have to say, and maybe this is unfair, but I think Roger's looking a little bit older as well. Oh, yeah. I was going to say when you mentioned about Money Penny, uh, this is the film where I started to really see it. I don't know what, like, there's only two years difference between this and Spy Love Me, but something happened in those two years. Maybe they changed lenses or something on the camera. But yeah, <laughs> it really was a lot more obvious to me. Like, yeah, it, I think it's because it's across the board. It's because M is clearly, you know, not well and Q always looks like that. So I guess that's fine. Um, but Roger Moore, it's like, it's not too old. I would still say he's fine. And there wasn't any moments in this where I was like, oh, he's super old now. He's past it. But you can kind of see the cracks quite literally um, <laughs> at this point. <laughs> and yet we have three more films to go. I know. Oh, <laughs> I already said at the start he was too old for a few to a kill, but if this is what he looks like in Moonraker, <laughs> oh, I'm in for a shock. Listen, I think he got some surgery done in between some films, so it's not. Oh, as that'll bad. be fine then. Yeah, <laughs> eight 1980s plastic surgery. You'll see it when the time comes. Oh yeah. Oh no, Roger. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this all concludes where Bond is being sent to California to investigate Drake Industries. No, Drake. Drac. It's Drac. <laughs> it's, Drake's here. <laughs> oh, no. Nathan Drake Industries, it's the whole thing. Drac yeah. Industries. Um because it's his, it was his shuttle that got lost. Um But yeah, we cut to James Bond in a helicopter with a young woman, which get used to this. There are a lot of times where Bond and it's something I noticed throughout this entire film where just so many times Bond shows up somewhere and there is like a woman in her 20s just there looking like gorgeous. And it just <laughs> happens so many times. I'm just like, I get it, James Bond, but he doesn't have to literally see a gorgeous young woman every single time he walks into a room. Like, it's fine. They can just be a dude there. No, it's in the contract. It's, it's in, in the contract. The contract. He, yeah, he had to. Yeah. Oh, that's fair. That's where the budget went, I think. Yeah. Uh, and we get a little welcome to California, Mr. Bond, uh, from the woman who's the pilot. And they fly over this airport and we find out she's a pilot for the Drac. I'm going to be so paranoid about saying Drake now. <laughs> Please ignore it when I say Drake. Uh, the Drac <laughs> Corporation. 
Mm. It's, it's, it's not Drac, though. It's Drax. Drax. Yeah. I wrote it down wrong then. That's why I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> Drax. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, I'm going to have to write that down somewhere. Drax. Okay. I wrote down uh, Drake. <laughs> but it's Drax. Yeah, it's Drax. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I saw this film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Drax, uh, his, we see a massive complex. So he's in California, and we see this massive, yeah, like uh, operation. And it all gets explained that this is where the Moonraker shuttle is being built. So... There was the one that was being transported, but this is not a unique shuttle. There's quite a lot of them. Um, and we get a lot of aerial shots kind of showing the area. And in the distance, Bond sees this very fancy looking estate uh, by this forest, which stands out because it's California and California is quite a dry, almost desert-like kind of area. And it's uh, the the Drax residence. Mm, some fancy looking French manor house or something. Yeah, like it's it's extremely posh, like, and that's something about this character throughout, where it's like posh and fancy to like the nth degree. Like this is like, roy- like British royalty, fancy. Like it's it's very much is meant to look like a, can't remember the name of the estate, uh, but like a, an estate that like uh, the British monarchy would own. Yeah, yeah, Downton Abbey. Think Downton Abbey. Yeah, very <laughs> much that. Uh, and we see that uh, well they then land um they land there in front of it we see a load of women and young people working out in the garden training to be astronauts is what explained and we find out that this was all was it all funded by the french or did he just i think he just a- imported a load of french materials to build it right yeah she says like oh you know brick by brick it was transported over this whole scene in the helicopter is basically just uh, t- telling us Hey, this Drax guy, he's rich. <laughs> like, he's, he's really doing rich. All right. <laughs> he's doing all right for himself. Yeah, he's both rich and he's spending it in like a very over the top manner. Yeah, because they then they say like he even tried to buy I think he did buy the Eiffel Tower, but they wouldn't let him take it over. Yeah, Something so Drax like just <laughs> owns the Eiffel Tower, but the French wouldn't let it leave Paris. But he still owns it, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. So absurd. Um but yeah, then we cut inside uh, so they go into this huge mansion and inside is also very fancy very over the top we've got lots of fancy paintings and chandeliers and stuff it's it's very similar to what we had last time uh, with Stormberg it, it's very much that although like somehow even more over the top with fanciness like this yeah. is very much a guy who likes to surround himself with the finer things uh, it's just interesting that they took that exact same quality from the last film and it's like, let's just do that again, <laughs> but fancier. <laughs> yep, another example of that. Yeah, so there's a man playing piano to two young women uh, and it's, it's Drax. And Drax gets up, introduces himself, the women leave, and then they have a, a brief conversation about how Drax isn't very happy that the US government has lost his Moonraker uh, shuttle and he makes some comments about he's just not very happy about if you're apologizing and, and things like that it's not really very clear why bond is there like bond has just been sent there to kind of investigate to see what happened but i mm. never really kind of understood what he was generally trying to do um i i, I guess it's because q said before that in the wreckage the moonraker shuttle wasn't there yeah but I don't know if Bond su- suspects that Drax is up to something straight away or if that's something that, like, happens later. Yeah, it's quite funny how they just immediately go to... Well, Bond just immediately goes to being suspicious of him. Because, yeah, you're right. I don't know... We Well, so far we haven't really had any any subtle sign that there's, you know, it is Drax. So I guess it's just... I'm trying to think now whether there is something that, that does tell us eventually, like, that why Bond would start investigating, but can't actually remember now <laughs> i think there is i think he does find something that doesn't quite add up right but yeah it, it's a little bit odd but it's one of those where it's kind of it's very much portrayed that this guy is a villain and bad news um because in this scene we see two dogs like two hounds not too sure on the breeds but 
Like, I would say they're evil looking dogs, but they look so happy in this film. <laughs> like, most of the shots, they're just smiling and enjoying themselves. That yeah. I never bought that these dogs were like evil and would like rip someone or like bite someone. They were basically like Mr. Burns hounds, you know, like, yeah, like black, pointy ears, like yeah. that, that sort of dog. But they just look so happy most of the time. I just, <laughs> Game of oh. Thrones, this ain't with these dogs. Um, so he then like gets this big jar or urn or something, opens it up and there's raw meat inside as he's talking and throws it down in front of the dogs, but the dogs don't do anything. And Drax then sits down and says, ah, there's one thing that you British have done right and that's that's afternoon tea. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the most menacing way possible offers a cucumber sandwich. A cucumber sandwich. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> uh. Yeah, they sit down. They have some afternoon tea, um, of course. Bond says no to the cucumber sandwich. It's one of those trope the cucumber sandwich, but I don't think you see it so much anymore. But I guess at one point that was a big British thing. Like, do you know anyone? We're both British. Do you know anyone who eats cucumber sandwiches? I will say this. The only thing I can think about with cucumber sandwiches is in the year six, uh, in the year six play... <laughs> um when i when we did uh cinderella and i was prince charming of um, course yeah <laughs> of course uh one of my lines was about how i was inviting her to for cucumber sandwiches so you know you're right it's definitely something there about it being posh yeah it's very british apparently but i would if someone offered me a cucumber sandwich i'd be like no oh that sounds horrible <laughs> that sounds terrible i guess you got that <laughs> crunch but that's that's all you get yeah, but I just think, like, surely it'd make the bread go all soggy. I just don't I don't really see how that would work. No. No, it's not for me. I would have said no as well. No as well. Let's talk about cucumber sandwiches for the rest of the podcast, actually. Finally! <laughs> <laughs> Give the people what they want. Exactly. Uh, so as Drax is enjoying his cucumber sandwich, he then snaps his fingers, and that's when the dogs eat, basically showing how in control he is of these dogs who are supposed to look menacing but totally don't. Mm -hmm. um, and and at this point the woman pilot comes back uh do you know her name because i just always wrote it down as woman pilot i wouldn't have expected anything less from you tom with your name yeah. and conventions um corinne her name is corinne because she is actually a not a massive character but she does have a few scenes doesn't she she's oh, a yeah. somewhat yeah, yeah. important character uh, yeah she comes back and takes bond away to give them a tour and then we see a, an asian man who oh i did look up his what country is from? Because I wanted to say Japanese, but I think that's wrong. I didn't, so I'm going to rely on you for this. Oh, I'm going to have to check this. I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, he is... Yeah, he is Japanese. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so a very... Well, a very interesting Japanese man. Uh, he looks like someone who has, like, beetle mania. He's going for that <laughs> look. <laughs> wow. I, I, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, that haircut and everything, yeah. <laughs> yeah so Ringo comes in uh, <laughs> uh, and well I guess this is another sign that he is evil Drax straight up like they're not trying to hide it at all this is your guy because uh, he asked the Drax he asked um, the Japanese man to make sure some harm comes to Bond yeah yeah I, I gotta say like this whole introduction of Drax I kind of like how how quick it is they're just they're not wasting any time there he is and it is you're right in that it's quite similar to Stromberg in like the fancy gaudiness and paintings and you know playing piano the classical music is back again uh, although the music did not match his playing on the piano at all which kind of irked me um but uh I, I really like Drax I think it's one of the reasons why this film is 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 up there for me it's just I think is I just think the actor that plays him is so creepy like he's just got such a nice little weaselly voice you know the whole can i interest you in a cucumber sandwich and he's sort of like croaking it out almost and um yeah I, and actually that the dialogue in this scene between him and bond where they're talking about the missing shuttle and stuff and bond's asking about what other businesses he has and drax is saying that he has subsidiaries all over the world i kind of missed i must have missed in previous viewings like how they they do plant the seed of his his evil plan, which we'll eventually get to very early on in the film where Bond is saying, um, or, or, or Drax is saying, you know, he does this because he likes to uh, seek out the best each nation has to offer. I wrote that down. And then Bond says uh, skills or people. 
and I think he says both. So it kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's getting there about what he eventually wants to do so early on, but kind of subtly. So I like it. I really like Drax. I overall like Drax. It's a difficult one, though, because the Bond franchise is so well known for its villains and there's so many kind of good ones. And overall, I like Drax, but I don't know if he brings that much compared to the other ones. I kind of, I see him quite similar to uh, Stromberg from the last film, although we do get more screen time with Drax, which is yeah. very much appreciated. So he doesn't, he does disappear a little bit, but we get a lot more time with this guy. And I think he has a very similar plan to Stromberg, but we do get a bit more time with him to kind of understand it and his kind of personality. So that kind of like makes him a little bit better not to jump ahead a bit, but yeah, that makes him a little bit more of a stronger villain because you get more of that time. Yeah, definitely. I feel like you definitely see more of his plan as well. Whereas Stromberg, it was just he wants to nuke the world and start an under, underwater civilization. Whereas with this, you're actually seeing the steps that Drax takes to get to his plan, which I like. Yeah, I like that too. But I will say, and it's kind of a theme for me for this one, like it happens in this uh, scene and later ones that I don't really get that chemistry between Bond and Drax. Hmm. Okay. Like it's fine, but there's not kind of that back and forth that we've seen with the other villains, which isn't a massive deal. But I think someone, someone like a Goldfinger, is elevated due to the way that Bond kind of teased him and that power dynamic changing throughout the film. This one doesn't really have anything like that. He's more just kind of the villain of the week, who's a good villain of the week, but it's not like there's a relationship between Bond and Drax. And some of that might be because of Jaws being in this film, stealing some of that spotlight. But Bond and Drax is similar to me with Stromberg, as in, yeah, there's not really that connection. Like when Bond finally does take out Drax later on, spoilers, it's, there's no real kind of... It's not super satisfying, both because of the way it plays out, but also because these are not two men going up against each other like uh, Scaramanga say. This is just kind of a bad guy that Bond has to stop. Yeah, I think I think you're right in when you said about how Jaws is Jaws is arguably like the bigger villain in this film. Um, <laughs> yay. I'm here all week. <laughs> but yeah, like it definitely takes away from what could have been a stronger bond between Bond and, and Drax. So yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it happened in the last film and it's something that's carried over. Not as bad in this one, but yeah, the connection is Bond and George when you see that quite a lot in the film. Yeah, for sure. So after speaking to Drax, um, as Tom said, Cor- Corrine comes in, the helicopter pilot, and, and whisks Bond away and goes to take him to go see, or tells him to go see a Dr. Goodhead um, in the shuttle-making facilities so he went he goes and has a little bit of a tour there and oh, this is our introduction to what is going to be the bond girl of this film uh emphasis on the girl because uh, as bond is walking through the sort of like lab area office area and he spots he spots goodhead he does ask you know oh, i'm i'm looking for a uh dr goodhead and she goes well you, you've just met her and oh, the the I quote this next line quite a lot, which is bad because it's a terrible line. But <laughs> oh, no. Obviously, the joke is like Bond is expecting uh, a Dr. Goodhead to be a man. So when she says that, he goes, a woman, like eyebrow raised. <laughs> like, it's shocking. A, a woman can be a doctor? Madness. Madness. Um, I just It's just the way he goes, a woman. So often, like whenever I see someone <laughs> say something about a woman, I'm off, I can't find myself going, a woman and i was like oh crap people don't understand what i'm referencing <laughs> yeah, no I'm one will get that like <laughs> yeah, even a bond fan probably i know would miss it it's so bad i need to stop doing it quote but, moonraker uh, over here wow <laughs> uh so anyway yeah we get the introduction of dr holly goodhead who is i think she is a nasa well, she claims to be a nasa scientist on loan um to help out drax the shuttle stuff and she's there to give bond a bit of a tour so explains a little bit about the shuttles and again you get cocky bond stepping in kind of showing off what he knows about how they can go up and they they land again and it's all this all this mumbo jumbo sci-fi mumbo jumbo but they uh, eventually get to a what are these things called g g force g force testing like that space space. yeah (laughs) centrifugal thing you know where they test g forces and um Oh, yeah, Centrifuge, yeah, I know what you mean. Centrifuge, that is it, yeah. Uh, they get there and 
uh, Dr. Goodhead says, you know, do you want to go? Do you want to go on it, Bond? And of course, it's Bond. He's got to show off and say, yeah, all right, I'll have a go. And so she straps him in, um, kind of giving up, like, telling the audience basically, oh, at, at four Gs, you go unconscious and most people, or like you can die if you reach 10 Gs sort of thing, setting well, up. Well, let's the... get the numbers right here, Joe. Okay. Okay, go on then. So yeah. it's three Gs is enough for launch, which apparently an old person can do. People mm-hmm. pass out at seven Gs, and if it ever goes to twenty Gs, then you're you're dead. Twenty Gs is dead. Okay. Okay. So yeah, setting up the audience there. Um, Bond straps in, gets his wrist strapped in, apparently to stop yourself like hitting yourself in the in the with the force of it. Um, but also pointing out that there's this kind of kill switch. So if Bond does want to stop, he can just let go of this button. The chicken and switch. Chicken switch, yeah. And um, just as it's about to start, Goodhead gets distracted. You get... What was his name? Did you say what his name was, the, the henchman? Uh, I I never picked it up. Uh, it oh. says here Chang, but pronounced Cha. I don't ever remember hearing Cha. Cha. Okay, I'm going to say Chang because I'm going to remember that. Yeah, um, I, I don't ever remember hearing Cha unless I'm just saying it in a too British way. <laughs> it's not pronounced Cha. <laughs> Cha! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Chang comes and distracts um, Dr. Goodhead and says it's got a phone call. So they start up the machine, kind of kind of a bit reckless, really, leaving Bond alone with it. But she off she goes and the machine starts. Well, I can't remember if the machine starts going before or after Chang then goes and takes over the controls. But any, at any rate, Bond's going on the machine and Chang comes in and actually takes over the controls of it, like further back up in this room and obviously what's going to happen uh he slowly ramps up the speed of the centrifuge and you get this little action scene i say action scene because it's just a thing going around in the circle but uh i think it's quite good this little scene going faster and faster you get these really really unflattering shots of roger moore where they're simulating the g-force increasing and like they've clearly just got like this big fan blowing air on him to wrinkle his skin and I really like that they went all in with this. Like any, you might think that other actors would be like, "No, I don't want to look bad on screen," but they're like, "No, you are gonna look, you are gonna look ugly. <laughs> like we're gonna, we're gonna make you look the most unflattering as your as your skin flaps on the big screen." And it really adds to the fact that you know, it really adds to the feeling of Bond is in real danger here. As as you see all the controls going up, like the G forces creeping up to twenty, and Bond's eyes bulging out of the out of his head um the sound effect as well i really like to this where you get the the uh, spinning around of the centrifuge and getting louder and louder and faster and faster uh it's a really it's a really cool little scene and you know you get you get bond trying to on the edge of passing out you can see like yeah he's not doing too well um it does cut one one way uh, at one point cuts away to dr goodhead on the phone and it's a nice little red herring because you you hear her say like, "Oh yeah, no, we're taking we're taking care of Bond all right," and you know thinking, "Ah, oh, she's in on it. Like she's she's evil. She's she's done this to trap Bond." But you, know, you actually later find out that no, she's just she's actually being genuine. Like no, they're taking care of Bond. <laughs> um, so a nice little red herring there. Uh, eventually, Bond does get out though. He uses his dart gun um, to to shoot the controls because obviously the chicken switch didn't work um so yeah he uses his dark gun which he still has on and shoots the controls which stops the machine uh with a little bit of editing i think we what was it previously we 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 kind of noted that there was a bit of editing involved which wasn't typical for bond films at this time for this film no for, it was a previous bond film but they had like they did some cutting which which worked quite well for the life of me i can't remember what it is now but um they kind of do a bit more here in terms of they have this like flashbacks showing Bond shooting the dark gun at the painting in M's office and oh I see that's Diamonds Are Forever you're thinking of is it what bit is it in there where they have the guy explaining what's going on and then they oh, show yeah. the footage of the operation yes that's right yeah so yeah just a bit more kind of editing that you don't really see very often in Bond films where showing Bond remembering the dark gun and yeah he does shoot it and and eventually. Uh, stops the the centrifuge. Goodhead comes back, gets him out. Oh, I don't know what happened. Oh, how could how could the machine have broke like this? And 
<laughs> Roger Moore just looks like there's some great acting here. He looks <laughs> terrible. <laughs> he gets out and his hair's all over the place and he's like falling against the wall. He does look up and kind of clock the henchman at the controls. So it does set up that, you know, he's aware something's going on. But uh, overall, I, I really, I really like this scene. It's such a simple, such a simple setup for a, uh, an action scene, but I think it was really well done. I will say this scene is better than it should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> because exactly. Because on paper, this should have just been another fundable get Sean on the back stretcher. I oh, not that bloody thing. Oh, my and God. And just shake him that. around and be like, oh, no, he's being shaken too much. Goodness. <laughs> That's so bad. <laughs> like, on, on paper, this should have been another one of them. Um, but it's kind of, as you say, like, it's just very well put together in terms of building that tension. We we get the rules of how this works explained to us quite clearly uh, well, about what G's we get. And then we see, like, numerous kind of indicators of things getting worse as it goes. We get the heart rate, as you said, and the this red bar filling up and we see how many G it is. And, yeah, that sound of it spinning going faster and faster. There's, like several indicators of this going quicker and quicker and quicker that keep building and building and building that it's just very smartly put together and it really builds that kind of tension and kind of sucks you in i i'm still not a massive fan of it because it is so like so unnecessary <laughs> in the grand scheme of things it's just like bond get in this thing for no reason okie doke oh that was horrible <laughs> all right anyway carry <laughs> <laughs> moving on <laughs> moving on but uh i mean it makes sense for this film like there's other stuff i would cut from this film before i would cut this because i think this is still effective in a vacuum and it is kind of a better version of that fundable scene that we saw at the beginning of that film and that is this how this did it is probably what they were going for back then they just didn't put it off where this one is actually a lot more effective yeah i mean it's a good use of the theme like the thematic you know uh, space shuttle astronaut they I, I could just see him thinking oh, centrifuge bond gets trapped in it amazing like that that in itself is just a cool idea and it was it was smart of them to include it in this film which does you know it does toe the line with uh, it, go, it crosses the line completely in terms of uh science later on but i mean this is a, a clever use of an actual piece of tech so i think it was good yeah i think it's good it is also one of those that you do completely forget about though <laughs> Like, considering where this film goes and all the other scenes, this is one that I think you can quite easily forget. It's very early on and we have a lot to get through. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, so speaking of that, so we then cut to uh, Roger later at night, still on the same estate, and he enters the room and we see the, the pilot from before doing her hair. What was her name again? Uh, Corrine. Corrine. Uh, so we see Corrine doing her hair and, and basically Bond walks into the room and goes in for a kiss. <laughs> oh, yeah. And starts putting on the old moves. She's initially not really into it, but then Bond gets a bit confused. And then they do actually kiss. Uh, so there's a little bit of back and forth here. I can't really remember it. Um, there's not too much that kind of happens. Bond is seducing her, uh, but his real goal is to kind of get information he wants to know what's really going on here. And she eventually says, after some more kissing and seducing and stuff, like, oh, there's something that was being worked on in secret, but that's been moved. Although I don't know where where it got moved to. And mm. then as part of this, she starts talking about like things I should never do. My mother gave me a list of things I, I shouldn't do. Um, but eventually Bond wears her down. And then he's like, what about that list of your mother's? Of which she replies, "I never learned to read." <laughs> what? What are you? What you're? What, what are you on about? I, I oh, yeah. What? <laughs> I know it's supposed to be like a, I don't know, a sexy, sexy? funny yeah. line. I guess like it's it's not supposed to be taken literally, but it just sounds so stupid. An adult woman saying, "I never learned to read." <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Does Drax know this? <laughs> yeah, that's just kind of a bit sad if anything it's like who's turned on by that bond it's like, oh, never learned to read eh? <laughs> oh okay <laughs> here we go <laughs> it's, yeah, like, oh, it's, it's just it's a crap line it's such a bad bit of dialogue yeah like i i don't really mind this actress and this character i think it's all okay like she serves her purpose and i think as an actress she's kind of better than some other people we've seen in the past but they just don't really they're just not very good 
these scenes with Roger seducing women. <laughs> like, really I don't not. know if it's Roger or the writing or both, but none of these really seem to kind of... They're not that convincing for me. I haven't really seen many of Roger's scenes doing this where I'm kind of convinced that, that it would go this way. This is one of the great examples of of a scene between Bond and a woman where Bond tries it on, the woman goes, no. Bond goes, yes. And then the woman mm-hmm. goes, okay then. <laughs> it's like, you didn't do anything. You didn't do anything to to try and persuade her. What? Why? No, it's not It's not clear at all. He didn't even call her darling, which is normally oh, the ace. Was there any all. darlings in this? Oh, there was, yeah. Okay, there was, yeah, good. I, I, I don't I think you. we're going to get any film where he doesn't say darling. It's definitely been toned down, but he gets one in. Okay, of course. He calls Q darling later. He <laughs> calls M darling later on. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I hope I haven't said that joke before. I feel like I might have done... Oh, no! Am I as bad as these films? Repeating Listen, jokes? We've got a lot of these to get through. I think it's fair if we repeat some jokes. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about Bond for how many hours at this point? Like, 20? <laughs> too many. <laughs> some, some would say too many. There's still another 20, though. See how we go. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so they're kissing and they're in bed and we see the, the Japanese henchman looking all shifty, walking around being all shifty-like, um, which did kind of make me laugh a little. But this guy just looks so ridiculous with his haircut and his general look um, that he just is, he just looks so, he just looks like a cartoon character um, for most of this. Are you still thinking of the Beatles? Are you still thinking it looks like a Beatles? I might be, yeah. <laughs> but he's in like traditional Japanese gear, which is like fine. But he's in like an est- a French estate in California, which is a national training program. So he just stands out so much and so deliberately, which is probably the old format of a henchman needs to visually stand out. Yeah. Um, but this one is one that doesn't really work because it- it's so kind of cartoonish, but just also not very memorable like no one's thinking like oh yeah how was the henchman in the in moonraker no everyone's gonna say jaws not chang yeah i'm afraid yeah that's right yeah poor guy poor chang. Got, yeah he can't compete with jaws sorry no he tries but bond gets out of bed so after successfully seducing the pilot gets out of bed and goes to explore and look around and see if he can find anything about uh, this secret project that was moved of which he eventually finds a desk, goes through a load of documents, and then the pilot shows up, goes through the door and meets up and is like, ah, you shouldn't be in here, this is bad. Of which I really like this moment where Bond says, is there a safe in here? She looks over and Bond just says, thank you. <laughs> and just <laughs> yeah. goes over to that spot. Yeah, a nice little quick quick bit there, I like that. It's another one of those small moments where it's just Bond being a smart spy, manipulating her yeah. to show her... It's, it's and it's very quick as well something we don't see as often in this era hmm. and yeah it's a, it's a clock is what she was looking at so bond fizzles with a clock face and that then goes up and a safe appears underneath and we get another twist on the old safe cracking uh, that we've seen quite a few times i didn't realize how often bond has a different gadget for safe cracking same he has a lot this is like the fourth or fifth we might have seen yeah yeah so this time it's his cigarette case of which he then puts it in front of the safe opens it up and it's like an x-ray scan of the lock i believe yeah i didn't quite buy that like i didn't buy that it was actually scanning it (laughs) i thought it was doing something else it's a powerful little x-ray that he's got there yeah yeah and yeah and because it's scanned inside the lock and there's like this electronic stuff as well and he then is able to see where he needs to put in the combination and eventually it clicks and the numbers work and there we go and the safe opens and he he gets the paper off which he then takes this cigarette case which has an x-ray scanner radiation and the like points at her chest and it's like there there you see you have a heart of gold it's like bond no <laughs> don't, don't scan somebody's chest with an x-ray that's messed <laughs> up you can't do that ah she's gonna die soon anyway it's fine yeah, well, yeah, he knew. <laughs> he was like, she's probably not got long. <laughs> they never normally do. No, she slept with me, so that's it now. <laughs> yeah, because at this point, it's this character's a little bit odd. Because, I, again, I don't really dislike her, but it's she's now very kind of friendly towards Bond. 
it's like they had no relationship or anything. She was just the pilot to Bond just kind of going into the room and then to seducing her. And now she's just like, yeah, they're just kind of quite pally. And it's just, she's just helping him out outright. Like not even questioning it, not even thinking about it. She's just with Bond helping him. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It it, it does just turn very strange, this relationship. Yeah, when he says like heart of gold and he's like 18 carat. And then they say, take care of yourself. As if it's like, yeah, like two good friends. Or it's like, they, they, they've just met each other. They don't know each other. Why is she doing yeah, this? Yeah, because Bond gives a genuine thank you to her and kisses her. Like, yeah. it's the most genuine I've ever seen Bond act towards a woman in any of these films. But it's like, it's just, <laughs> just why? <laughs> why are they being nice girl? Who knows? It's all odd, but uh, to wrap up this scene, Bond uh, gets his little 007 mini camera out. I don't think this is the first time we've seen this. Like, we've seen cameras in the past, but this might be the first time we've seen it with 007 written on the front. I like that. I like that. It's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. For, well, it makes more sense than, like, the tarot cards having 007 from Live and Let Die, at least. I Yeah, I buy that James Bond is fain enough that he would want the camera to have 007 written on yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and he takes uh, pictures of all the blueprints. So inside the safe, it's a load of spacecraft blueprints or showing the shuttles. I don't think Bond sees anything off with them. He just knows they're important. So he lays them all out, uses his little spy 007 camera, takes a load of pictures. They then give a genuine thank you and goodbye and kiss and leave. And we see that the Japanese henchman Chang is watching nearby, being very creepy um, as they both then leave the office. So he knows that they were in there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I gotta say this this whole scene with Corinne, I it was just it wasn't necessarily bad. I just felt it was weird. Just a very we've kind of been through it, but yeah, just very weird vibes between the two. I couldn't quite put my finger on these two characters. Because it's not as if it's like previous scenes with Bond and, and not the Bond girl and the one that usually ends up dying, where it's just you could say it's just outright bad or or good. This is just it's just weird. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I can put my finger on it. I think it doesn't help that, considering where this film goes, it feels really weird to be now talking about these early scenes. Like, they're so irrelevant compared to what happens later in the film. To be even talking about Kareem, it's like, no, she was in a different film, right? That's not Moonraker. <laughs> Moonraker just has such a different... Like, you, where it ends up compared to where it starts is so vastly different that it's just weird talking about these scenes like this and this character who just kind of has no impact on the film after the first, like, half an hour. Yeah, poor Corrine. Poor Corrine. Justice for Corrine. <laughs> I'm afraid that's not gonna... That's not gonna go very far. Because um, the next scene, uh, you get Bond who's about to leave is done now he's got his he's taken his photo he's about to leave the estate um so he's been driven to say goodbye to drax who is doing some uh pheasant shooting uh out in the in the fields or like the clearing um and you get some shots of like yeah the uh, probably actual pheasants being shot i'm sure you know we know what the <laughs> the animal uh stuff is like with these bond films um and everyone everyone in their like fancy looking shooting outfits and drax has got a little feather in his cap and everything and he's got these big shotguns and bond drives up uh, or gets driven up and, and is about to say bye to drax and thank him for his uh, generosity but not before drax says hey, come on come on bond let's have a little let's have a little go i'm sure you're a good shot have a have a go on uh, on uh, shooting some birds uh before this though i should say that drax did as he saw bond coming he did um kind of gesture to one of his his henchmen to go and go up a tree so you definitely know something's going on. There's this guy with a with a uh, rifle climbing up a tree nearby. So yeah, Bond is there and he's is uh, got his gun ready to shoot a, a pheasant. They um, I don't know if there's anything else. I think I just got on with it. But yeah, Bond is there, uh, and then suddenly all these birds get spooked, and, and Drax says, "Oh, now's your shot. Take it." So you see Bond kind of aiming, getting ready to aim, and following the birds. You get shots, POV shots of the guy in the tree with his targets right on Bond. And Bond just completely, like, he, he doesn't bother shooting the birds. You see him keep turning, keep turning, keep turning, uh, and shoot, like, really off far away. And Drax is very, very, you know, wants to rub it in straight away. You missed Mr. Bond. 
and you get the nice little line from Bond saying, did I? And the guy in the tree falls down, which is it's a really, I think we've said this for so many scenes now, but it's like a really quick scene, but it is a, it's a cool scene. You know, it's one of those scenes where it's like, yeah, you go Bond. It's like just a bit smarmy and, and uh, yeah, you, um, you get Bond leaving and, and thanking Drax, who's obviously very angry uh, and he gets driven away. Then well, you get... Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. I will just say about that scene that I also really like it, that nice little moment of, you know, I did say there's not a big relationship between the two and I still kind of stand by that, but this is this is as close as you kind of get and it is a cool moment. Like, it's it's that Goldfinger golf scene condensed down to be much quicker and more effective mm. where it's two men against each other competing in a very, oh, very posh and proper sporting event. Very good. Um, but I will say that Seeing a load of posh blokes with like dogs shooting pheasants, I was just like, screw all these people. <laughs> it took me out of it seeing that because I'm just like, well, I hate everything that I'm seeing here. Um, and that's a personal thing. Of course, it's not that big of a deal, but it took me out of it. Like seeing a load of like birds actually get killed. It's like the shark again, right? Like actually just seeing a load of animals die on screen is just a bit of a bummer. So didn't really enjoy the beginning of this scene but i do like that moment of bond shooting the guy out of the tree and, and being a bit smug about it yeah very very suave very suave uh after bond's left you see um corinne turns up she's in this little golf cart thing she comes up and basically it's 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 that she got caught uh she talked to drax and drax says you were in my study last night you were helping bond uh, consider your employment terminated and go pack your bag sort of thing. And uh, so she's obviously looking a bit sad, walks off. And as she's walking away, Drax gestures to Chang to let the two dogs that we've seen, the two very well-trained dogs who were currently, they were on leashes and he lets them go uh, to go chase after Kareen. And you get this chase scene through the forest where she, you know, she eventually realizes these dogs behind her. So she goes from a walk to a, a jog and then a sprint kind of racing and running for her life. And you get these shots of the dogs chasing after her. And it, this is kind of, uh, I really like this scene because, mainly because it's shot really, it's shot quite beautifully in a way because you get the shots of the forest and you're getting, yeah, scenes of Corrine running for her life, desperate, tripping over branches and things like that. Meanwhile, you're getting these, Lovely shots of the forest with like sun rays coming through and it looks very tranquil. And then obviously it's juxtaposed with what's actually happening on screen where this woman is about to get eaten by dogs and, and killed, like attacked and killed. And it's, you know, the music as it builds up slowly and, and eventually turns into this, yeah, kind of really dramatic chase and the dogs chasing. It's And it's ultimately just sad. Like it is actually just a sad scene because... She really hasn't done much. Like we, we've seen this character; she's seems pleasant enough, and then yep, before you know it, dead. And the thing I think really made me think about this, like what this character made me think about, was the fact that in this film in particular, and it's a thing that's in Bond films, it, like most of them, but the idea of like who Bond Bond's victims in his wake. Like, not necessarily the bad guys either. Just anyone that gets in contact with Bond, usually not a good end for them. And with this one, especially, there's just people that Bond comes across, gets involved with, he moves on, and they die. <laughs> and it's like, I felt, I just felt a bit bad for her. Well, it's weird because we didn't have, we had, we've seen this before. Um, like, we've seen, basically everything we've seen up to this point, we have seen a version of before. So they are just trying to do something different with each of these. But yeah, with this woman, like, yes, Bond has encountered women and had them be killed, as we saw with Goldfinger. Uh, but in the last film with Stromberg, we saw the same thing with this, where he kills that woman with the shark. And we get that big build up of the shark coming over and the music and stuff. So we got another version of that. But that was someone who, like, kind of deserved it because, well, not deserved to be eaten by a shark. <laughs> but you got where he was coming from like she was working with them and like sold something and completely betrayed uh she wasn't seduced or anything she just probably did it for the money so he's now taking revenge on it and it's quite harsh revenge and even back in the specter days when it was blowfeld it was like yes 
these people that he is killing have messed up. Probably shouldn't, you know, probably doesn't deserve a severance package. Maybe just a firing. <laughs> probably doesn't deserve to be eaten like this with by piranhas. Sure. Uh, but it was like, you know, it felt more like actions having consequences for the villains. But you're right, with this one, it's more like she was kind of tricked by Bond in a way, and then she 100% pays the price where Bond is absolutely fine. And there probably is a time where it's happened up to this point in the same way, but you don't feel it as much as you feel it in this one, because, yeah, you get that slow piano music and this quite kind of haunting scene where the scene of this is shot like like we've never seen a, a scene like this like even john barry's score he has never written like a piano piece that builds up this way at all uh but we get it for this one and the woman running through so it took me a little bit out of it that this is such a cliche at this point like i've just seen it so often you know the the woman or the person goes running off and is chased by dogs like i feel like it's happened a lot but yeah this one really kind of stands out and, and i would agree there is something about the way they've framed this that even though it's similar to stuff we've seen before where per innocent person gets killed they don't really kind of give that same justification that they would do back during blofeld or the previous roger moore films yeah yeah it's weird i almost got when i was watching that i got vibes of it's completely unrelated in terms of Bond, but Doctor Who, there's always a thing about the Doctor Who character, about how everyone he gets involved with usually meet a grisly end and, you know, un undeserved. I'm like, oh, yeah, Bond, Bond is a similar character where pe he just gets tangled, people get tangled up and he's fine and, and they suffer. So, and I, I like that. I do like that. It gives a bit more depth to the character and, and the plots. I mean, it's it's nothing crazy, right? It just, just dies, but it's it's definitely something else to think about in the Bond film, which is which is nice. Well, there's also, at this point, no self-awareness of it, right? Like, later down the line, they're more aware that this happens and kind of play on your expectations with that a little bit. I feel like with this film, they just haven't really reached that point yet. Like, it is just an innocent person kind of just getting killed because they got involved with Bond, and that's kind of it. Like, they move on, like, yeah. after this point. Yeah. Um, but later on, they, they kind of refer to it, for better or for worse, you could say. Uh, but this one is just kind of like, yep, she died horribly. <laughs> Uh, here's some nice piano and some nice god rays and oh i want to what bond's up to italy haha <laughs> what a hoot <laughs> yeah yeah you're right thinking about it like uh, i can't remember the character's name but tomorrow never dies has someone like this and obviously strawberry fields is kind of like this so we'll get to them and you're right they are taking a lot more at, as the emotive level of it and bond's feelings of that so we're getting there folks but this is early days Oh, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, so Bond is now in Italy. We cut to a, a bell. So as she goes down with the dogs, the camera pans up. Uh, the dogs are clearly not attacking her. They're just too lovely. <laughs> like, <laughs> you really like those dogs. <laughs> they're just nice dogs. Like I'm not a dog person, but when I see a nice dog, uh, I can't judge. Um, but So, yeah, as she goes down, you hear some big bells ringing and it then cuts to a bell ringing in, in this big square. And Bond shows up to this kind of small dock or harbour on this kind of very Italian-looking boat because he's in Italy. Uh, Venice, I think, specifically, is where mm -hmm. he is. I believe... Uh, do you remember why he's in Italy or how he makes that connection? It's on the the documents he took out of the safe in the study. It had, like, Vanini Venice glass on one of the blueprints. Ah, yes. That is something they actually do a good... Like, even, though, <laughs> even though I didn't remember that, uh, this is actually they they do a good job with this because he jumps around a lot but they do kind of very smartly explain why because i think he arrives doesn't he check the blueprint sees that it says like Venny glass on it looks mm. up and sees that same name and it's like right i got it that makes yeah. sense yeah but it makes it nice and clear like right next to each other like they're holding up the bit of the photo yeah but there's other instances as well, like at no point did I find too lost. There's one instance I was very lost to why he was there. Uh, but they do kind of, they've kind of mastered that sort of like, right, we need to get an explanation in without just having a ton. Like this is not like on a majesty secret surface where like, oh George Lazy is going yeah. on about the college and heritage and it's just zooming in on a college in London. You're just like, oh, what? Okay. <laughs> they've <laughs> simplified that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then Bond walks into the, this glass place and it's another young woman. Uh, there, there is a reason for this. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I feel like they didn't think, right, we've come up with this story. So that means there has to be young, attractive people around. No, no, no. They almost certainly was like, right, <laughs> let's have a look. We're going to have a Yoda 
a load of young, attractive people here. Let's make sure the story fits with it. <laughs> Possibly. I, will, I wouldn't be surprised. So, yeah, he walks in and there's another young woman and I think she says, like, oh, can I help you? And, or, like, do you see anything you like? It's, it's one of them. And Bond's like, I'm tempted to say yes immediately. I, I can't remember the setup. It's... I think that's it. I think it's spot on. Yeah, it's just another another one of them. Uh, so Bond starts looking around. So this is kind of more of a shop museum kind of place. And yeah, he's he's allowed to go in the back, apparently. She doesn't care. She just lets him go around the back. And he sees this like smeltering place, a furnace. Not too sure what you call it, but somewhere where they're blowing glass uh, to make glass containers. And he finds the container from the blueprint. There's a, I want to say, hexagon um, shaped hmm container and yeah. we then cut to a woman nearby giving a, a tour uh, to this glass place uh, a big a big group of tourists and she's saying like oh look at these look how expensive this is and there's a bowl there and she picks up the bowl and saying it's super expensive and when she picks it up it beeps so she puts it down and they all have a bit of a laugh and bond kind of watches them and he sees dr goodhead in that group of tourists yeah yeah it's just just uh good timing eh yeah it seems to be holly gets around i guess mm. so bond sees her and she then walks off and leaves the the glass place of any glass so bond follows her down the street she eventually stops near this canal looking at this building so bond just stands next to her and it's like hmm, 14th century i believe <laughs> <laughs> and she just looks and it's just like oh <laughs> Uh, and we get this is what i don't get with roger moore's era of bond girls where he is so horrible and condescending to them for so long and you're supposed to suddenly buy that they fall into each other's arms like i think the spy who loved me did it very well because they're rivals right like they're both rivals and it's kind of a somewhat friendly competition so she like he's being rude to her but she's also doing the same to him so there's this very real back and forth which helps develop the chemistry but in the other ones including this one he's just like so condescending and horrible so in this scene like bonds is like well what are you doing here and she's like oh i have this cinema uh yeah i have this thing that i gotta give um something to do with nasa and space uh and then Bond's like, oh, I keep forgetting you're more than just a beautiful woman. It's like, what, are you, what are you doing? <laughs> what a are woman. you doing? <laughs> uh, and then he's like, let's go to for, go to dinner. <laughs> She's like, I'm busy. I'm working here. <laughs> I'm working here. She's like, i got to go give my address. Like, I'm here for work. And he's like, oh, maybe a drink afterwards then. I can't see a reason why you'd say no to that. Because like, <laughs> you're an just ass. That's probably... Take the hint. Take the hint, Bond. <laughs> It's just like, but it's two scenes in a row where like the first one you said, like he is just very condescending towards her because she's a woman, like a beautiful woman who's meant to be smart. And he's like, oh, and just makes all his comment and tries to show off his knowledge. And then he just does it again. And she is quite hostile towards him, rightly so. But this is all supposed to be like, she's the Bond girl. And at this point it was like, okay, well, I know she's the Bond girl, but that's really weird if she is the Bond girl, because he's just kind of horrible to her and she's just horrible back. Like, why would I ever buy that these two are just going to fall for each other? And they give a reason, but it's just super weak. And I don't really dislike the actress here, but I can't say I, I think much of a Dr. Goody... <laughs> Goody? Uh, mm -hmm. Holly Goodhead overall. Yeah. Yeah. I. It's almost like this is still meant to be flirtatious bickering right you know about the back and forth and just a, a quip and a response for everything because when, when bond does say oh you know drinks then i can't think of a reason she says i'm sure i'll think of one um but you're right yeah i i don't i don't love i don't love this dynamic and it's mainly because of roger moore like the bond in this film i gotta say i mean i'm kind of jumping ahead but for this whole film i do find bond just to be quite unlikable throughout this uh, which is a shame because this is the first time I've really felt that in the Roger Moore film so far. And it's just just the attitude he has throughout most of this. I just don't really like it. And this is one of those those scenes, you know, where it's really evident. Yeah, he's just trying to do that same routine we saw in all the other films. But I think the setting and the characters that he's paired with and the fact that we've seen it 
in three films now. We're on film number four of the Roger Moore era. That feels weird to say. Um, but we've seen him quite a lot now at this point. And yeah, the, the, it just doesn't work in the same way that it did. The, his knowledge and his jokes and stuff, they're all just kind of a little bit off. And with the type of Bond that he is, when they're off, as you say, it just makes him unlikable. Mm. So I don't hate Bond in this film, but it's still like so many of these scenes where he's just interacting with actual human beings and he just doesn't come across <laughs> as like a likable human being. No, not at all. He's in his own world. Yeah. Yeah. So the scene uh, ends with Goodhead and Bond kind of like left on a bit of a question about, oh, drinks, yeah, maybe, whatever sort of thing. And it then just really randomly cuts to Bond having a nice um, ride down the canals in a, in a gondola, right? It's just, yeah, he's on, he's meant to be, um, he's meant to be there just chilling. I guess he's on a bit of a holiday as well, you know, why not? Uh, enjoy Venice while you're there. So maybe just passing the time. But uh, he's there and it's just, yeah, he's he's going down the canal and having a great time. Then spots this funeral boat. I don't really know. I guess that's what it is. I mean, it's a, it's a boat with a coffin on the top. Yeah. And <laughs> God, this whole scene, man. Uh, the coffin opens and a man lifts like... Uh, comes out of it like Dracula <laughs> and all of these knives are on the lid, on the insides of the lid and this little knife contraption extends out which lets the man grab a knife and try to throw it at Bond or at least, I don't know if he tries to throw it at Bond first but he hits the, what are they called, those people? Have they got a I'm name? not too sure what the guy with the big sticks <laughs> Yeah, the ones, the, that, the ones that sing with the big sticks and the, the little hats Anyway he stabs him, gets him with a knife first, which gives Bond a chance to, you know, react and, and then carry on with what turns out to be another boat chase. They really did love their boat chases with Roger Moore um, through the, the canals and rivers of uh, Venice. And does he? Oh, he gra yeah, that's right. He grabs the knife that he threw and, and throws it back at the guy in the coffin. So that's how he gets rid of him. And then activates some sort of gadget on the gondola that he was on because yeah it turns out that this isn't just like one for hire this is a a gadgetized gondola must have been straight from q and q branch because <sighs> it has like a like it has a jet bait or a, not a jet but um like a motor so he can start driving it with a, a steering wheel and yeah we get a bit of a chase uh the other boat um crashes into a, a bridge because it's too high and then you get just two other, I don't know where they come from, I can't remember now, but they, you get some other goons on another boat chasing after Bond, shooting. Um, so he's using things like, he's got like a, has he got like a bullet thing at the back, the bullet shield? I don't know. Yeah, he's got something like that. He just starts flipping switches, stuff happens. I can't really remember any of the gadgets apart from the obvious one. Does, any, does he actually do anything with the boat whilst he's getting away? I don't know. I don't think so. Like, There's no like jets of something or mines can you imagine mines in the middle of venice um no i think he just drives drives off and there's a bit like there's a bit of a gag where breaks through this couple that are on a, another um, gondola and they're kissing and like just gets completely ripped in half which they've done that joke before i think in live and let die uh, no uh, the man with a golden gun um but yeah like they start sinking without even realizing it it's just a bit of a visual gag like that and you eventually get to bond uh, at St. Mark's Square, so very big, famous place in Venice, very big touristy place, tons of people. And what's he going to do? He's he's reached there. How is he going to escape these two guys behind him on the boat? Well, that's when you, you use the trusty gondola hoverboat technology that Q has geniusly invented. He flips a switch and, yeah, the gondola turns into the bondola, as people call it. <laughs> As, That's pretty good, actually. Pretty as good. it turns into a hovercraft, and he, it's kind of a similar thing to the Lotus, except in reverse, right? Like, yeah, and and goes on to land, and you just see these shots of of Bond driving through the middle of Saint Mark's Square, and just like with the beach scene in the Spy Who Loved Me, you've got to have some great reaction shots, right? You've got to have some what, and you get loads in this one. I even wrote down all the ones you get. So, you get an artist who is painting, but then like 
the easel gets knocked over and he's still there painting because he's like so distracted. You get a waiter who is pouring a drink who is distracted, so he ends up pouring the drink all over the guy. You get the good old man with a bottle of wine. He returns, the same actor, <laughs> doing a double take at the wine, like, oh, what am I drinking sort of thing. Great. And best of all, you get a double taking pigeon. Oh. Finally. <laughs> oh. <laughs> don't groan at the double taking pigeon, Tom. Oh, don't don't, <laughs> don't defend the double taking pigeon. No, don't worry, I'm not going to. It's bad. It's just bad. <laughs> so I, I, just before I, I well, just, so the the canal scene before this, I thought was a bit whatever. Like, just to cover that, it's a really short boat chase. It's so whatever. Like, I get it. You're in Venice. So you're going to like have this sort of chase scene, but it kind of goes to a problem that I have with this film where it jumps between locations a lot, like more than any other film at this point. It's all about Bond goes somewhere and then does a set piece, goes somewhere else, does a set piece, goes somewhere, does a set piece. That's the entire film. And then the last one is goes to space and does a set piece. Yeah. Um, so this one feels extremely unearned because he just goes to Venice and because he's in Venice, he's going to have a, a boat chase in the canals. But because it is like such a sacred area, like it is an old town, you're not going to blow stuff up, like you said. So it's just like, whatever, like just cut it out. I don't care. Um, now back to this one with the double taking pigeon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> As we talk about it, I like it more and more, but it was nothing but groans and being annoyed when watching it. Like, I like the idea of it existing. I just don't want to watch it. <laughs> I think it's hilarious that this exists in a Bond film, but I didn't watch it and it did. Like, I didn't watch it and laugh. Um, but this yeah. is like so stupid. It is. I mean, it, it was even a bit too stupid for me. I think you hit the nail on the head there where it's, it's just unearned. Like the thing that really stood out to me watching this this chase scene again was not the double taken pigeon because I knew that was coming and I was quite looking forward to it. But um, it was just the fact that it, it, it does just plonk Bond, like scene cuts with him and Goodhead, and then he's just in a boat. And it's like, that is purely so they can have this silly little scene. If it was at least vaguely tied into a bit more and, and, and flowed better in the story, I wouldn't have minded as much. But it, it's just, yeah, lazy. It's really, really lazy. And obviously you can't make a pigeon do a double take, so that it was this really clumsy edited thing and it's just it's just naff the whole scene's pretty naff to be honest it's like what slow down and rewound because it's supposed to be the pigeon like blinking a few times yeah but pigeons move their head weird because they're pigeons so they had to like change it it's like oh, who in the editing room was like come on guys let's get this done and the crazy thing is the editor is like the director for the next like five films <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, like, that was yeah. a hell of a pigeon scene mate here's a five film contract get it done yeah i don't sure how that made it. i mean it is quite infamous in like the bond fandom about the double taken pigeon for good reason um i will say though i have got the only bit of like bond art that i've got oh, is no. it's a it's a really nice like it's a really nice painting that someone did or a print of a painting someone did in, in watercolor style but it is of this actual it's of this very scene where <laughs> where bond is in saint mark square and there's pigeons flying everywhere so it's a shame that it's it's linked to this but i do it's a nice little print so yeah it just reminds me of the double taking pigeon now. That that does sound nice. It is nice. I have to post a picture somewhere, but it's very nice. Yeah, I, I just don't know what to say about this one because it's like it's just not funny. And and that's what it comes down to. Like I think you're meant to laugh at like all the people reacting to Bond, considering they show about six, seven reactions of it. Yeah, yeah. But it's like, no. Who is genuinely laughing? I was like, oh man, spills his drink because Bond's being a bit wacky. Like, oh, it's so bad. Uh, like, only kids would find this funny. And even then, I'm not too sure. Uh, because, like, you can get some humour from these scenes. I don't think this scene was doomed to fail. It's just let, let it speak for itself a bit. Let Bond look ridiculous driving through this square in this little boat. That itself is kind of funny. Like... Not hilarious, but that itself is fine. You just don't need the rest of it. It's like him coming out of the ocean, like in Spy Who Loved Me. That in itself is kind of like a bit different and out there. And I kind of like that. Um, but this one, they try to do it again, but they went all in on the wrong elements. Although luckily they don't play the Bond theme. So at least there's that. <laughs> yeah, it was just a bit too much of, look, look at these people reacting. Isn't it funny? And that one thing that just comes to mind 
I think I wrote it at the end of uh, like when I'd finished watching this film, but it's very evident in this scene. It's like this is this film is the spy who loved me on steroids in some scenes. It's like they just took what they thought was good, and which arguably is good in the first one, but they just sometimes they just go too far with it. And this is one of those scenes where they just went too far. Yeah, I mean, it's the Diamonds of Forever problem for me. It's taking what Goldfinger did and kind of amplifying the wrong things in some areas. And I don't think Moonraker is as wacky as Diamonds of Forever. I, I was reading about this film before this uh, episode, and I feel like some people say this is the silliest and stupidest Bond film. But to me, I would still say Diamonds of Forever is dumber. I guess it's just how you think about Bond going into space. Like that, for some people, is just fundamentally too stupid to get into. Listen. But I think outside of that, I would say... Diamonds of Forever is still sillier. Like an elephant winning the jackpot, I think is still stupider <laughs> than a double taking pigeon. Listen, just because you didn't like Blofeld in drag doesn't mean that everyone has to dislike it. <laughs> oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but I did forget about the elephant winning. <laughs> can we get an edit of um, they when Tiffany gets in the car with Blofeld in drag, can we just edit in the double taking pigeon <laughs> reacting to Blofeld? <laughs> so much potential. Oh, Damn. Just put all the insanity together as one big edit. Overload, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so Bond gets away. And also, just to top it all off, the goons are all annoyed. So they're still on their boat watching Bond drive away in the square in his boat. And they're like, oh, blah, 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 like raising their fist. So then they drive away and the man raising his fist falls off the boat and it's like, oh no, it's... Ugh. Oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah, yeah. Just a, just a little cherry, cherry on the top there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I won't say on top of what, but uh, <laughs> yeah. on top of something. Uh, so then we cut to at night and Bond, for some reason, is wearing like the Italian hat, like the sun hat that the guys wear for some reason and takes it off and then throws it onto a post. There you go. You're happy. You got your hat throw. Yeah, I, it's not what I wanted, oh. but it's what we got. Yeah, so yeah, so Bond is doing a hat throw for some reason. Uh, and he goes through this gate and into this like courtyard. So he is sneaking back into the glass place that he went earlier. I don't think it's really explained, but he saw that that operation was doing stuff for, for Drax and that he found the thing he was looking for. So he goes back at night to investigate, which also means you totally could have cut out the last scene because the reason he's here is because of that. So you totally could have gone from Dr. Goodhead to Bond sneaking in and it, you would miss nothing, mm -hmm. like absolutely yeah. nothing. Yeah, but anyway, uh, so Bond is in all black, and this is the like quietest scene I think we've ever had in a Bond theme. I don't know if there was any sound coming from it as he was sneaking through, like no music, no nothing. I couldn't hear anything. Um, yeah, I, I can't really recall anything. Yeah, okay. I was just curious if it stood out to you because yes, we do have these quiet scenes before. That's nothing new. But normally you hear kind of something, but this is just like near silent. It was like almost a little bit uneasy for me because when you hear something that has no audio but should have audio, there's like a natural kind of unease that comes with that. And that kind of hit that level with me with this scene. Oh, so maybe it worked, but for the wrong reasons. Yeah, it was a bit strange. So we see Bond enter inside the place and we haven't really talked about his dress sense for a couple of film. Uh, so far but man he looked bad in this so he's what? wearing all black but he has oh. like this this shirt but it has like a zip on the top and he's like zipped it down so he, you can see it like got this big v on top of his chest and with the fact that roger is starting to look a little bit older exposing his uh chest v as it were uh, was <laughs> not a look i was into i don't yeah i don't really I can't say anything really stood out to me in terms of looking bad, but then equally nothing really stood out in terms of looking good. So maybe that's worse actually. <laughs> hmm. But yeah, yeah, nothing. Yeah, nothing too bad. I think this looked bad just because again he's exposing his chest like that, especially because he's like supposed to be stealth and spy and stuff. Like don't, don't do that. Don't wear that. This is not like the classic look we saw in Live and Let Die. But yeah, yeah. so far it's all very similar with his suits. Although I think he does wear a tux later, which is nice. Mm. So he, Bond is going through this, uh, yeah, this facility, 
and hides behind a door because he gets to a door with a no uh, keypad and he can't get through. So he hides for a door. Then he sees a scientist come through. He puts in the combination. Bond sees that happen. But also they play this little tune like dun, 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 which I recognized, but I don't know if it originally comes from this film or not. I did not recognize it. Oh, what is it from? I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, OK. Oh, I thought you might. OK, yeah, I don't know. I recognise it from like other media, which definitely would have probably come out after this. I always thought this was like Close Encounters of the, like or some like something for like that. I mean, it could be. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure. I feel like this might be referencing something because I can't imagine people would reference this tune elsewhere because it's Moonraker. Like, who? <laughs> why would you do that? True. Yeah, and it seems like such a strange. Like, why would they put? such a little tune in if they didn't want you to know there was a reference to something so yeah you're probably right i mean you hear it about three four times that's yeah. the thing like you don't yeah. just hear it once you hear it quite a bit it's nice it's a nice little song <laughs> one of john barry's best <laughs> <laughs> oh i actually yeah oh anyway that's that's later on yeah but yeah yeah we'll get there are plenty of opportunities for john to have his day in the sun oh yeah uh, so yeah so bond sees the combination he goes in types it in, gets in, and he sees this kind of research facility here where it's something to do with rockets and there's these rocket arms filling up these canisters with liquid and Bond is just watching these scientists or the scientists work on all this and the scientists eventually leave so he goes through this big door to go inside the main part of it uh, and takes one of the canisters basically, he sees these liquids, see the small canister he takes one, takes a look at it and hides it and he then hears them come back, so he runs back around and hides again. Uh, and the Bond, because he was taking a look at these canisters, but didn't have time to put them away, he left some of them on the table nearby. So when Bond ran away, that was still there. When the scientists come back and don't know it's there, he they knock it over, and we see it smash, and then this gas comes out and... It's because it's a separate sealed room from Bond. Bond is okay, but we see both the scientists start choking and very fakely choking. They just kind of hold their necks and like, and just do that. <laughs> and eventually they fall on the floor, but they fall on the floor in sync, which I thought was just lovely. Like, completely took me out of it, but they both land on their knees and land on the floor at the exact same time and die at the same time. I did not spot that, but maybe they were just really good friends. I, I like to think so. Friends till the nice. end. Yeah. And we also see some rats are in there, which they're making a lot of rat noises, which seem to be very much like imposed over the footage, but they're okay. That's important. I, I almost didn't say important because it's not actually important, but they reference it later. <laughs> like yeah, it and really then matter. weirdly, they, they insert the shot of a double-taking rat... I don't know why they did that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Oh, God. <laughs> so, so yeah, so, that, so that's it. That This seems fine. Like, it's a bit slow. And that kind of... Like, this film isn't as slow as, say, like, A Man with a Golden Gun or something like that. Like, But it doesn't quite have that same pacing that Spy Who Loved Me had at the beginning. Like, yes, Bond jumps around a lot. But we do get a few scenes like this where it's like, yes, there's a point to it and it's not terrible, but I this felt a bit slow. Like it was Bond breaking in, watching, scientists leave, he goes in, he then goes out, then the scientists die and then, then the rats are there and, and that's kind of it. It's like, yeah, it's a, it's a spy scene, which is nice to see, but considering that this film is over two hours long... And like I already said, like, it's weird talking about a scene like this when I already know where this film goes. Like, this film's, this scene seems so irrelevant in the grand scheme of things because it's clearly not the stuff you're going to remember and what's important about this film. Yeah. There, there is one shot that I did like, though, um, where, well, and it's it's kind of the thing that really made me start thinking about what I mentioned with Corrine and how Bond's involvement with her leads to her death. Same thing here, where... You could argue that I mean these scientists are maybe not as innocent because they are developing some very deadly gas, clearly, or like some sort of toxin. Uh, but it is because of Bond just going in there and messing up and leaving that vial on there that they do die. 
And then you get, right near the end of the scene, you get the shot kind of like looking in at Bond behind the glass. And you do get like the dead bodies in the reflection. I was like, oh, that's, if that was like kind of like overtly done on purpose to sort of show the people, the, the body count that Bond is racking up now with his involvement in this project. I mean, that's quite nice. It's definitely, you could tell there was a purpose to setting up the shot like that where you had the two bodies on the floor. Um, but you're right. It, it For what, for what the scene is and basically telling you that hey there's some there's some nasty gas in this in this plot it did go on a bit long yeah i didn't take the reflection as in them trying to relate it to bond i think they were just trying to hammer it home about like drax is doing something bad and bond has found out about it like it's more about bond has realized that drax is having some sort of scheme that is going to kill people so showing the bodies and bond is kind of like tying that together like, I don't think they were going for more that, like, connection to Bond and Bond being the one who caused it. I think it's more like Drax caused it and now Bond has to stop him. But Bond did cause it. <laughs> oh, I mean, he, that's details. <laughs> I think I've given the film a bit too much credit, perhaps. Yeah, it, it was nice, but yeah, I think it's meant to be more towards Drax and, oh, this Drax character is no good. He must be stopped. Mm, yeah. So after Bond has meddled with the scientists and got his little vial, which he's put in his pocket... Uh, he's about to go leave the the complex outside and look who's there, look who attacks him. It's Chang. Chang's back um, in a kendo outfit. He's doing, he's got a stick. I think, I, I remember talking about kendo before, so it must have come up in a previous Bond film. Probably you only live twice. Um, but yeah, so you get, uh, you get a little fight scene now between Bond and Chang, who is doing his kendo attacking and, and things like that. And this fight scene eventually leads into the place we saw earlier with the actual glass and where the lady was giving the tour. So you're getting all of these priceless, valuable pieces of art and glass and vases and um, uh, yeah, all sorts of stuff. And obviously with that comes the, the fact that you are going to get a lot of destruction. I mean, that's like, you know, bullet in a china shop type of thing. So you get... Uh, you get the two of them just like smashing into pretty much everything in this shop as they're fighting. Uh, Bond grabs a sword, which has, I think it was pointed out by the tour guide earlier, like a sword of a glass guard. And um, he uses that. And it's actually, it's quite nice to see Bond use a sword. I don't know if we've ever seen it before in a film so far. Not so far, no. Yeah, like actually Bond using some sword fighting skills, lunging and... and um, trying to take he actually like chops chops chang's uh kendo stick completely which is kind of cool and yeah when i was watching this i was like oh yeah that's that was a big reference in dying of the day must have been like this scene so yeah um you get some kind of cool uh you do get some cool lighting in here like it's quite dark and it does get a bit better and um later on when they they go up to like the, the clock bit but Overall, this whole scene in, in the, the glass bit, at least for now, is like pure. I want to say it's good, but mainly because it's like it's just fun seeing things destroyed on a very basic level. It's like you want to you see this big glass shop, you want to see it smashed up and it's like give the audience what they want type of deal. It's nothing crazy, nothing mind blowing, nothing very smart. It's just let's smash up this. Let's have a bit of action. And uh, yeah, so that's what happens. Uh, they eventually make their way up to this kind of upper level near um, near a clock face. Uh, on the way there, Bond spots a crate, which says something about Rio de Janeiro. So that's kind of like the, as, as you said earlier, they, they do make it clear why Bond then goes to the next areas. And that's, this is the sign for the audience, like big crate, big words on it, Rio de Janeiro. Okay, that's the next place to go to. Um, anyway, behind the clock face, the fight continues, you get this cool blue lighting, um, quite stylized lighting, I'd say. And it eventually ends with Bond kicking, I don't know if he kicks, I don't know how he does it, but he pushes Chang through the clock face uh, and just so happens to land on this, this band at the bottom who's playing and singing and lands straight through, head first through the, the piano um, with like a, a really cartoony like thwang sound and you get i can't even can't remember what film it's from is it casablanca oh 
Oh no! It ah oh, no, maybe it is. Oh, I I I can see the scene in my head. Yeah. Anyway, Bond leans out the window, looks down, and and sees Chang through the piano, and says, "Play it again, Sam." So there you go. Because oh, it's a piano. <laughs> yeah, and instead of play it again, Sam, it's San because Japanese. Get it? Oh, does he say San? I, I thought he just said Sam. <laughs> I think he does say San. I had turned off subtitles by this point because they're too big on my Blu-ray and they were distracting me. But I'm pretty sure he does say play it again, Sam. Oh, okay. I missed that. I just heard it as Sam. Yeah. But yeah, yeah it's, it's a fine little fight scene. Nothing, nothing crazy. This just goes back to the point I've already made and I'm going to probably have to keep making it where it's like, this in itself is fine. And what we're currently seeing is a pretty standard Bond affair, really. A bit more silliness than normal, but we got a pretty good opening stunt and... Now Bond is going across the world investigating this guy. And this one in itself, I think in another Bond film, probably would do a lot better. But in Moonraker, and especially because, like, he's not in Venice for long, it just seems so like, it just doesn't blend with the rest of the film all that well because of its kind of pacing and the way it jumps around. So, yeah, you're right. It's fun to see them smash each other in a glass museum. But even that scene, it's like, there's no flow to it at all it just feels like shots of like these two actors just okay well we know we want to smash everything in the room so i'm just gonna throw you into it <laughs> down it goes <laughs> and just the floor getting absolutely covered in glass and that's it so it's like it's totally fine it's just i feel like and i'm probably gonna make this point later as well i feel like they should have just cut to space way sooner and when you watch this film the experience i had is that i know they're going to space and I know a lot is going to happen there. So why am I watching Chang and Bond have a fight in a glass museum? Like, it just doesn't mesh with the rest of the film. But by itself, it's fine. It's just, I don't think it, it works so much with the rest. Although I won't justify the him being stuck upside down in a piano. It just looks <laughs> completely ridiculous. I had the same feeling, what you were just saying, then, like, just, you know, get, get on with the space bit. And... I don't know what it is about the scenes in Venice. I really, I, maybe it's just I like Venice. Like kind of the same thing when I was saying I just like Las Vegas, which is why I liked Dimes Are Forever. I do like Venice and I think I don't mind these scenes. It's the scenes in Rio where I feel that way, where it's like, I just don't like, just move on. I don't care about this, these, these scenes. Like we're going to get to them obviously, but it's like, that's exactly the same way I feel, but just a little bit later on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can see that. I mean, this is definitely still quite early on in the film. And everything does somewhat flow, I guess. But yeah, <laughs> it is weird that they pick Venice. Like he starts in California. At, well, he starts in Africa, I guess, technically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Starts in Africa and then he goes to California and now he's in Venice. But then he goes to Rio. Like it should have been Venice or Rio, not Venice and Rio. Especially because there's like another location after Rio, which is it's just, oh, there's just too many. Like it just doesn't work. So yeah, I would have liked if they picked, like Rio probably would have been really cool to stick around for. Uh, especially because he went to Italy in the last film. We did see a little bit of that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, they, they should have picked one and committed to it, not this split. And and one just just one last thing about the little fight scene is I love how they had to because as I was watching this, before he gets into this fight scene with Chang, he puts puts a little vial from the lab in his in his breast pocket, and it very obviously put there like a close up of it, and then you have this fight scene where it's like he's falling over all the time, right? He's getting hit, he's getting whacked, and you're there thinking that vial is not going to survive this, and and they they knew they knew the audiences were going to think that. They like called me out as I was watching because then they had this little insert shot of Bond checking the vial. It's like, yep, still in one piece. Back in it goes. It's like, that's a tough little bit of glass there. I thought they were setting out for him to just like throw it at yeah. Chang and kill him that way. Yeah. It, yeah, I thought so. It wouldn't work plot wise, but that's what I feel like they were going for. Mm. Instead, we get <laughs> play it again, Sam. Play it again, Sam, Sam. <laughs> oh. Yeah, something. Not very good, that line. But anyway, so we then cut to Dr. Goodhead. And she's looking very fancy in a very nice looking white dress in her hotel room. Just kind of staring out of the balcony for a bit. And she goes to turn on the lamp. Because for some reason she's on there. She's in there without the lamp. And someone grabs her hand. And oh, this bit. <laughs> and then it, she turns on the lamp and it's Bond. Oh, <laughs> just sitting oh. there like a creep in the hotel room. I just love the sound that he makes. It's like a 
Oh, it's a really awkward oh. little scream. Oh. <laughs> yeah, like so he's bad. shocked for some reason. And it's it's another one of these. Like it's another one like straight away. Like on paper, I like the idea of Bond just being kind of a bit cheeky and playful and stuff. It just doesn't come across that way at all. And breaking into someone's hotel room and grabbing their hand. Like, no, Bond, no. He just really wants those drinks. Oh, well, he does have a problem. I think that's fair. That's true. Uh, so Bond explains that the, the, the Japanese henchman or this, this person tried to kill me. So because she is associated with Drax and he was associated with Drax, he basically asks her, like, hey, what's going on? What's going on with this lab? And as he kind of asks that, she doesn't really say much. So Bond then starts looking around the room and we get a few shots or a few kind of... The scene is then Bond finding all these different gadgets so he picks up a pen, goes to use it and sees, oh, it's actually a syringe. And he's like, oh, I wouldn't want to get stabbed by that. And picks up the diary that she has and has a little read and, ah, oh, there's a dart in it for stabbing mm. people with the dart. Uh, and then Bond notices the champagne and he's like, ah, this is my brand. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you must have been expecting me, it seems. Yeah, I don't know if there was like a... I don't know if that was meant to be a gag with the whole i might be like just filthy minded but like he says like if it was a 69 you'd you were expecting me i'm like come on is that really the level we're at because or am i just seeing something that's not there i just really oh, i would I definitely that a, believe it yeah. but we have definitely seen him drink like the same champagne before so i think it is actually a, like something from the other one Okay, I thought they were just using the the like the vintage year as a bit of a double double entendre. They well. might also be doing that. Like they might totally also be doing that because 1969, I guess, when was the first Roger Moore film? 73? 72? Yeah. So that back then, that wouldn't have been vintage if he was drinking it then. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It, it probably was, but yeah. So he's he's going around, and then she sprays herself with perfume, of course. Uh, Bond tries to spray one and it's a flamethrower and lastly he picks up a handbag and there's like a big receiver aerial coming out <laughs> of it so eventually Bond says ah this is all standard CIA equipment which I don't really like that I'll be honest it's not a big deal very minor detail but I like the idea that these wacky gadgets are like Bond's thing or at least MI6 and Q's thing I don't like the idea that the Americans are also developing all these wacky gadgets like Bond's gadgets are just and the style of the gadgets are just more standard spy gear in this world. I much prefer the idea that it's more grounded to 007 and it's kind of distinct to him. I don't like the idea that the CIA is just giving everyone all these kind of wacky and weird hidden gadgets like this. Oh, I didn't even think about that, but you are so right. Like that is that is it's not even a very conscious thing, but yeah, like that is meant to be Q's little geekery. Like Q likes making this weird stuff, and it's like, oh, now we know there's like an American Q somewhere doing all the same thing. No, no. Oh. They could have had it where they had like one. Like I wouldn't mind if it was just one of these, like the flamethrower or something. But they purposely have Bond go through like four or five of these gadgets and expose them to then tie it to the CIA, and it's like that's just a bit much. Like, that's Bond's thing. Don't... No Americans. You can't have it. <laughs> Quite right. You hear that? Yeah, no yeah. Americans. <laughs> Where's my cucumber sandwich? <laughs> Afternoon tea for all. <laughs> uh, so, Bond then goes in for a kiss. Because <laughs> of course he does. Yeah. And they do kiss. And oh, I... I lost the plot a little bit with this dialogue, just did not pay attention. They're talking about something about pulling their resources together, and but I think they do actually sleep together in this instance. It's just... Like, I think she hasn't, like, fallen for him. I don't take it as that. Like, it's like she's been exposed as a CIA agent by Bond, and there's kind of, like, a benefit to those them sleeping together, I guess, to try and exchange info, because... Uh, Bond sees that she has plane tickets, but they're also saying how we don't trust each other. Like, I don't trust you, you don't trust me, trust. Ah, oh, that's that's out of the question. Um, but they still kind of sleep together, but... Oh, it just didn't... 
didn't like this at all. Like it's, I don't know if they're trying to replicate the Spy Who Loved Me sort of bit where it's like two agents bouncing against each other and using each other a bit. But if it is, it's very rushed and just doesn't work uh, in the same way. Yeah, I actually kind of forgot that she was a CIA agent. And I kind of don't like that they keep doing this. There's a lot of examples now where it's like, oh, actually, she's undercover again. I kind of get why they have to do it. But uh, it would have been nice if she was just a she was just a scientist that was like ended up being really good. You know what I mean? Um, and this whole scene, I mean, I'm kind of with you and I don't really remember much. And I just remember kind of wanting to get through this scene. It reminded me a bit of the scenes of Corrine where it's just, it's just clumsy, awkward dialogue. It doesn't flow. There's no charm. There's no chemistry. Just didn't like it. No. And also I should say that good head also just doesn't have an arc in this film at all, which doesn't help. Like, a lot of previous Bond girls, whether the arcs have worked or not is up for debate. And some Bond girls get a mini arc, some don't. Uh, Anya in the last film definitely did, even if it wasn't handled too well at the end. Uh, Good Night definitely did not. (laughs) Her arc was, I have a butt, let's see what happens. Um, (laughs) Good Head is one that definitely doesn't get an arc at all. She's like, stuff's revealed about her, but there's no progression between Bond and her. She's just the Bond girl who's also a CIA agent. So take that for what it is. Yep. So the next morning, as Tom says, they do sleep together and Bond sneaks off in the morning without her noticing, although she does notice. And uh, she also is very quickly going to leave. She tells the, the hotel to go fetch her bags and... Bond has gone back off to go see M. M and the minister have now arrived in Venice and he must have reported back to them to come and have a look at the lab that he uh, he infiltrated earlier on. So he takes them to that glass blowing place and gets them all to wear gas masks just before they're about to go in because obviously you're worried about all the toxic stuff in there and you know you you see M like struggling to put on this gas mask. Poor old man. He's, <laughs> uh, I found it funny because like one scene, like you see him like trying to pull it on, and then it cuts, and he's like got it on perfectly. So it's like they clearly went in and was like, "Nope, oh, here you go, here you go, Bernard, here you go." Um, anyway, he takes them in, uh, expecting to show off the lab, and what do you know? He goes in, and it's this big, stately room, kind of like the ones we've seen back in California. Um, big windows, big paintings, lots of curtains, and there's just no sign at all of the lab. It's like a completely different area. And obviously he's there going kind of like, whoa, and and there's Drax um, at the far end, looking very confused, and they walk up and kind of sheepishly take off their, their gas masks. Uh, and Drax is there saying, like, oh, I'd, I don't really understand you, you, you British and your sense of humour type of thing, um, which obviously leads to the, the minister looking very embarrassed and going up and apologising. And, yeah, obviously not very happy with Bond. It cuts to cut to them outside and the minister telling off Bond or telling off M to tell off Bond saying, take him off the case. You know, I've never been so embarrassed in my life sort of thing, Uh, which is kind of the one thing I do find strange about this is that, you know, they had this character in The Spy Who Loved Me and in that film, Bond and the minister seemed a lot more chummy. Like he was there calling him, I think he even calls him Freddy as they're talking. And it's like, now they've kind of backtracked and made it like, no, this is a serious guy. Like he is, he doesn't really care about Bond. Kind of well, I took it more because they dropped the lines in that the minister like plays crabs or like plays some sort of game with Drax. So he has some sort of like working relationship with the man, which is part of um, Drax being a very powerful person in this world. So I took it more that because they were friends, like Bond taking them there. And that's why he's so embarrassed that they're mad at Bond, because he is also friends with Drax. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely he has a good reason to be embarrassed and angry, but it's just uh, it's strange how how they go from like first name basis to take him off the case one film later. Um, so you get just a little scene. He walks off and you just get M and Bond now next to a canal. And Bond gives M the vial and says, you know, go give this to Q to go test uh, as you know, evidence that there really was a lab there and he's not just making it up. And you get this really sweet little scene between M and Bond where M's basically saying, like, yeah, I need to take you off now. Like, I've got to listen to orders. So how's about you? You take uh, two weeks leave, two, two weeks leave of absence. 
Um, is there any way you'd like to go? Sort of, I think he has done this before, but you know, hinting at Bond just to continue with the mission on his own accord anyway. And so Bond's there thinking, yeah, I've always, always had a hankering to go to Rio. And uh, Ems, I, I seem to recall you saying so. You get the little twinkle in the eye and a little bit of like, oh, you know, Ems got Bond's back. And I, I do like that. I really do like this scene. Mm, yeah, we get more of that. And it, it works really well because this is the last portrayal of M from Bernard Lee. Oh, yeah. so the fact we get so many more like these nice moments. It's stuff we've seen before, but this is like the most of these we get in this. So it's like, oh, and, and I, oh, it, it's another instant of it being it's so British. Like, <laughs> Mm. They both know what they're talking about. It's like, I've always wanted to go to Rio. It's like, ah, yes, I remember you mentioning that, of course. <laughs> very good. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, very sweet, as you say. So then we cut to Rio. We don't waste any time. Bond. Well, cut. Do we, not do we quite. Get... Wait, what, what, what else happens? So then we cut to Drax on the phone. Uh, oh, God, explaining, yeah, this scene. Yes, I've everything's all good. So we know Drax was up to no good, but he's on the phone talking to someone saying, yes, everything's all clear and saying, I'm going to need a replacement for Chang. My, the Japanese guy I hired is dead. I'm going to need a replacement. And then something gets said to him and he's like, oh, yes, that'll be. I can't remember exactly what he says, but he's like, yes, that will do. That'll be great. So we then cut to a very tall man. <laughs> I wonder who this could be. Mm -hmm. uh, the camera is behind him walking through airport security. And he goes through the metal detectors. The security guards go to stop him. And we see that it's Jaws. And Jaws give a big old smile at the, the security guard. And the guard just lets him through. So we have now seen that Jaws is in Rio. And Drax has hired uh, Jaws to take out Bond. Right. How could I forget the scene? Because this scene just raises so many questions for me. What are you right, yeah, We're talking about? You, well, you get Drax on the phone. As you say, Chang's dead. So he's on the phone. And the line that he says is... Oh, well, if you can get him, of course. So that begs a question like, well, first of all, Jaws is obviously kind of infamous, right? People know Jaws. Other other villains of the world know of Jaws. So he's you know, a popular guy. But also, number two is, does Jaws have an agent? Like, how does... <laughs> is he like a talent? It's like, oh, yeah, well, you know, we can book in Jaws for um, Stromberg... But then he's, you know, we've got to move over to Drax now. He's very busy. You know, his, his diary is chocker blocks, Jaws. It's just like, who is he talking to on the phone? Who is organizing? <laughs> is it like a henchman um, yellow pages? You know what I mean? Like, what's going yeah. on? Yeah. I like it, though. I like it. <laughs> I really like the idea that a henchman can just be picked up and, yeah, <laughs> open the yellow pages, as she's saying. Just like, oh, there's Jaws, fella. Sounds like you can get the job done. <laughs> J, Jaws, hmm, yeah. metal teeth, very tall. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Book him. <laughs> yeah, get him booked. Love to see him see him do his stuff. Uh, yeah, that is that is a great little scene. I'm sad I forgot about that. But okay, then we get then we get Bond in uh, Rio. I can't remember. Do we get a, a plane shot? We typically get yeah, a plane Yeah, we get shot. the Air France for some reason. Oh, it's a Concorde, which, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, which I'm assuming is like product placement or something. But yeah, it's the Concorde Air France landing in Rio for him coming there. Right. And I wrote down in my notes, I can't really remember it now, but I, I wrote down that there was a, a nice instrumental theme of Moonraker here. Uh, I do think the music is better in this film compared to Spy Love Me, which is might be quite controversial, but I do like a lot of the... The soundtrack in this one this was one of the themes that stood out to me i think we i were actually saying... i wrote down this was a remix of the main theme but put a question mark because oh. I, I just find it so forgettable the main theme where it's like i like this and i think it's a remix of the main theme but i actually wasn't sure which is not something that usually happens with these films usually they make it quite obvious but i was just i just find that song so forgettable that i was like i think this is a remix but i'm not sure ah uh, yeah i guess that just goes back to me having a soft spot um so Bond is uh, Bond goes to his hotel. Of course, we got to have the Bond in the hotel uh, scenes, and he is uh, shown his suite by this uh, uh, this very strange character. I mean, he's only on there on the screen for a few seconds, but it's like the guy showing him his room and kind of like how fancy it is, or a presidential suite or something. It's called, and I can't remember the line Bond says, but. Uh, he basically says some sarky comment and like the guy is so unimpressed <laughs> he just walks away uh looking so unhappy with bond um just a kind of odd character to include but uh bond's there and he hears uh, some 
shaking. I think some cocktail shaking. And there's a random woman in the room kind of waiting for him, making him a another vodka martini. Again, you're right. It's one where he does not say shaken, not stirred. She says it on his behalf. I never picked up on that, but you're right. Like that. He never says it. It's always other people saying it to him. Yeah, like he has said it before, but yeah, the majority of the time it's 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 someone else will tell him what he's having. And I guess the idea is that it's so famous and it's James Bond that people just know this stuff and that kind of adds to the character a bit. Mm. But this character is uh, Manuela, who Manuela. is uh, kind of similar to Goodnight in that I think she was she's uh, like a station somewhere. I wrote down station VH. So she she has information and working i think m asked her to help bond so yeah she's there to assist and, and help find out more about this c and w importers which bond is asking about um, and when says that there's this warehouse they can go and investigate later on um but it's going to be busy because it is carnival like carnival carnival's on and which we'll see later on so uh yeah they sit down and you get another kind of creepy creepy cringy line and action by bond as he starts to undress her and is like how do we spend six hours in rio if you don't samba it's like such a such a uh, a long line and it just doesn't work but i think they are meant to sleep together like yeah yeah but it just cuts thing. like there's no real moves from bond they just talk about business and a little bit of banter i guess and then she sits down and bond's just like, i'm just gonna undo the robe here we go yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That's how he works. This bond. But I, I, I don't get it. It's just. I mean, I've already, we've already said it, right? But it's just. I don't get it. It doesn't work. Mm-hmm. I don't find it charming. <laughs> like, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, but then we do cut to Carnival, uh, a, a giant big street parade happening in Brazil with lots of people, lots of noise, lots of music, lots of dancing, and everything like that. And we see. Uh, Manuel, did you say her name was? Manuela. Manuela. I'm not going to get that right again, I don't think. Manuela uh, and Bond trying to get through this big crowd, all the big parades. And for some reason, they're very fancy. Like, Bond's in his tux, she's in a very fancy-looking dress. I don't think they really explain why. Hmm, no, I don't think so. Because they're just going to investigate this warehouse nearby, yeah. which is owned by the, the Drax, Drax Industries. Uh, but for some reason, they've kind of dressed up very smart, even though everyone around them is not because it's all more casual and more colourful and over the top. They had all in speedos and stuff around them. They don't really fit in. Yeah, like I like it. I like the visual, of, but it does seem like an excuse to just put Bond in the tux and have him yeah. look smart, which I like Bond in a tux and I liked it in the last film. And this just seems like a massive excuse to, to put him in. Wow. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they may make it through lots of parade shots and eventually get to C and W importer exporter, this warehouse across town. So they eventually escape the crowd and go down this alley and bond. Well, we actually see this odd looking uh, clown in the crowd. So keep note of that. Uh, well, it's a crowd, uh, a clown costume, I should say. Like someone is wearing a giant clown head and it's very odd. They don't focus yeah. on it too much, but you see it because it's like, that looks really weird. Um, yeah, it's done quite well because it's obviously quite a disturbing looking outfit, but you get the shot of them walking down the alley and it just stays on that angle. So you can see the clown that having turned and is just cu- still staring at them as they're walking they're walking down towards the camera. It's quite, quite a nice shot to set up what comes up next. Hmm. So yeah, so Bond climbs over a wall in this alleyway to go investigate the warehouse and we see a cabana club is very nearby so the uh i, I don't remember her name <laughs> the woman is there waiting for bond in the alleyway we see this club and then bonds in the warehouse and there's lots of noise in the background and flashing lights and there's a cat for some reason uh, running across making some noise and as bond is investigating the warehouse he eventually sees a, a drax air flight patch uh, which is what he he's basically come for. He's looking for information. And he sees that patch, uh, so he's like, "That's interesting." So as the woman is waiting, we see that creepy clown is slowly walking towards her. Uh, initially, he's quite far away, but he just kind of keeps coming. She's there, quite uncomfortable, looking around. But eventually, the clown gets all the way up close to her, takes off the head, and it's Jaws. No, <laughs> it's Jaws the clown. 
Jaws the Clown. <laughs> Sorry. So Jaws the Clown uh, grabs the woman and goes in for the old bite of the neck, the classic Jaws the Clown move. Everyone loves it. But as that happens, a load of people come out of the Cabana Club all dancing and merry and they all start dancing around Jaws. So, like, because all these people hang out around Jaws, is like, oh, I can't kill this woman. So instead just, like, starts dancing with her. <laughs> just holding with her, dancing, like, yeah, yeah, this is great. So they're all surrounding him and dancing. They're all dancing. At this point, I don't get why the woman doesn't ask for any help. Yeah, she, that, she's just deadly silent the whole time. So yeah, weird. she just goes along with Jaws' dance moves and it's just like, uh, and Yeah, so, so they all then dance and eventually they do leave to leave Jaws in peace and Bond at this point then... So Jaws goes for the bite and then Bond drops down from the wall on top of Bond. They smile at each other. Jaws smiles at him. Bond smiles back. And then another group of people show up <laughs> and start dancing. And... Jaws tries to get to Bond and steps forward, but as he steps forward, he steps into the crowd, who then push him away from Bond. I say crowd, it's not that many people. It's, it's really just a not. Line. It's, it's a like a gun. line of people push him away, and he's like, oh no, I need to go and bite that person. And eventually he just like goes like, oh well. He doesn't say this, but <laughs> on his face is like, well, if you can't beat them gotta join them and just starts dancing with them and, and leaves yeah it's a strange scene so I liked some of this scene because I think the clown is quite creepy and it goes to what you're saying that it's quite effective actually seeing this clown go down this alleyway because it's huge because it's Jaws and it's kind of taking that element of the happy paradeness and then having someone actually kind of dressed up and also looking quite sinister at the same time I totally get why someone would not find it sinister, but I think it is somewhat sinister. For me, this is when I kind of fully realised that Jaws was a joke character. I know you said he's clearly a joke character in the beginning, but to me it hadn't fully set in until this scene. Because they straight up take the intimidating, quite tense stuff from the, fir uh, from the Spy Who Loved Me, where he goes in to bite someone, and all the gravitas and the weight they gave that and how kind of ten much tension they injected into it, they intentionally have him do that, but then immediately suck away that to do comedy. Like, it's almost very deliberate that it's like, no, this is not that type of Jaws, because that type of Jaws would have just gone crazy and just done it. But no, this is a very cine, fun Jaws instead. And... I got more into the city jaws as we went along, but I don't know if this was a very good way of doing it. Like having him do his signature bit, but interrupt him for the sake of a joke. Like, I don't think that's how they should have handled kind of transitioning jaws to be this more comedy focused character. Yeah. For me, the telling thing with this scene and just how much I think they've, they've ruined that, that aspect of jaws kind of beyond redemption now is it was it was scarier and creepier before he's revealed. You know, the clown just walking down is a really cool shot, and it's it's a good use of that costume and that culture and having a a a, a visual like a striking visual like that. As soon as he lifts it off at its jaws, I was like, oh yeah, it's jaws. Okay, <laughs> it's like it's just all, all it was all lost, and it's like well, that shouldn't be how it is. It should be you take it off at its jaws, and it's like oh no, it's jaws. But it's just that. That whole feeling and that whole like Egyptian scene from Spy Love Me, you just can't do that anymore. Um, which is a shame. But there you go. That's what it is. It's a shame. But for me, this scene is kind of ripping off the, the plaster, like getting it out of the way. So mm. I wasn't really a big fan of this bit, but it did help put me in the mindset of like, okay, Jaws is just a city character now. Let's just try and enjoy that for what it is. Like before this point, I didn't quite get that sense. But now it's like, okay, now I can just take Jaws for what it is. Like, I stopped comparing him to the spy who loved me after this scene because it's so clear that he's not the same character that he was before. It's it's good that you got this now because the next scene of Jaws, it's yeah, you you need that mindset to <laughs> to really appreciate it. Yeah, you would hate so much of what happens with Jaws. After oh yeah, this. oh yeah. So after Jaws is whisked away, um, Bond checks on Manuela, makes sure she's all right. Since he's got the Drax air freight label he shows that to her says do you know anything about this and she points out that that is um yeah Drax's airline and it comes out of I wrote it down San Pietro airport so that's that's where Bond has to go and investigate next so 
that's when we cut to Bond on Sugarloaf Mountain. I don't I know. Say. Like that, that very tall place in Rio where you can just see the whole city. That place. Yeah. At first I was like, is this where the statue of Jesus is? But it's not. Um, it's just a big mountain. So he's up there. Um, as you say, it's got like, it's really high up and it's overlooking uh, all of Rio. And he's using one of the telescopes to check the uh, runways of that airport. And you can see the Drax um, planes flying out of it. As he's doing that, he peers, like he, he peers the lens over, and who does he see on the other end, looking straight back at him? It's Doctor Holly Goodhead. She's Whoa. back. She's back. Yeah, we kind of knew that she was heading here because of the the tickets in the last scene with her, but um, somehow they have bumped into each other once again. I'm pretty sure there's a bit more back and forth dialogue. I didn't really note any of it down, like the whole sort of. Um, like flirty hating each other <laughs> that these two love hate relationship that they've got going on. Um, I think it's just them agreeing to work together because they're both here and they're both on the same line, you know, so they, as I said before, pooling their resources and not actually running off without each other this time. Um, have I missed anything there? I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. No, important. that's about it. They're saying we don't trust each other, but that's what makes it exciting. And it's, it's the same old stuff. I think it's basically, she just says Drax is moving out. Or they come to that conclusion of, oh, a lot of stuff has been shipping out of this airport recently, which means Drax is moving to a new location. Right. That's right. Yeah. So now they want to go back down and and investigate that. So they go back down on the cable car from the top of the mountain. And this is where we get the next, like moving a mile a minute here, we get another action scene. Um, They're on the cable car. And who is back? It's Jaws straight away. (laughs) Ah. No time wasted. He's on a mission, so he's there in, I don't know, he must be at, is he at the bottom? Yeah, he must I've, be at the bottom. Is he at the bottom? Because the other guy's at the bottom. Oh no, yeah, you're right, he has to be, hasn't he? Because then he, yeah. So yeah. he is there with his his other goon, who is also bald. He must have a thing for, for bald, go, like, side. Initially, side I was men. like, oh, Sandor's back. And I was like, <laughs> no, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> oh, no. Um, Sandor's brother yeah maybe maybe it's family business so Jaws is there and he bites one of the cables I'll make sure I get this in the right order because a lot happens no he here. does the will thing first oh okay so he he stops the cable car so then why does he bite it <laughs> I think he's I think he is trying to kill Bond I don't think he actually bites it though oh does he just try to yeah, so I think it's like, yeah, he grabs the wheel to stop it from spinning and then we get some more comedy bits of it starting to go and he's like, ah, starts to go and ah. Uh, and then he goes to bite the cable, but I don't think he actually can bite through it, which is why he then uh, does something else. Okay, so at any rate, he makes the Bond and Goodhead's cable car stop. So they're in it, they notice it's stopping. For some reason, Bond says, oh, Let's go outside. It's better to be outside than in, which doesn't make much sense to me. Like, why would you want to be outside where there's <laughs> you can fall off? But um, they like go out the fire exit bit on the top, so they're standing on top of the cable car. Meanwhile, Jaws, now that it's all stopped, he is heading up in the opposite direction, and he eventually meets them like where they are. And so the two cable cars are side by side, and you get lots of there is a lot of smiling in this isn't there, by uh, by Rog and, and Jaws. They smile to each other. Um, yeah, I take it as in, because Jaws never talks, and because his thing is smiling, it's kind of like, this is their way of communicating. They don't talk, they just smile at each other. Just smiling, yeah, that's all it needs. Uh, Jaws really awkwardly jumps over um, to their cable car. Uh, I, should, I, I think Goodhead had also grabbed a chain which is comes up in a minute. Um, yeah, he really awkwardly jumps over. Like you can tell where they just cut, and then it's it just doesn't it doesn't flow at all. This this whole scene does not flow. You get Bond and Jaws fighting on top of a cable car. You know, like punching and and swooping and everything. Um, Goodhead is there, like trying to dodge out the way, and Jaws whacks her a couple of times out of the way. Again, it's another scene where there's just no noise. It's kind of like Manuela in that previous scene where she's 
<laughs> she's getting kidnapped and about to be killed and she's not making any noise. And it's the same with this. There's no screaming or anything. It's really strange. It's just like eerily quiet when you're meant to be having a, a fight scene on top of a, uh, a cable car, you know, hundreds of feet in the air. But Well, I think that's the thing. So I think lack of noise, maybe they should have put some more in. But when you have something so high up, I feel like the lack of noise does kind of work, right? Because cause when you're high up, there is just less noise in general. And the lack of noise kind of helps emphasize how high up they are. They're so high up, they can't even hear the nearby city. So maybe that's not how they meant it. But for me, having a lack of noise high up totally makes sense. Maybe they should have had a little bit of wind or something, but you know. Yeah, some some wind and just some more like grunts and like fighting sounds. I don't know. It just didn't seem right. I also forgot to mention there's one point where Bond nearly falls off. Um, he like slips and nearly falls off. And this is where like this scene was just it didn't started off bad because you get Bond uh, or you get Goodhead truck like picking up Bond, but it's just the most lifeless acting because they're so clearly on like a sound stage and and these shots are not meshing together well. Where you get the close ups and then you get the shots of the cable car far away. Because they're like, oh, oh no, James, hold on. And it's just like, come on, put a little bit more into it. You're meant to be <laughs> hanging off the edge of this cable car. I just really dislike this whole scene. Anyway, um, you get, uh, as I say, Bond and Jaws fighting for a bit. They eventually lock Jaws in the cable car. He like, falls down and then they lock him in there. Um, and they use the chain to slide down the cable car. Um, together Jules I think he tries to get out but he can't so this is where he's like egging on the the, the bald henchman to speed up the cable car to follow them makes no sense because like his he would have been hundreds of hundreds of feet away I don't know how he's able to like see his face but yeah he's like you know speed it up speed it up keeps on saying faster and faster so this bald guy at the controls is speeding up the cable car and and I get into such a speed where he realizes that he's like going too fast because Bond and Goodhead drop off at the last second because they land on ground, they're low enough to land, and the cable car is still going crazy fast. And you get this like close up shot of Jaws, like whoa, as as the cable car careers into the um, like the loading section and smashes everything. And yeah, you get like nice. Is this the bit with the Seven Up billboard? Nice bit of product placement. Yeah, Seven Up. Yeah, you get this shot of like the whole building smashing and the billboard smashing. Oh. So be- before you carry on, because we all know what's about to happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> before we get too distracted, uh, I like this scene a bit more than you did. I actually okay. quite like it. Uh, so something that you- you're right, there's a lot of stuff that they insert in there, which is fake. But there is a lot of stuff that is real. And I think that stuff is still really strong. And I was reading about this before this episode. Apparently somebody like did slip and almost die one of the stuntmen oh so that shot is almost certainly real like that was somebody almost falling from that huge height and almost actually dying um so i think it's like i like it because i think the set piece itself is pretty strong in terms of having these cable cars really high up and the how kind of tense that can be and just you know it's really high up like maybe it's depends how you feel about heights in general or if you've been in a cable car i don't know Uh, But I think that works well. And the fact that we saw the last scene with Jaws and he's a bit sillier and I'm more in that frame of mind makes this kind of work a bit more for me. That Jaws being a bit more of a goofball, just trying to get to Bond on this cable car. But even then, like the idea of having Jaws on top of a cable car at this height, I feel I still feel like that's quite intimidating in itself because Jaws is just so huge and i think it was quite a smart setting to have him in where there's just kind of no escape they've kind of just got to to fight him they don't really play it that way that strongly but i think that idea is really solid so yeah you're right the the editing's not the best in the way they insert the shots but this actually worked for me i actually did quite uh enjoy this although just like i said about some of the other stuff in venice this probably works a lot better independently from the rest of the film Um, like the idea itself is strong it's just when you put it with everything else is when it kind of goes a little bit bit weak for me Uh, but yeah i actually did quite find it entertaining overall okay i'm glad you could enjoy it i i by this point i think this whole yeah i think for me as well as what all the stuff i said it's like they whenever they have jaws it's like they need to have jaws 
and Bond together because that's just the nature of these two characters together, right? You know, you have like the the gag punches in the mouth and the clang sounds or Jaws picking them up and is really strong. You have to have them close by. I would have really, I think this scene and this setup of a cable car is strong enough, as you say, with like the idea of the height, where it could have just been Jaws like at the controls messing around. I almost feel like it didn't need Jaws coming up to them and like them trying to work out how to get out of it. That, was, that would have be been how I would have done it. But I, I do get why they need to have, they always need to have Jaws right up in the action. So yeah, do you want to get onto where it goes to? I don't really want to talk about this bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we can do this nice and quick then. So the cable car is smashed into the, the small building, the 7-Up building and destroyed it. And of course it's Jaws, so he hasn't been killed. And we see his head poking out in between this wheel. So he's doing a bit more of a cartoon face of like, oh, what happened? Like Tom and Jerry cartoon where like Tom's in a load of rubble. <laughs> it's very much that. Mm. And for some reason, some woman comes back. Uh, <laughs> comes back to the this site because everyone ran away. When they saw the cable car, everyone ran off. And Jaws is there, so a woman comes back and helps Jaws out, take the wheel off him. And then he stands up and they stare at each other with dovey eyes, romantic eyes, and then some kind of very famous classical music starts playing, and they do more lovey dovey eyes, and without saying a word, they just hold hands and, and walk <laughs> off together. So this is Jaws' <laughs> girlfriend, everybody. You, you know what? Actually, I've just said that I, I don't want to talk about this bit, but yeah, Jaws gets a girlfriend. All right, good for good for him. Maybe it's <laughs> just saying that just you saying that actually it's making me laugh. Maybe it's not so bad. I think if you know it's coming, yeah, it's all right because it's dumb. <laughs> but it's so dumb it comes back around on itself. Like so bad it's good, and I think that's what they were going for. Though I'm not too sure. I could have done without the stock like classical music, like the stereotypical thing. Maybe it's better they do pick that rather than John. Like maybe they're like, hey John, can you compose? <laughs> <laughs> can you compose a theme for when jaws falls in love with a girl at first sight it's like no it's like all right well we'll just <laughs> what's cruelty free then <laughs> we'll just use uh, that yeah by this point they have like 100 percent lost control of jaws like they've just gone all in with this now and you know fair play this is how it is now for the rest of the film you know what you, you know where you stand they've put in the lovey-dovey music you know what you're gonna get Yes, it's just important to know this is coming as well because I remember when I rewatched this film hating this and hating some other parts of Moonraker. But if you know it's coming, you know, if you brace for it, brace for impact, it doesn't mm -hmm. hurt you as much, you see. Yeah. Um, put your seatbelt on. You don't go flying through the windshield. So that's what you <laughs> kind of got to do here. Just kind of take it for what it is. And I can, you know, I have been able to separate Jaws from the last film from the Jaws in this film. Like, I don't, I can do that in my head. I get why somebody totally couldn't. And if you ask me, like, do you want Dolly? Because her name is apparently Dolly. It's never said, uh, but she does have a name. Would you prefer Dolly in or out of this film? I would still say out of this film. But if you know it's coming, it's silly. Maybe I'm a hypocrite because of what I said about Diamonds Are Forever. But, <laughs> but I feel like at least with Jaws, it's like a concentrated comedy character at this point. And this is very quick as well. Like, it's just a very quick scene of those two staring at each other, holding hands, and then leaving. Like, it's a very small part of the film uh, at this stage anyway. Yeah, it would be interesting to see if they, if this scene wasn't wasn't so quick. How would they have done that without any dialogue? That's yeah, I they guess just, that's it, couldn't they? They could. Yeah, they just cut straight to holding hands, and that's enough said. Lovely. So after they walk off holding hands, who had a better uh, holding hands scene? Mr. White? <laughs> Mr. <King. laughs> Or I'm Jaws always, and Dolly. I'm always going to say Winton Kid. Come on now. Well, well, I knew that was coming, but it needs yeah. to be asked. It, it does. So, yeah, we go back to Bond and Goodhead. They're on the grass where they jump down from the cable car. And she kisses him. And he's like, what was that for? And it's for saving my life. So now they're a couple. And it's because Bond saved Goodhead from Jaws. Which I guess makes a ton of sense. I don't care. <laughs> mm, pretty much. Uh, very boring. But some medics show up, some paramedics show up, and Bond's like, no, 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 we're fine. Thank you. 
Uh, but they just go and knock Bond out and then grab good head. Uh, and we cut to inside an ambulance where Bond wakes up and Goodhead and Bond are tied down on these two stretchers with this man in the middle of them. So Goodhead starts smiling at the man, being all sexy and charming-like. And while she's distracting him, Bond is trying to free himself from the rope and sliding the hand free. And he keeps looking at Bond and then looking at Goodhead. And eventually Bond, like, winks at the guy. And he's gotten his hand free. So he goes and kicks a fire extinguisher that's nearby, which very perfectly blinds the man, like it sprays directly at him. Uh, and then he frees himself and grabs the scalp and they they have a bit of a fight. And this is also another case, like this film does the same thing where I would say any of these fights with Roger Moore and Bond are very good. Uh, but I've just kind of accepted it at this point. Like all of these fist fights are just like judo chop, throw the guy, couple of punches, like... All of them are still just kind of the same awkward Roger Moore fights we've come to expect. And to yeah. me, this is just another one. Yeah, this one in particular is just so unnecessary as well. So it's just, well, this, this whole scene is not unnecessary because they need a way to get rid of Goodhead. But it's just such a convoluted way of doing it. And yeah, and you get more a more very, like, very overt product placement as well, where um, you get like more seven up, you get Marlboro, you even get, well, eventually you get B.A., so it's like, yep, they're getting all their money's worth. Hmm. So it's also worth saying, because we haven't touched on it yet, we were probably going to touch on the space thing, but the budget for this film, like, was huge. So yeah. The Spy Who Loved Me was there, like, let's go all in and put a load of money into this. And this bubble, this budget, like, doubles at the very least. Um, as you say, some of that money was clearly raised by all this product placement because they go really all in with it and it's all over this film. It's just back to back to back. That's the thing. It's just... That's probably the only reason why they have this scene is just so they can have some more billboards. Yeah, completely. But yeah, so this is a huge budget film for Bond, which I think did set the standard for the budgets going forward. But yeah, this film costs like at least twice as much as the last one. You mm. probably wouldn't know it up to this point. No. Um, but we'll, we'll get there. So yeah, so as you say, so they have a fight and Bond knocks the guy out, of which... He knocks the guys out, put him on the stretcher, and he rolls off, at which Goodhead pulls his hair out for some reason. Well, isn't it more that she's holding onto his hair and Bond punches him? Yeah, but it's, then... like, it's still like, what? Why <laughs> Why did you include that in this fight scene? Like, yeah, but Goodhead is holding his hair and it gets ripped out of his head. It's horrible. Yeah, she's got a very strong grip, clearly. Apparently so, so... Uh, but then Bond and the guy fall out of the ambulance. The man on the stretcher rolls down the road and crashes headfirst into a billboard, which is of a, a woman's face, and he crashes his head into the woman's mouth. And then the the slogan on it is, we'll take more care of you. And it says British Airways, which I, I, if that's meant to be a joke, I don't get it. Mm, I guess so. I just I'm assuming it's just product placement because it has to be because it says British Airwaves but I was kind of like is the joke that this is British hospitality because Bond's British so Bond taking care of him because he's British is this being knocked out but then why does he go into the mouth I don't um I wouldn't think about it too much <laughs> I, I, try, I just I guess they didn't so I shouldn't but it exactly. doesn't make sense to me yeah but that's it, basically. So Goodhead is still in the ambulance, and because the ambulance is still driving off, uh, she's been she's still there, tied down. But Bond has managed to escape, so he just walks up the road to wherever he's heading. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a strange. That's why it's just a strange scene. It's just to get rid of Goodhead, but then Bond is just walking. He's just walking off. He just knows exactly where to go. Well, they couldn't have Jaws kidnap Goodhead because Jaws is meeting the love of his life. It's all... <gasps> He's going to get jealous. Yeah, he can't have Goodhead <laughs> around. What if Jaws and Goodhead locked eyes? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, eventually Jaws does save her life. So maybe if they ever get reunited, you might fall for him. Could be. I think this film has made sure that's not going to happen. but Probably for the right. Yeah, probably for the best. Yeah, maybe not. Anyway, um, after the ambulance scene, as you say, Bond is walking off. So this is another another uh, example of a scene of Bond walking somewhere 
We have no clue what it's doing. And it ends up being uh, an MI6 like headquarters. Kind of exactly how it happened in Spy Love Me, where he's walking and he ends up going through the temple and there's Money Penny. It's it's kind of the same thing here, except he's on horseback and looking like a cowboy. And oh. there's Western music playing. Poncho. <laughs> Poncho. Is, is he wearing a sombrero? I don't know. Yeah, well, he's wearing some sort of cowboy big hat. Yeah. Yeah, so he you know, thanks these two two guys that were helping him, apparently, and, and walks on into this monastery, it seemingly looks like, because there's all these monks there and, like... Uh, what do you call that? Like the singing, but like, yeah, it's like all very strange. Like holy choir, right? That's yeah, cool. yeah. And and then he peeks through one of the doors and they're in the middle of a fight. So you kind of think like, what's going on here? Um, and you kind of go into this central courtyard area and uh, there's Q. Q's there with some of his... Uh, well, you missed something, Joe. What did I miss? He actually goes into a room and money pennies at her desk. Oh, but yeah, it's, you're right. It's the same gag again, isn't it? Yeah, that Bond just goes through a door and it's just money penny is set up in this Mexican. I, I put down Mexican. I don't know. I don't think it's Brazil, but it would make more sense if it was Brazil. But it feels more like a Mexican sort of cowboy Western area. Yeah, it does. I don't know why they're doing that. I don't. <laughs> I don't get it. But you're right, yeah, he does see Money Penny first, and they do the exact same thing about not her not believing his line. Um, then he goes to see Q. You see a bit of a gadget with, like, bolus. Is that what they're called? There's a bit of a gag there with balls and bolus. I can't remember. Well, he just um, says balls Q. <laughs> balls Q. <laughs> balls Q. Is it bolus? Is that what they're called? Uh, I don't know. I wasn't the spinny, attention. There's spinny things and someone demonstrates and spins around someone's head and blows up and then there's another thing that looks like a, ga- a guy crouching down and it opens up and it's like a machine gun inside. Whatever, we've seen this stuff before. It's fine. Um, he goes in with Q to M's office. Boss M is going to be there as well. It's kind of sad. I, I thought the last time we saw M in this film was in Venice I'm, and it was such a nice ending to the character as well. I wish we didn't get this bit with him later on. I guess you kind of have to for the plot, but... Yeah. Well, you get him at the very end of the film as well, either way. Oh, true. That is true. Um, Anyway, they're there and it's um, Q telling Bond about the results of the vial that he gave to M to analyse and what's actually what it's actually made of. And it's basically yeah some some nerve gas toxin thing that was uh, came from a flower in the Amazon, some orchid. Of course, Bond knows it. Like, as soon as Q starts saying about it, Bond, Bond's like, oh, yes, the orchid stuff, 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 is found in the depths of the blah, 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 blah. And um, that's that's kind of like the only link they have now to go off, which is kind of interesting. Like, they really don't have much. They are literally just going on roughly where this flower is, is known to grow. So maybe it's something going on there. Um, and that's it, right? Yeah, that's basically it. Bond is now going to go to the Amazon to go and find where this orchid is meant to grow because it's very rare. This whole scene's terrible. Oh like, my god! I'm worried that people probably got a bit confused when you started describing it because we were just talking about Rio, and then you started saying, "So he's on a horse and he's dressed as a cowboy, and there's monks." <laughs> um, <laughs> like I, you didn't even mention the laser gun. I, I, I just saw it in my notes. Laser gun. Like, I forgot about the laser gun. It's just so stupid. Like, and I. I I'm, I'm becoming more open to stupidity. There's just no context for any of this. Like, it's literally Bond is walking in Rio, and then it just cuts to him in Mexico. And I guess you're meant to find it funny because it's that same gag of, all oh, MI6 is set up in a different region, but there's just no connection to anything that has happened before this point. It almost feels like there was, like, an extra scene of Bond in Mexico that would have tied into this to have it make sense. It just makes no sense, and it's just not funny at this point because we've seen it before in other uh areas but at least with other films they're more grounded in that region so it makes sense like bond has not been in mexico <laughs> mm, <laughs> and maybe yeah. it's not meant to be mexico maybe that's my mistake but it feels like it's more that way with the wild west and stuff like that it's very themed that sort of way it doesn't feel like brazil but maybe it is it's just 
it just feels like such a weak link and it's just not funny it's not interesting we've seen this before done better it's just like oh god like why are we not in space <laughs> Get to why the am space. i watching like monks doing kung fu Get him in space. Come oh. on. You're right. Like, yeah. When I think of the Wild West, I don't think of Brazil. And, it, and what they did, they've done something now, like, so you had the lovey-dovey scene between Jaws and, and Dolly, where they had that that famous bit of, like, falling in love music. And they've just done it again with this, I don't know what that's from, but it's, like, from some Western, spaghetti Western film when he's riding in. They use that same music. It's like they've used that too close together, like, using some sort of, like, external music that doesn't fit into the bond universe i don't like it and then you're right it's like we've just it feels like we've just missed a scene completely um this is all the stuff that i really just as you say get on with the space stuff get rid of this i don't care i want to see all the models (laughs) getting blown up yeah but as i already said though you do forget a lot of this because the ending is all about space you do kind of roughly forget about it and you're not thinking about like what's up with those monks like (laughs) you're not thinking that at the end of the film so i can at least give it that credit but when you look back on this stuff i could see why someone would hate this film because when you look at some of these scenes they're just complete nonsense like it just doesn't make sense and there's just no attempt you know unearned is the word i used before and it it's here again they don't make any attempt to tie all this stuff together they do give you reasoning for bond jumping around fair enough or at least something so it's not too shocking but they didn't for this one and it's the most absurd one at all and i'm just not into bond jumping around the place like this i'd rather it like he can do it just have it have more of a point and have it work more this just for a film about space just get on with it (laughs) It's on the poster, right? You know what people are watching this for. They've just seen Star Wars. They want to see more space. Want to see um, more space? Yeah. Also, I will say that scene with M and Q and Bond in that room, I did write down that for, it just had terrible audio as well. Like, oh, I don't dear. know what was wrong with the microphones, but it was like it was like the boom mic wasn't pointed towards the person speaking. So it was almost like you're just hearing it in a big open room. It, yeah, really bad. Really bad. Yeah, really bad. But... Yeah, so now we're going to jump. I'm trying to put it all in my head. So what was it? It was Africa, California, Venice, Rio, Mexico, and now we're going to the Amazon rainforest. Yeah. yeah. Which it probably does... It To me, the fact that he goes to the Amazon does mean like they probably are trying to make some effort to make it more Brazil-based, but they've kind of like... That, that ship has sailed at this point. It's too late, boys. You can't make it Brazil-themed <laughs> now. We're too far into this and we still have to go to space. Unless you want to send, have a Mardi Gras in space, this ain't going to work. Oh, well, that'd be something. Carnival in space. Carnival on the moon. Yeah, I'm up for that. Oh, yeah. So we then cut to Bond on the, the Amazon River, just driving a boat. And my notes just have so much like confusion in here. Because I'm just like, now that he's just on the river in the Amazon, it just makes you question what just happened before. It's like waking up from a dream. You're just like, what was that? <laughs> was that real? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Am I now just back in the film? Uh, so yeah, so he's driving down and he checks his map. And as he's checking his map, he sees a load of explosions going off in the river or something being shot out. And we see that there's a load of guys on another boat firing mortars at him. So it's another boat chase, everybody. Another one? Yeah, I was just thinking, where's the boat chases? What's going on? Need more boat chases. What has been the best boat chase so far in this series? What's like the number one boat chase we had? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think I could pick any of them anymore. <laughs> what was the boat chase in Spy Who Loved Me? Oh, that was... Oh. Was there one? Oh, there must have been. I feel like there must have been one. They can't help themselves. I can't remember it though, so it can't have been that good. I mean, obviously, the car is what you remember, right? Like, I'm yeah. trying to think, like, what was the boat chase? And then I just remember the submarine come, like, oh, yeah, that was good. But no, what was the boat chase? <laughs> I guess the end of Thunderball, if you want to count it, but Bond isn't actually in a boat in that one. Yeah. Am I so, really yeah. going gonna to have to pick from Russia of Love, even though I really didn't like that bit of the film? <laughs> you didn't like it. Just, <laughs> winner but by that, default. That's the best we've got. It might be. They just haven't done boat chases well, have they? No. 
They really I don't want to say I hate boat chases. I just feel like every time they do it, they just can't quite get that formula right. And it makes me think of that Quantum of Solace boat chase, which also wasn't very good. So I don't think we're going to improve anytime soon. All good. Well, let's just get through this then, because this is a very standard kind of, at least the first part is where Bond is in a Q boat or, you know, a boat from MI6. So initially he drops some might. He has, they very clearly show it. There's like three buttons that he has, which is not a very good way of doing it because you know what's going to happen. He has three buttons for three different gadgets. A boat shows up, he hits the first button. That drops mines, it blows up the boat. I mean, awesome explosions, I have to say. I really like the shots of the other boats blowing up and all like the dummies they put <laughs> on the boat yeah. when they blew it up. So you just see this like dummy go flying in the air that's meant to be a person and it's it's so not a person um, that I came back around on. I actually quite liked it. Yeah, I liked to. Uh, I don't know if the music has kicked in at this point in the in the chase, but it uses it does use the From Russia of Love music. Um, yeah, yeah, that classic, the the gypsy camp, the Thunderball uh, underwater fight scene, and there was another one, but I can't quite remember it. Uh, yeah, that theme is back. We haven't seen it for a few films. Yeah, I'll happily take that theme, even if it's just with another kind of boring boat chase. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's very cool to see that back. But eventually, we see Jaws. Is on one of these boats and he starts directing the boat. He's firing a gun at them. So Bond then hits the second uh, button on his boat, which is a torpedo. And we do get a nice little moment here where the torpedo misses, but then you see it in the water turn around and spin back and then blow off the boat, which a nice little moment. But at this point in the film is when I wrote this, oh, my notes is when I wrote this film is really boring. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> I was so bored at this point. And I think it was because the you know the Rio stuff, I quite liked that bit, but even then it's just at this point it's just when it was dragging so much. Like from Venice to Rio and this boat scene isn't very good and I was just so switched off. Just so not interested in seeing another boat chase that we've seen so many times before. I know we've already complained about it, but this is when I read that feeling really sunk in of, and it's something I haven't had before, just boredom. Like, I've never been this bored watching a Bond film up to this point. Like, yes, there was extended stuff and very long scenes and like live and let die in that boat chase, um, but I never really got bored. This, I, well, this was just pure boredom at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to see that on the poster. Pure boredom. Pure boredom. <laughs> pure, Five stars. Not just a little bit of boredom. Pure boredom. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm not quite there. It's quite interesting this film because it's almost like it. It finally, we haven't we haven't discussed the ending yet, but it finally changes the the template of the ending being bad or the ending being like dragging on and and just not really enjoying the ending. Whereas like we're we're wanting to get to the end of this. We want to get to the space scenes because we know they're coming up. And it's like now it's like everything leading up to it is like, oh, get on with it. Get on with it. Yeah, we haven't had this at all. You're right. Like it's it's because we know where it's going that everything else feels like padding where normally they get to that finale somewhat. You know, you, you just spend an extra half an hour at the end. But yeah, you're right. I hadn't thought about that. But, you know, we know why, because of the mm. budget, because yeah. <laughs> they couldn't spend half the film in space. So instead, they've kind of padded out with quite standard Bond affairs and stunts and stuff. Like a lot of this film is just a lot of kind of quite standard Bond things. Not not necessarily a bad thing in some cases. I, as I've already said, I think some of this stuff works quite well on itself. It's just it's a load of stitched together standard Bond tropes until we eventually get on a rocket ship and go to space. Yep, that's it. So this all ends up with a waterfall is coming up. So they're getting to the end of the river. Bond sees the waterfall. So he puts on a helmet and then shoots these like wings coming out and lets the boat go and he paraglides out, which actually I did quite like that. Like that did. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, do, I do like the ending. At least, at least the boat chase has a good ending to this one because it is cool. Yeah, so he paraglides off in quite a cool, little bit silly but cool moment. Very Roger Moore, uh, peak Roger Moore Bond right there. And Jaw sees the waterfall and panics. So he goes to turn the boat and just rips the steering wheel off. And then the boat with Jaws just goes over the waterfall. <laughs> and it actually did make me laugh. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, Is it because of the dummies again? Yeah, it was the dummies. But I, 
I was all in, well, not all in, but I was out for some comedy Jaws at this point. I had switched gears. So seeing Jaws just panic and rip the steering wheel off and then fall off and just so clearly. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think it goes back to the same thing that makes me laugh or made us laugh about the whole like man falling off the mountain and on a Majesty <laughs> Secret Service. There's just oh. something innately funny about someone just like, oh. <laughs> Oh, that scene yeah no you're right you're totally right so i liked it i i agree it's a good ending and that bit was actually quite funny it's just too bad it was just another boat chase if we didn't have the venice boat chase i probably would have quite enjoyed this yeah exactly we have why do we need two boat chases in this film just leave this one in get rid of that first one i guess they're cheap yeah i guess so so this leads to Bond paragliding down into the, the Amazon rainforest and we get some very bad shots here of Bond crashing into a tree and landing, like very awkwardly edited because it's supposed to be Bond lands in a tree and then climbs down, but you just get these like really bad shots and then Roger Moore just dusting himself off at the bottom of the tree. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah, I buy that, sure. <laughs> so Bond is now landed in the forest. Don't know what his plan is. I guess he's just looking for flowers. Who wouldn't enjoy that? And... By circumstance, just finds a, a beautiful young woman in a white no, dress. No, get a waterfall. Off. Surely not. Yeah, doesn't matter where he goes, there's always going to be a beautiful young woman there. Yeah. So he follows her. And we see this woman go through quite a lot of the forest. And she goes a long way. Like, I don't think she's properly dressed for this. The Amazon <laughs> rainforest is not just like a nice rainforest. Like, there's snakes. Oh, Actually, there's snakes, humid. all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's snake. Yeah, you're right. Uh, so Bond follows her, and it takes ages. Ugh. Uh, but eventually, she goes to like I guess an Aztec temple. I'm not sure if Aztec is the right era, but to me, when I see these big long stone stairs going into the middle and this like pyramid type shape, I, I'm just like, well, it's Aztec, right? I guess. Yeah, it's like Aztec Mayan. I think Drax does say it at some point in his little spiel, but it's of that of that type. Yeah. Yeah, very yeah, that classic looking kind of temple. So he follows her inside and we find out that it's the woman from the glass shop from before. So the mm. one that was sitting in that glass shop that let Bond look around, it's her. And she curls the finger to, to beckon Bond over. And then we see a load of women show up that we have seen all throughout the film. So we see the astronauts who were training when Bond was in the helicopter and we see the the tour guide who was also at the glass place and we see a few other things which actually I really like this it, it was a little bit odd but like there was some it was kind of a nice payoff in terms of like seeing these all here like it doesn't actually pay off at this moment but it did add kind of this surreal moment of like oh yeah all these people that we saw for like two seconds are now all here just made it feel very otherworldly that these would all come together like this I really like this bit, partly because of, yeah, what you're saying. Like, there was actually, it kind of sounds bad to say this, but there was some actual planning here where all of the women have shown so far that, yeah, they, they are here. So, as you say, tour guide, that lady, all the women that are around Drax, because they change. Like, there's two at the beginning when we first see him, then there's two at the shooting. They're different. So they're all now combined. And it's like, okay, that's kind of, as you say, it's a cool little payoff if you had been taking notice of that. Um, and the other thing I really liked about this scene, even though it does go on a bit, you're right, where Bond is following this this woman into this cave system eventually, is the music. I thought the music was probably one of the best bits of Bond music I've heard so far. I don't I don't really know how to describe it. I mean, it's kind of like mysterious and a bit airy and a bit like, ooh, but it was just a really nice theme. Um and it's so strange that it's happening now with like not really a very interesting part. Like Bond is literally just following this woman going from A to B. But uh, yeah, I, I I was kind of carried by the scene just by the music alone, to be honest. I don't quite remember the music, but I'm trying to remember because there was one scene coming up, which I f can't remember exactly what it was, where I do like there's a piece where it's like, that's an amazing song. And I had the same reaction to you, but to something else where I was like, this is probably the best piece of music I've heard in a James Bond score ever. Mm. Uh, so I need to go back and listen to this song that you're talking about because I missed it. Because yeah. I, I agree, if we want to talk about the music for a bit, I think this is the best score by far I agree. had in the series. Yep, 
I, I agree. Yeah, I really like the score. Like, it just does a really nice mix. Like, it's not quite as over the top as we've had with John Barry's previous score and Bond in general. And there's still quite a lot of variety in it, like The Spy Who Loved Me. But it's just more, I don't know, focused on being good music. It's not trying to be trendy or maybe some things with the space opera stuff. But it's not, like, trying to be, like, 70s trend. It's kind of being its own thing. And it, it does it really well. There's, like, a lot more piano being used throughout the score. And it's kind of, it's just it's just really good. Like, I don't see this being topped anytime soon, but it's it's really awesome to have John Barry back and to kind of, like, just smash it out of the park. Like, if you haven't heard the Bond, uh, the Moonraker soundtrack, go do that. It's it's excellent. Oh, that's it, isn't it, really? I think it's it's John Barry back. Uh, nothing against, who is it, Marvin someone for The Spy Who Loved Me? And The Chipmunks, yeah. Marvin and The Chipmunks, that's right. It was fine, and even before that, we'd had... The Man with the Golden Gun, which John Barry said he didn't really like. So he's had a few years now. That was what? That would have been five years since The Man with the Golden Gun now. So he's back and he's he's back with a vengeance, like to make a good soundtrack. And, and he did. Like it's, it's a really good one. Mm, like he yeah, really stretches. Like he really proves how much of like just an actual good composer. Like he's not just the guy who does the Bond songs. Uh, this is him doing something different and it works really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, there's all these women surrounded by, uh, what well, in this cave system, the woman who was beckoning Bond, she walks over this uh, bridge, over this water pit, and it's kind of a bit of a, a, a red herring. I, I guess if you're a Bond fan and you see a bridge like that, you kind of know there's something gonna, something's going on with that bridge. That's definitely going to collapse and drop you in, for sure. It just has that look about it. But obviously she walks over and it's fine. And Bond does not do that. He instead walks around the water um, and like on this very specific rock. But I guess in this cave, nowhere is safe because this one rock that Bond is standing on just so happens to flip up and toss him into the into the water. I like to think that every rock is ready to be flipped <laughs> in this place. But like there's just this big control panel and someone was watching him. Like, okay, that one and go. So it's uh, just the the club from Live and Let Die, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sit anywhere, Mister Bond. <laughs> That's exactly we'll it. any any table, any rock. Um, so yeah, he's he's in the water and he gets attacked by a I guess it's an anaconda, right? I mean, it's huge. I guess so. Um, yeah, it's, it's a giant snake. I, I thought like python or something, but yeah, anaconda is python. probably correct. Yeah, either way, it's Bond wrestling with... We've kind of seen this before a little bit with, like, fake snakes, especially in Live and Let Die. Um, this one's a little bit better, mainly because it's underwater, so that kind of hides a lot of the crimes of, of yeah, this man just wrestling with what is like a big cuddly toy, basically, <laughs> it looks like, because uh, you just get really, like, frantic shots and bubbles and splashing and... There's a couple shots where you see the snake and it has the same issue of the mouth is just open the whole time, um, just like in Live and Let Die. But it's over quite quickly. They don't really dwell on the scene. Bond takes it out using uh, the pen, using Goodhead's pen that has the syringe in it. I guess he took it with him or or Goodhead gave it to him. I don't know. It's one of those things that's not explained, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and... Yeah, then I can't remember how he gets out. Oh, he gets picked up, doesn't he? Yeah, because a certain someone comes in and picks him up. That's right, yeah. So he kills a snake, but of course, not even a, a waterfall can kill Jaws. He's there, and he um, grabs Bond and yanks him out of this little this little uh, water pit. And um, there's Drax. They're all there. Drax is here, and... Can't, I really can't remember what it says in this scene. You might have to help me here. Oh, no, we get a great little line. I really like this line from Drax where he just says, you define all my attempts to give you an amusing death. Like, <laughs> I love the self-referential, like, yeah, they have tried to kill Bond in some very kind of silly ways. And I like the idea that Drax, and I don't know if this is what they were going for, because they show him being a hunter, right? And being very fancy and over the top with a lot of this stuff. Like his demeanor isn't like that, but he surrounds himself like that. So I kind of like the idea of what this is hinting at is that he wants to kill Bond in a very silly over the top fashion, which is why like all these sort of things keep happening. It just keeps failing. 
but Drax is so kind of cocky and such a hunter and feels so into control, he kind of doesn't think, maybe I shouldn't do that. But he just, I like the idea of Drax is self-aware enough, like, yes, this is pretty dumb to have Bon follow a woman, to put him in a pit, to then have him be, like, strangled by an anaconda and drown. But I like the idea that he's doing that on purpose. I think that's, like, it's a small line, but I think it's a line that adds quite a lot to what's happened to this point and what Drax is all about. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And it is good of the film because it is, you know, yeah, he could have just shot Bond anyway, could have shot him uh, while they were hunting or like doing the, the shooting, but no. Um, and I think that does tie into a little bit like at the end as well, like how, how eventually the villain dies is like he, to the bitter end, he still wants to take out Bond in, in a nice manner. Like he doesn't want the easy way out. Um, so yeah, anyway, Drax is there and they kind of usher, usher Bond into... Uh, this big control room and I did think of you when I was watching this bit because it's not quite as bad like it's definitely a good set and it's not the same as we've seen before but it is another example of a villain base at least this bit in a cave or at least with rocks I I wrote that down I was like rocks rocks Rocks. again we can't do rocks people more rocks more more metal but at least and this is one I think was visually quite cool. Like they go into this, this control room and it's like a triangular shape, like pyramid almost. And there's all these screens on the wall. And there's obviously people everywhere working and like dealing with all the shuttles that are launching and stuff. Like it's it's definitely a striking image. You know, we've kind of should, should be used to these by now. They always seem to, although they are like often caves of metal, every now and then they do have these these cool looking designs. And I think this is one of them. Um, and this is, this is, where we don't quite get the full Drax plan, but we do get Bond talking about the uh, the toxin and the orchid because there's like a there's one of them in a suspended in like a glass globe or something, and um, yeah, it's basically giving Drax the chance to talk about how he's been developing this this orchid, which originally. So this is where he was mentioning about like these ruins and how they originally were home to the civilization that killed themselves off because this plant leads to sterility. Um, and now he's he's sort of like done genome and everything like that to make it kill everything. Well, not everything, kill humans specifically, but leave animals and plants alive. And all while this is going on, you're seeing, as I say, like the people around him launching um the moonrakers because there's it's like thunderbirds there's like moonraker one moonraker two moonraker three and you're seeing on the screens all of these shuttles going up and and uh into orbit so it does he also does reveal why like this whole thing started with the the thing we saw in the the pre title sequence and and it's like when i when i watched this but i was like oh really so the whole reason why they stole that shuttle at the beginning back from the americans is just because one of the ones he was building developed a fault and he needed one. So he just he just stole it back. I was like, oh that's a that's a bit of a, a bit of a sad way to kind of have the whole reason for the film. Because like couldn't he have just built another one? Like he seems really rich. I don't know. I appreciate they put this line in to explain it, but it feels like they put it that that's the only reason why it's here. Like it's not a core part of the plot. The whole thing that triggers all of this is yeah, like Drax just needing an extra ship. So like, yeah. oh, I already gave a ship to somebody else, and if he didn't do that, he probably would have got away with it, no problem, because Bond yeah. or anyone would have been involved. But because he was like, no, oh, I really need an extra ship, and I want to do it now, so we'll just, <laughs> oh, but we'll just steal it. It'll be fine. That's the thing, isn't it? It just got really impatient. It's like I want to kill. I want to kill humans now. <laughs> but like the worst case scenario is like, how many people was he like putting on that ship? It wasn't that many, and he still launches like he would have launched like five or six of them. Like it's not, would have been that big of a deal. I don't think. Let's just say there's a lot of plot holes here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, so um, he's given you know he's done the, the typical villain and started off like started to explain his plan. But then I think he just says like he's grown tired of Mr. Bond. Uh, yeah, he's time to get rid of him again, but like this time for realsies. So he orders um, his henchman to go take Bond. What does he say? Is it, it's like, it's some- like, yeah, it's like, oh, Bond must be very cold being in that water. Go and take him somewhere for warmth. 
Mm, yeah. So that ends up being underneath the shuttle, like the, the launch pad. Um, well, he goes in. It doesn't look like that. It looks like a kind of control. It looks like this desk with loads of seats and screens. And I was kind of impressed by how it all folded back because I think that was an actual thing. And I was like, oh, that's actually, that looks really smooth. But it all folds away and it turns out like the doors open and it's actually, yeah, they're underneath one of the um, the space shuttles that's about to launch. Uh, the one that he's going in, actually. So he's about to go up into space and there Bond finds Goodhead. So as we as we saw, she was still in the ambulance, so she was kidnapped and um, she's been left left there to burn as well. Yeah, like this whole section of the film was a little bit odd for me because I just think of Goldeneye, the video game, because they had a big old Moonraker level, which I played all the time because you got a space gun and got to go shoot people. And I think the Baron might have been in that or something. Like, it was a weird mashup. But this was, like, a very famous part of that film or that game, sorry, for me. So this all feels a little bit weird. So those triangle screens you were talking about before, as soon as I saw them, I was like, oh, yeah, that level in GoldenEye. <laughs> Wait, there's... Uh, wow, I did... I must not have played as much GoldenEye as I thought or I just have a really bad memory. I do not recall that level at all. It's uh, it's the bonus level. So it's after Cradle, there's, like, these bonus missions. Uh, oh, it might be called, like, okay. Crypt or something. No, it can't be... No, maybe it was. But I think this was the one... Maybe I've got this wrong because I can't quite remember. But, like, the Baron is in one and you go and get the Golden Gun in another one. We have to walk along the spe specific path to get it. And then there's you know, this bit where you, like, yeah, somebody's in there and you've got to escape from this room as it's about to be burned up. It's Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there. You know what the sad truth is? I was probably just so bad at GoldenEye that I never completed it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's a hard game. It's not easy. That's what, I probably never saw this stuff when I was younger. Maybe it's I really need to cool. go back to it now. Yeah. But yeah, so yeah, so they're in this boardroom. And as you say, this this thing just folds into itself and the whole top opens. And we see Drag standing there doing a little bit more monologuing. No idea what he says. He's just like, bye, I'm going now. And <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, the footage is so clearly added in over the top as well of Drax in this, like, room. <laughs> like, it wasn't shot at the same time. Right, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Probably using, yeah, some sort of matte painting or something like that. Yeah, like, you could see the gaps in it, basically. So Bond and Goodhead are in this room about to be blown up, and Drax is standing up atop, which is where the thing is uh, imposed. So he's like, bye, die, <laughs> please. And then he leaves and get in his Moonraker in the spaceship and straps in. All while Bond says, like, ah, oh, let's go to the air vent. And, like, opens up his watch for some reason. And, like, pulls this, like, string out. Attaches it to the air vent. Runs around the corner and hides. And Goodhead hides on the other corner. And then it explodes the air vent. Which, I want to say this was, like, a gadget from another film. But... I. I just didn't recall this at all, like where this came from. I don't think it's. I don't think it was shown before. I think it's just one of those gadgets that we've seen before, where it's like, "Yep, Bond has this, and he's going to use it now." Just assume that he has lots of gadgets we don't know about. It's just really odd because it very clearly connects into the vent. There's like a port, and it like connects into it, but I don't know why. <laughs> Isn't it just like some explosive on the end though? Yeah. And he just doesn't he just stick it on next to the vent? Yeah, but there's like a gap for it almost. Oh, okay. Oh, right. It's all a bit weird. Like, yeah, obviously he's going to escape or something, but like, I guess it doesn't bother me too much because we've seen this before with like Live and Let Die. They're just kind of more open to just Bond having these gadgets. And this is just kind of another one of those. I think the fact that it's not a core part of the film and we're about to go into space means that people don't really think about it too much. But yeah, it's a bit silly. He just has an explosive watch thing. But it doesn't even look like an explosive. It's just like a wire. So it's... A, but anyway, he blows it up and they escape. Mm. Of which he gets a very good line. Did you write this line down, Joe? Uh, He had to fly. No, that's the one later on. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he they blow that up and then he leaves and then the thing shoots out and a load of fire follows them. And Bond says, bang, on time. Bang on time. That's Bang on good. time. That's, that is quite good. Come on. It's great stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they get through the fence and we see all the astronauts, all the young people we saw before getting on. And 
uh, or, or not getting on so yet. They're just kind of still in the base. So there's still lots of people all in their golden, yellowy space suits or the uniforms. And Bond and Goodhead are hiding. Uh, eventually they hide in a cart and go through this like underground cave section, which gave me really strong Star Wars vibes. Like this felt like something from Star Wars, just with the way like it was kind of structured. Oh, I bet I'd love to hear that. But yes, that's all. Yeah, perfect. Keep saying yeah, that. <laughs> it was just I hadn't got that to this point. But yeah, it was like this massive cave and it like kind of had all these like pillars that like curved up quite naturally and stuff. It felt like something from like Tatooine, like underground, something like that. Mm. So I, I guess I'll get this through quite quick because they hide in a car, but then jump off. And then they like steal another car. So there's two other henchmen who just very kindly just stop for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they just run up to them and they stop and just like awkwardly slap and beat them up steal their gear, drive to one of the Moonrakers. So those people were like the pilots of one of the Moonrakers. So they go to where that is. They just happen to know which one that is, I guess. So they then get on the craft strapped down. Goodhead says, hey, don't worry about it. We don't have to fly this thing. It's on a prearranged flight program. So we can just sit here and the craft takes off. And that finally takes us into space. We made it. We made it into we're space. We're in space. Uh, I mean, it's it's a good start because I one thing I wrote down as you're getting these shots of them um, in that in that pre rescheduled flight, and it's one that we should have I should have known this because even back in You Only Live Twice, I remember commenting that the pre pre title sequence scenes with the the spaceship and that sort of stuff looked good. It looked good back then. I mean, how many years later are we now? Of course, it's going to look good better. But they, if there's one thing, as you said, where they put the money. And the one thing they did get right with this film, I think, is like these sort of shots of the shuttle and eventually when we get to the space station and the model work. And yeah, there's clearly some effort put into the ending here. Yeah, the models are great. Like, it looks really good. So like, yeah, we see all these moonrakers in space and eventually we see this giant city satellite place. And yeah, all the models look great. I don't think they were quite as smart about it as like Star Wars. Like, I would still say Star Wars looks way better than what mm. this film does. Oh, yeah. Because this one, I think, is more trying to aggressively shove the budget they spent on this in your face and has to do the whole, look at all these explosions and stuff and look at all this crazy stuff happening in space where Star Wars, they do do that, but they were just smarter with it. Like they knew when to use the models and when to kind of not and they, they put it together a bit smarter. This one, Moonraker, is a bit more all over the place. So there's still some shots that don't look great. Uh, but there's also a lot of shots that do look great and the model work is really good. It's just, I think they really wanted to have a Bond style ending in space. So they didn't really kind of change it in order to make it look good. They just did a Bond style ending in space. I will say though, I've just said how great all these exterior shots are. I can't quite say the same for all of the interior shots. And the, why I'm saying that now is there's this one shot of, as they're heading towards this place, this space station, they're all converging and it, yeah, they don't have anything to do because it's pre-programmed. So you just get this shot of um, Goodhead grabbing a clipboard and a pen that are floating. <laughs> and oh. that one doesn't look as good. Like, it just it just looks bad. Like, they do not look like they're floating. And it's like, Stanley Kubrick nailed this in 2001 A Space Odyssey. And that was like, what, 10 years earlier? <laughs> like, that you can do a good floating pen. Like, there's, there's an exact scene like that. But this is not it. This is not it. Yeah, I thought that was bad as well. Like the zero G stuff in general is quite bad. It is literally that joke of, oh, you can see the strings. Like, yeah, yeah, there's exactly. There's several times in this film where I saw the strings and never really bought this zero G. Like, yeah, it never worked. And this is true for this. And it does take you out of it a little bit. But something that doesn't take you out of it is just like how great these shots were, look and the music. Mm. Uh, this is kind of very much generally the scene so the whole scene is them in space following the other moon rakers they eventually see some sort of base uh down like quite far out which isn't on the radars they're like well i don't know what we're heading towards but eventually the base is kind of exposed to be this giant almost more well, city i think is what they describe oh, it as it's that's a great space. shot as well oh. yeah yeah so it's this big kind of city in in space but throughout this is quite a long scene because it's treated very like on an epic sort of way like all the music is very space opera is very big very kind of 
things like that but it's, it's meant to be treated very big like this is something like out of star trek or something like that i haven't really seen star trek but i would imagine oh you're missing what, out i would imagine that's what this is like it's all very slow all very big and i like it because it feels very different from the rest of the film which was more of a bond affair which wasn't like this and now we have this more classical space opera and they treat it as such as we see everything go through space so i do wish we got here sooner but I do quite enjoy these shots uh, for what they are. Yeah, it's kind of, it's like monkey's paw thing here because it's like in the last film we said, oh, the ending in the tank is too long. I wish we didn't spend as long here. And it's it's like, well, okay, you've got your wish. We don't spend as long in this at the space station, even though it's like, oh no, this is the stuff that you do want to see. It's just, yeah, it's a shame. Yeah, it's definitely a shame. But throughout this as well, we see that all the people that, the young couples or the young women we were seeing before, they're actually on the ships. So those are the people who are being transported to this big city in the sky. And there's some sort of reference to Noah's Ark where Bond is saying, like, oh, yes, it's, you know, it's Noah's Ark. It's young people. It's it's people to reproduce and, and make a new world, basically hinting at a, the plan and Bond kind of putting the pieces together to what Drax's ultimate plan probably is. Mm, yeah. So Goodhead eventually, yeah, she realizes that all these shuttles are converging at one point at this at this space station, and they're all going into like a docking mode. Uh, you do see one person in particular go out and go into the space station and sort out the gravity. <laughs> I guess they're like, right, we can't have zero G for very long. Let's get someone in there quick. Um, so he goes in and makes the shuttle start spinning. And I guess like there is a bit of science there, right? With like centrifugal force or centripetal force. Um Anyway, that starts to simulate gravity. So then they need to, they don't have to do the whole slow-mo walking and having the, the strings everywhere. Um, and then once that's done, everyone starts to board. And you just see like tons and tons of people will start flooding in. Like how the hell do they all get here? Like, yeah, because he room? turns on life support as well. So everyone oh. is just not in full astronaut gear. They were, but now they're just kind of walking around. Like it's, it's just a set. <laughs> Clearly. Yeah, exactly. So... Uh, you get all of the, like the scientists coming on, then you get um, all of the the men and the women, the, the Noah's Ark pairs. They come in, and everyone's going to their stations. It's all a bit mad. It's like, wow, this is quite an impressive little uh, setup that Drax has got going on here. And Bond and Goodhead obviously come in as well when they're sort of trying to stay undercover to an extent. And Drax, you, you're so right about the whole like Drax is like he's very he's a very egotistical man, right? Because he's there up at one of these. Uh, on this like walkway bit and the lights go down and there's like a spotlight on him and he's there basically to finish telling his plan and how um as you say like they want to make a a new generation of people they want to start again with like i can't remember the exact wording he uses but it's all very much like i am your god i am creating this new world we're gonna we're gonna destroy what's existing and start afresh so yeah, it's thing. like untainted cradle of the heaven <laughs> Heavens. oh there you go yeah. yeah so um and he's he's the creator of it all so you're getting like you're getting crazy crazy like god <laughs> uh stuff here so um then you get so this is where like this whole scene in the space this whole ending bit it does it does move it does move quick so with that bond and goodhead kind of reflecting on the fact that they it wasn't visible on the radar they realize that there must be a jammer somewhere that's jamming the signal and if they unjam it someone on earth will hopefully see it and do something um because they're getting has he launched the i think he's shown off like basically he's sending out the globes of toxic gas to kill everyone on on earth don't know if he's done that yet but that is the plan um so i don't think quite yet but also very briefly during throughout this we see jaws and dolly get on as well oh yeah they're, they're so too. when drax is talking about super race and you have been selected because you are perfect specimens and the best of the best you see like jaws look a bit annoyed because <laughs> <laughs> he's talking about all these perfect people and this super race and he's like wait a minute that don't like this ties in later but it made me yeah. laugh jaws being a bit annoyed <laughs> about like you are the perfect specimens jaws is like mm, yeah you think he's talking a about me you get a bit of like confused or conflicted jaws there, like a little bit of eyebrows, like, mm. yeah, that's right. 
uh, and it's planting the seeds, as you say, for later on. So um, they, Bond and Goodhead, go off to go find the radar jamming section. Like they're really helpfully like following all that. It's very well signposted. This space station. They're like, oh yes, uh, level ten, and so they they head off that way and go in there and sort of mooch about a bit because there's two scientists in there and eventually they take them out um kind of nice that they both do it it's not just bond like goodhead actually does a bit of action as well and takes out one of the guards and eventually she she goes onto one of the control panels and starts fiddling about and eventually turning off the um radar jamming and it's like i just found it so funny how they're, they're saying this for um Oh, hopefully someone sees this now that there's it's on the radar and it like immediately it's like straight away like sir there's something in space you cut back to NASA or somewhere or wherever they are and you're getting the guy saying like oh yeah we've spotted something and and there's a commander who's saying oh send something up <laughs> like, just go and investigate send up a shuttle go and have a look so we're, we're like getting in motion the the climax like the battle because someone's coming now to go investigate the spaceship. Uh, yeah, the spaceship. Does it have a name? Does he ever give it a name? I feel oh, like... it must have a name. It must have a name, right? I mean, you, you have oh. Atlantis. Surely Drax would have given it a name. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I never picked up on a name, but no way he didn't call it a name. Oh, you also get Gogol. I forgot Gogol appears in this bit. Yeah. He recur he, he, he definitely, yeah, has a few visits in these films. He's there on the phone kind of saying, oh, yep, yeah, we've noticed something. It's, uh, the American guy saying, hey, we've noticed this. It's not us, um, so don't do anything. And Gogol was sort of like, well, okay, we'll give you some time, but if not, we're going to be angry. And he just goes back to bed with a beautiful woman in it and it's like <laughs> in his bright red, red pyjamas. Oh, even even Gogol can't escape a bit of like comedy now. Like Everyone's in it. Everyone. Yeah, I didn't think much of that joke. <laughs> it was just... We're like, oh, okay, we're just going to do a whole Gogol is sleeping with a beautiful woman, which is why he's up. Because, yeah, it's the Americans and Russians talking to each other, but okay, all right, I, fine. <laughs> but I didn't really <laughs> recognize it as Gogol from the last film. To me, it was just a Russian guy, so I was like, that's weird. But the fact that it is the same person from before does make more sense why they would do a little joke. Yeah. Yeah, and he, he, he comes back again. He's in, um, he's definitely in a view, was it a view to a kill? Yeah, I think so. Hmm. Yeah, I wish I had more to say about the actual space station itself because we've already had a little bit of a scene here. It's all kind of been set up, but I do like the scenes in space, but in terms of the design of the space station, like it's good and it's definitely a lot better than the tanker from the last film. Mm, oh, yeah. But it's just kind of like a space station, isn't it? Like I don't... Like the fact that we've seen so many like iconic space station designs like from Star Wars and probably more famously like alien as well this one feels more i mean it's james bond so it makes sense feels more grounded as in this is probably just a lot of this just looks like a space station so it's like that's not a bad thing but i kind of it doesn't really stand out in the same way that a lot of other films are very kind of like intentionally try to separate their space station designs i feel like moonraker just doesn't have that identity that you get with a lot of these like space films yeah, that's true. I I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt in that you know, it's like what, 1979. So, you know, it's early days, I suppose, for this sort of stuff. We're, we're maybe thinking of that, having known like newer films. Although, yeah, I suppose Alien would have come out by this point, right? So, yeah. It's around that. So it's not bad at all. It's just, I think it's it's just something, yeah, like we've had a lot of iconic kind of sets from Bond and I don't think this is really one of them. Not because it's bad, but just because the genre has so many more iconic, memorable sets that no one's really thinking of it. I think the more iconic element of this is the uniforms that everyone's wearing, where everyone's wearing these like golden uniforms. Like to me, that's what I remember more than the actual kind of space station itself. I, I, I do quite like the whole aesthetic going on here. I like the set. I like the uniforms, as you say. I like all those like tubes, the glass tubes everywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then like tied that with the, the model shot that we get outside. I think altogether, I do like it. I do wish it had a name now, though. Now I've said that, I'm like, surely it must have a name. I'm going to Google that afterwards. Yeah, Paradise Lost or something. Like, <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, That sort of name. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the Americans have sent up a shuttle to investigate this city. So we go back to this satellite or space station 
And we see that Drax, this is when he starts launching the globes. Oh, okay. So globe number one is then launched, which is a globe full of the toxin, which I think they say will kill like, oh, it's an absurd number, they say, like 50 million people. Like it's something utterly absurd. Like each globe will kill like 50 million people. It's something like that. Right. Uh, So Bond is still sneaking around. So at this point he hasn't been caught, but we see Bond and Goodnight there and Jaws just comes up behind him unnoticed crosses his arms and just smiles at them and this triggers a little fight scene which feels really pointless like it's very quick but it's another classic roger moore pointless fight scene because he punches jaws in the mouth and hurts himself which yeah we know (laughs) like we know that why did he do that he already tried that before yeah it's really silly that he did it again but then He kicks Jaws in the groin, and I think it makes a metal sound. (laughs) It does, it does. Implying that he's got some metal down there. Uh, it's Yeah, I like that gag, though. I I know I sound like a hypocrite, because I've been saying how I don't like how much they've made Jaws a comedic character, but I guess, like like you say, by this point, you have to be all into it, and it's just, like, so silly. Yeah, he's he's got metal teeth, and he's he's got some other metal stuff, too. (laughs) It's just the only point of this little fight scene here is for that joke yeah uh, i guess dolly's a lucky woman I suppose. <laughs> or not i don't know it depends yeah it depends what she's into <laughs> rust might be an issue <laughs> oh. uh so anyway <laughs> oh my god <laughs> uh yeah so bond has been kidnapped uh jaws eventually does overpower bond and take him away <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm still laughing at that. Right, sorry. I'll anyway, back into it. Concentrate. Yeah, yeah, Bond. <clears throat> this is a serious film, Joe. Sorry. sorry serious so film. Sorry. Serious stuff. <clears throat> um, yes. So, so another Moonraker is launched or something. That's why I've got in my notes. I don't really know. Um, and yeah, Jaws takes Bond to Drax. And I'm assuming Good Head as well. But I stopped mentioning her in my notes. So I guess I just didn't care at this <laughs> point where she was at. Just, yeah, she lingers around. She's around, like, it's space, she's not going anywhere. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so Drake, well, Jake is talking to people and sees, like, hey, check the radar jamming. And the guy says, yeah, that's failed, that's not works. And Drax then sees Bond and they have some sort of talk about seasons or something. This is where, like, I don't really think the dialogue is bad between these two. It just feels so meaningless and... They're doing some sort of analogy about winter coming or, oh, this is your winter. It's it's just nonsense. Um, I don't remember that at all. They're they're talking about seasons. It's just... The only thing I wrote down here was that Bond calls it a flying stud farm, which I thought was quite good. Yeah, that's a (laughs) great actually. I'll give him that one. Yeah. So globe number two is then launched and Drax explains like, hey, we have 50 of these things and that will wipe out the entire human race with the plan being that they're going to kill everyone. Not the animals, though. They'll still be okay. And then once the gas all wears off, then the super race people... I think the super race people are meant to have children on the space station and then send them down. Mm -hmm. I think he says something like that. But yeah, yeah, he's developing a super race by killing off everyone um, and then going back to Earth once everyone's been killed. Which is another one of these post-Spectre plots where it's like, it's the same as Stormberg, really. It's like, I'm just going to build a new world. But his way of doing it is like, I'll just gas everyone, I guess. But everyone since, like everyone for a while now, just, well, the last two films, he just wants to kill everyone. I kind of miss Scaramanga where it's like, I just want to shoot Bond because that sounds like a fun time. (laughs) Yeah, I will say after two films now where it's like proper megalomaniacal, just end of the world thing, I'm looking forward to the next film, which I think is going to be a lot more low key. I, yeah, I don't hate these plots, but as you say, it's two in a row. Just two in a row. Plot. Yeah. They're just trying to make it bigger and it doesn't necessarily feel bigger. Um, but then we see that there's a spacecraft approaching. So this is the American spacecraft appro- uh, is approaching them to investigate. And Drax says, hey, just use the laser that we have to destroy it. And says like, hey, we've got a... Yeah, we're equipped. Don't worry about us. We're going to take care of this. So Drax then takes Bond and Goodhead to a... What would you call it? Because I, I put escape pod, but it's not an escape pod. It's like a hatch. Um, would you just call it like a door? But I, I'm sure it has like a... Is it like a hatch? Oh, yeah, 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 a hatch. That's exactly it. Yeah, a hatch, which would shoot them out into space. So he shows them there, and 
Bond then asks Drax because Jaws is the one kind of grabbing him and moving him along with the henchman. And Bond asks Drax at this point about his plans a bit more and about this perfect race. And you're saying like, well, surely anyone who doesn't meet your standards of excellence and beauty will be exterminated. And he's all like, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> of course I'll do that. And at this point, Jaws looks worried and Dolly nearby looked very worried as well. Basically, Bond is trying to expose the fact that Drax is probably not going to keep Jaws around in his plan because Jaws is not part of the super race that he has envisioned. So Drax then says, get rid of him, like expel them, kick him out. And Jaws is kind of thinking about it. Drax, for the first time, gets very angry, starts shouting, which I thought was quite a nice touch. Yeah. Um, Because I think this is supposed to be kind of parallels to his dogs at the very beginning of the the film. And he probably sees Jaws at the same way that he sees his dogs and where his dogs obeyed him. And he was fine and in control. Now we have Jaws, who he probably sees the same way, who doesn't obey him, which is probably why he gets very angry and mad. Yeah, he starts screaming like, you obey me. And it's, yeah, it's quite nice to get, so far he has been very calm and collected and you now you're seeing kind of like the seams break a little bit and like the hair go a bit out of, out of order. And yeah, it's good. Yeah, very, very nice kind of touch. So eventually Jaws thinks, forget this, and starts fighting and Bond starts attacking the guards and there's kind of this big fight. I think eventually enough guards kind of surround them with these like black sticks, which are like taser sticks, which mm. we have seen earlier. But yeah, they don't have guns. I'm assuming because you don't want to fire a gun in a space station. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, instead, not great. like everyone has like sticks, like tasers. And that's how they take people down. Yeah. If only Bond knew that's all it took to take down Jaws is a... <laughs> Is a little stick that that sparks him. That that would have done it, apparently. That would have done it. Q Q messed up. <laughs> he just likes to overcomplicate things sometimes. Just get yeah. a taser. There you go. <laughs> I've got you this watch. Double seven. It's like could really do with a taser. Actually, yeah, we we should have. He should know that from the train fight in the last film. Doesn't like electricity. There you go. Hmm. But during this, so they're captured again. But Bond sees an emergency stop button. Which apparently is for like the entire space station, we shortly find out. Like it's not just a... I thought it was to stop the globes being shot or something. But no, it's... He scratches his head and then just lunges and presses the button. And the entire city stops spinning. Which breaks the simulated gravity and everyone starts floating about. And this is where you see so many strings. Yep. Like so many people just held up by strings and... You see more of the fake slow-mo, so everyone kind of moves along and kind of falls over because it stopped, and now everyone's back in zero G, and it's just so fake. (laughs) It just doesn't, it just doesn't work at all. It's one of those things where it's, for me, I was finding myself, if I just sort of like, don't focus on any one thing on the screen, it's all right. (laughs) But then as soon as I like look at one person in particular... Oh, yeah, they're just moving slowly. And then, oh, that person is, I can see there's the string. It's like, I just need to almost like when you're trying to do like an optical illusion and you sort of try and cross your eyes a bit. <laughs> it's just like, don't don't look too closely. Yeah, you always want to say like back in the day on a smaller TV, you would have been fine. But I feel like in a cinema, this still would have looked kind of Oh, off. yeah, yeah. All blown so. up with the strings and stuff. Like, that's just so obvious. <laughs> All right, if you're going to do the whole slow motion thing for zero G, which, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable thing, thing to do. You're not going to get everyone on a wire. So if you're going to do that, at least, like, make sure people do it right. I know you have a lot of people in the shot, but just a bit more training. You know, that's all you need. But this is what I was kind of saying, like, with Star Wars and stuff, they don't do stuff like this. They didn't try to have it. They didn't stop a ship and have everyone fling forward and then start floating because they were smarter than that. But this one... They're just not smart about it. Like, they just shouldn't have done these shots because they can't do them. So Star Wars just didn't do those shots. But James Bond tries to do it and just kind of messes up. It's not a big deal, but it does take you out of it a little bit. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, they shouldn't shouldn't really have tried. Although in doing this, in stopping the space station, um, it does... I think it doesn't stop the laser, does it? But I think it just makes the laser miss because it, like, stops suddenly. Hmm. Yeah, so the, the American space shot was still there. And I can't remember, do they come out first or does does Drax send his henchmen out first? Or I think the Americans come out first. Yeah, they're all there and you get them in their little jetpacks and 
ready with their laser guns. It's this is right, but now reaching the part of the film that I think a lot of people make fun of. Um, I mean, there's enough to make fun of so far, but this is definitely one of them. We're getting to the laser space battle because yeah, the Americans are there. Then Drax sends out his um, his henchmen in the gold, and they have their own space lasers. And the next few scenes is just like utter chaos. <laughs> it's just. I, at one point, I was like looking at the screen because I paused it to write a note, and I'd paused it with like on that wide shot where there's lasers everywhere, and they like have the lasers almost coming towards the camera, and I was just like, "What am I looking at right now?" Oh, it's nonsense! Like the people just don't look real in the slightest. No, just no. little loads of little figures just all placed along this scene of space with just a load of lasers put over the top of it. I, I can appreciate them trying this, right? It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, maybe, like like what you said with the whole gravity, they shouldn't have even attempted such a scene. But, you know, they, they have the insert shots, like people lasering um, the backpacks, like the oxygen tanks, and then they just spin off and explode. And uh, I, I can appreciate it for just how silly it is. I don't mind it. I do wish that they had better laser sounds. I think that's one of the things that makes it a bit seem a bit worse is that they have really kind of dweebish laser sounds i want some I proper so as well i want it some ones with like punch yeah yeah you want it to feel like a bullet like but they've already established earlier in the film in bloody mexico that mm -hmm. when the laser hits something it melts it which oh, yeah. kind of takes away a lot of the punch from this scene that's a good point it's just weird clearly the americans have uh well better or worse laser guns than we do I don't know. <laughs> it's just, yeah, like this is just the fundable underwater scene just in space. Yeah. And oh, yeah. Like they shouldn't have done it. <laughs> they should have done it. Like I would have, I don't know what they should have done. I'm up for a big laser fight, but it just looks so bad. Like they try to make it because, you know, we've seen this with, they want the big scale two sides fighting each other. Like from You Only Live Twice and Thunderball and then also The Spy Who Loved Me. And this is them trying to do it and they just needed to tone it down. Like they should have just had it be inside the space station, not little figures floating because it just doesn't look good. Mm. <laughs> I didn't dislike it because it was so stupid, but it just, for what they were probably going for, a big intense action fight, it's just so, so ridiculous. Yeah. Again, it's like when they should have lesson learned from, from Star Wars if you're going to have these space things, have them inside like the Stormtroopers. If you want to have outside battles, it's got to be in a in a spaceship. It's got to be in a spaceship. Yeah. Uh, so while that's going on, the US ship itself actually does dock because the, the space station has stopped. The US shuttle docks and a lot of people do actually storm it. Um, and while this is all happening, the fur globe is shot as well. And we see Bond, Goodhead, and Jaws just kind of hanging out now and fighting a load of guys. And they eventually kind of meet up with the US guys who have stormed it. And they end up storming the main control room. And we get like a load of explosions everywhere, which I find so weird because you're in space. Like, mm -hmm. like I'm glad no one's throwing grenades or stuff, but it, they do the same thing they did with these other ones with the spy who loved me and that, where it's just like well, it's a big fight scene, so let's have a load of explosions everywhere. And it's just, I didn't really like this one. Like, I didn't hate it, but it's just like, there's just no impact to it. Just a load of people in space and just a few explosions and just a load of lasers. And yeah, it, it just doesn't look very good. I liked it more than Spy Who Loved Me. Purely just, I think, aesthetics wise, even though, <laughs> actually, I... I... I say this as a negative, but I actually did love it. I love how much the walls are actually wobbling. Like we haven't, <laughs> we haven't, we haven't quite got to it breaking up yet. But when it does, like those walls are wobbling so much, it's it's ludicrous. <laughs> it's just <laughs> this is meant to be something in space, and I I kind of like its absurdity there. Yeah, you're right. I would say it's better than Spy Who Loved Me because it's it's shorter and more to the point, and mm. just yeah, it's just more. It's something different, right? Where the Spy Who yeah. Loved Me kind of wasn't, but. Yeah, I wish they just didn't... They're so clearly trying to fall back on Bond tropes because they think that's what people want rather than playing to the strengths of what they have. And this is just that. It's like you could just replace the tank a bit with lasers <laughs> and have some wobbly white walls and there you go, same scene. Yeah, that's exactly it. 
One thing that this film does get better, though, one thing we mentioned in Spy Love Me was that was a bit of a, a bum note was Bond versus the villain, um, just shooting Stromberg, like, point blank, pretty much. Uh, whereas in this one, I think it's better. So you, you do get Bond chasing Drax um, very briefly down to the end of a corridor um, where Drax is there with... Well, is it an escape hatch? Is he meant to? Is he trying to escape? I don't think he's trying to escape. It's just he, cornered. He might be, but yeah, I think there's just hatches everywhere. Oh, okay, I see, right. So um, Bond's there and Drax manages to grab a laser gun off of a dead body nearby. So, and I, I do, I love how much at this point Drax just looks terrible. <laughs> His hair is all over the place. He looks panicked and scared. Obviously his plan is falling apart around him. There's really great lighting in this scene where like the lights are kind of flickering almost and it's like darkness sometimes and half his face is in shadow and it's very atmospheric. So you get him um, with a gun. So like he think he says like, oh, at least um, I'll be able to put you out of my misery or something like that. Kind of tying back to how like he really hates Bond, this guy now. He really just, even if he's going to die, he's still like his last thing he wants to do is kill Bond. So um, Bond's there uh, and he's, puts his hands up because he's got, he's got a gun on him and because he still has the dart gun he kind of flips up his wrist and before Drax has a chance to shoot he shoots him with a dart gun and uh, I presume it's the one with the cyanide because uh, he sort of like drops the the laser gun and like um, grabs his chest and falls backwards and is falling towards the back hatch that he was in front of and Bond walks up and sort of ushers him more into this escape, uh, into this yeah escape hatch, and just pushes him inside. And um, I wrote down the line here: "Take a giant step for mankind." That's what he says mm. as he pushes him in and closes the door. And uh, yeah, uh, jets him out into space. You get this. You get this. I kind of like this shot. The shot of uh, Drax getting sucked out. Where I don't know how they did this shot. It almost doesn't look real in a way, but. Yeah, like he gets pulled out backwards and then turns and you get like a bit of a scream and this vacuum suck sound effect and um, and that's the end of Drax. I, uh, I, I'm just so pleased that we got a good villain ending. I was really happy with this. I like the ending, but this is where it kind of really hammered home that the rivalry between these two kind of just sucks and it just isn't quite there. And I think for me that takes a lot of the kind of venom and the kind of the weight of this. Like, it's, it's totally appropriate, like, Bond using his watch gadget and pushing him out and the, the line taking a giant step for mankind. Like, it all totally makes sense, and it does work. It's just, yeah, I this isn't like the Goldfinger one where seeing Goldfinger get sucked out of the plane is somewhat satisfying because of the rivalry that those two had. And I yes, they spent a decent amount of time speaking. It's just in, that connection just wasn't there for me. So, good death. I just think the villain falls a little bit flat at the end here because I kind of realized like, oh yeah, these two don't really, like, yeah, Drax doesn't like Bond, sure, but he was just kind of messing around with Bond and yeah, they, I, I just didn't feel the connection between the two. So still, oh. good death, just not quite, just a bit lacking compared to some of the other ones. I, I also liked how the gadget use here made perfect sense as well. Like, mm. It's not like Bond quickly does something to distract him and, and then uses the the watch, the dart watch. Like he's putting his hands up as a sign, you know, because he's, he's given in or pretending to give in. Um, and that's how he uses it. It's like, yeah, that's that's how you use a gadget and you make it satisfying because it it all just makes sense in the moment. So, um, yeah, that Drax gone. But obviously the the pods, or the globes are still out there and the spaceship is still <laughs> wobbling to destruction <laughs> around them. So um, they have to go and work out how to get rid of these these three globes that have been sent out. How do they yes. do that, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we do have a little bit of a scene here where, like, the villain's taken care of and Al Bond has to escape and save the day still. So everything is just completely tearing apart. So he meets up with Goodnight. I don't know where she went before. Don't, don't ask me. Um for me, so we're good night again. Bond tells the US guys because they've now completely taken over the control room and taken everything over. And I don't know when that happened. Apparently they just won. Good job, boys. <laughs> um, so Bond just says, get, go back, leave, get back to the shuttle, get out of here. 
Um, and one of these, like, so the city kind of has this big control area, then like these like tubes, these big long corridors connecting to it. And one of them kind of completely rips off and starts kind of turning. And I think this is where you see those wobbly walls inside that corridor. Right. As it completely separates. There they are. Uh, so, but then Bond is needs to find a way to stop the globes from getting, uh, distilling the, the nerve gas on everyone and killing them. So he says that Moonraker 5, Drax's ship, has a laser gun so they can use that. So the Americans run off, they get back on their shuttle and leave. Uh, Bond and Goodheart... Goodheart? That's not right. Good, good head. head. I wrote good heat, but I was like, that's not right. So I'll oh. say good heart. It's like, well, that's not right. A few times in my notes, I put good night as well. I, yeah. is... I did notice you said good night a couple of times and it did trigger oh, did me I? Sli- It did trigger me slightly. I'm going to say it. Ah, oh, I didn't know. But yeah, sometimes I did say good or well, write good night, but it's not a good sign. So yeah, they're running. So they, they get to the Moonraker. So they get in there and they're ready to set off. But the docking release is jammed. They can't leave. They can't release the ship, so they can't get out. And we then cut to Jaws looking around because he's still here. He's everyone. still alive. Yeah, yeah, he's still going. So trying to find his girlfriend, he eventually finds Dolly. They run into each other's arms and decide to kind of accept death, it seems to be, on the cards today. So Jaws finds some champagne. Very nice. Uh, opens it with his mouth mm-hmm. on the cork. Pours a little champagne. They They have their uh, champagne glasses there it came it came with glasses which is very helpful and they go to toast and jaw says for the first time well here's to us oh it's a really nice moment in my head i kind of thought i wish he said we have all the time in the world <laughs> <laughs> that would have just been perfect and then blowfield suddenly drives by with frau yeah. Bunt. No, <laughs> she's just resting with a laser gun <laughs> <laughs> and melts <laughs> and melts Dolly's face. <laughs> Blofeld in a neck brace as well. <laughs> just yeah, just in a little escape pod going past. <laughs> drive by lasering. <laughs> we have all. <laughs> uh, oh. Why did oh? That's a great ending there. Why didn't that happen? Damn it! Next time. It was still nice though. It kind of it almost made the whole girlfriend thing with Dolly pay off because it was just a sweet little moment. As you say, they're accepting their fate and just having a nice drink. Yeah, I like it. This is kind of the for keeping it. It's kind of nice to have Jaws because you need to kill off Jaws, don't you? Like they need to kill it off. So I actually, I guess, just to talk about Jaws for a minute and the whole him turning good, I actually quite like that. I think some people don't, but for me, I think it kind of makes sense. Like, you're giving him an ending where he's going to die, but he's like, does kind of redeem himself. And I think the fact that he was such a comedy character to begin with kind of justifies the switch. Like, if he did that in The Spy Who Loved Me, you'll be like, what? The guy that bites people? What are you talking about? But if it's like the guy with a girlfriend who dresses up as a clown and is just quite a silly Billy and falls off waterfalls and stuff, I'm like, yeah, I can buy that guy with Switch. Um, so I actually kind of like this little bit for Jaws, him switching and then getting to kind of enjoy his death, but actually killing him in a way that makes sense because he's in space and explodes, and dies. Like, they balance it quite well. Obviously, you have to buy into the idea of comedy Jaws, but if you do like I did, then I think this all plays out quite nicely. I hate to burst your bubble, Tom, but they don't die. What do you mean they don't die? They don't die. I mean, we're, skipping ahead, we're skipping ahead a little bit, but once it's all done, one of the people, like one of the men in the command center at nasa says oh we're picking up a um some li- some life signs on a on a p- escape pod a tall man and a short blonde woman or something oh was that them yeah oh i missed that i just assumed they die oh that's a i bummer. kind of i did i kind of preferred if they did die to be honest with you but anyway um i do agree though with everything you just said like the situation they put jaws in makes it work so much more for get- turning good and i don't mind it either i quite like it uh, you know, you, you can kind of think, A, the situation with the whole Drax's plan. Yeah, that makes sense that he would want to survive that situation. And B, you know, maybe Dolly has brought out the nice side of him. You know, maybe that's all he needed was a woman in his life. He's and, a changed uh, man, that's true. He's a changed man, exactly. So I, I, I like it too. Yeah, yeah, quite a nice ending there. But uh, Bond... <laughs> <laughs> so, but this really made me laugh where Bond is just... 
in the ship trying to figure out how to leave and just looks over and see Jules and Dolly just waving at them. <laughs> like, hi. <laughs> so then Can Bond's we... like, Jaws, can you help me out? We can't get rid of the uh, we, we can't get rid of the docking release. It's jammed. Can you help out? And then Jaws just gives like a thumbs up. <laughs> okay. I got your pal. Don't worry about it. Although actually oh. Dotty whispers in his ear, I think. And then eventually he's like, yeah, I've got you. Thumbs up. Yeah. And we Thank see. Thank God for Dotty. Yeah, Dotty knows what's up. It's like, you got to save that man. And Jaws goes over, bends a pipe, snaps it off, and that frees the shuttle. And the shuttle is now leaving and... I think Bond makes a line saying, don't worry, they'll make it. It's only a hundred miles to Earth. <laughs> I, think, I don't know if that's him being sarky or not, because apparently they do make it. I don't know. Yeah, they do. But I thought it was them just making a lighthearted joke about them dying just to take off that edge. But no, I guess they're fine. Yeah, I guess you can't. Everyone loves Jaws. They just couldn't They couldn't do that. They couldn't do it to the fans, even though they really should have. Yeah, the kids who were watching probably would have been very upset. Got posters of Jaws on their wall. <laughs> <laughs> not <Very> jaws <laughs> uh, but that all ends and the whole thing explodes which is why it doesn't make sense but this is where we get a big old explosion of the space station and oh, that's yeah. that the space station is gone yeah it's like i read that it was like they just shot it with a shotgun it's like yeah that will do oh, it. that's awesome <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so in the let's, yeah this, this end bit let's just in this ship, in Moonraker 5, they are chasing after the um, the three globes that have been launched already. Uh, they have, obviously, yeah, Drax, Drax's laser on this one, so they use the laser um, auto-firing for the first two. Um, kind of works, just bond us just to press fire and it's done. Uh, but the third one, because it's so far away and they have to catch up and they're getting kind of closer towards the Earth's atmosphere and Goodhead is saying how, like, they're starting to burn up and they're starting to skip on the atmosphere and it's making the um the laser malfunction like the targeting system so they have to go into manual mode so bond is there um with the like the joystick pretty much um in the manual targeting mode and this is like meant to be the end tense bit is he going to do it they've only got a certain amount of time left before they they burn up so um yeah he he misses a couple times and then he shoots it, and they they do it. <laughs> I don't really yeah, have much to say about this. You sum that up very quickly. That's this seems a little bit longer than you're letting on. <laughs> it is, but it, that is really just the gist of it. They do drag it out for a bit of suspense, but not not much else happens really. Yeah, I didn't mind it so much. The main thing that bothered me was the good whatever good person's acting is terrible because like they're skipping on the atmosphere, burning up, and it's meant to be tense. And she's just like, she just sounds bored. Just like, oh, you got to shoot it now, James. She sounded bored the whole way through the film, to be honest. I'm not a big fan. Sure, of but I guess she's never been in that crazy of a situation. But this is like pretty nuts what they're doing here with this Moonraker shuttle bouncing off the atmosphere, shooting a laser to save like millions of people. She's just like, oh, you got to come on, James. Last chance. Hey, let's get it done. <laughs> she's very level headed. <laughs> yeah, well, that's one word for it. Cool as a cucumber. That good head. She's got a good head on her. Oh, yeah. Oh. There it is. But there anyway, is. let's let's wrap this up. <laughs> so we cut to a, a control room, which is where the people are talking. And this is why I missed this, because I thought when they, they talked about two survivors, I thought they meant Bond and Goodhead. But you're right. If they're saying it, it's a tall person and a blonde woman, it has to can only be them. They might not say blonde. I don't know if they would know that, but I think it's definitely tall person and maybe short woman, they say, or something like that. So yeah, oh, it's okay. definitely there. Yeah, so in this room, Q and M and the Ministry of Defense are all there. And this man is... Such a jokey bit, this bit here, where this man is just talking about how, wow, what a big success this is. And we're going to patch through to the space shuttle who saved the day. And we're going to patch in the White House and... Buckingham Palace and the Queen is going to be watching. It's just oh, so <laughs> over the top. And eventually we do cut to the the feed itself and it's Bond and Good Night lying together naked, kissing and M's all like, ah, 007 and what's going on? And the Ministry of Defence says, my God, what is Bond doing? And Q says, I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. Oh. And Bond, yeah. Yeah, Bond smiles at the camera turns it off 
and Goodhead asks, take me around the world one last time, and Bond's like, oh, why not? And, and like a kind of funky version of the Moonraker theme kicks in, and the credits roll. Yeah, it's like a yeah, like a disco remix version of it. Um, yeah, I do like I, how I didn't Q like this gets. Bit. <laughs> did you not? I liked how Q got the line, which yeah. is a bit different. Um, but no, it's 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 we've seen this so many times now. It's like, yeah, this 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 is done. They really hammed it off for this though, which is why I didn't like it. Like this one man enthusiastic of being like, it's so great. This is going to be amazing, and I think the idea is that you know what's coming, but. To me, that made it a little bit much. But you're right. Q saying the line is quite funny in itself. Yeah. yeah. So that was Moonraker? That was Moonraker. Uh, I think it's me to go first. I think it is, yeah. Yeah, so here we go. So my expectation of this film, I wasn't too sure what to expect. I, I thought it was going to be worse than The Spy Who Loved Me. But going into it, I was kind of up for a city Bond space adventure. Like... That side of it just doesn't bother me. I totally get why people do get bothered by it. Bond in space is probably just too dumb for some people, but I'm kind of up for that. That's totally fine by me. Um, but what we got was a film that's just so all over the place. Um, like, I think it overall ends quite well. I do quite like the space stuff in general. I feel like we didn't go massively into detail about it, but it is overall still quite enjoyable. It's just takes so long to get to that point and a lot of the stuff just feels so kind of disconnected and there's so many jokes that just don't work in this film and it just feels so patched together that i just can't really get behind it i mean the good stuff is i think drax is pretty solid i am a little bit disappointed by like i like the actor and him overall i am disappointed by that lack of chemistry i feel like he has with bond which I think is such an important part of the formula that even Stromberg, it was a little bit better. Not great, but a little bit better. Um, that I feel like that is kind of missing. And I do really like the music. Like I said, this is the best score we've ever had in a Bond film. Like, that is pretty good. So I would still overall say I enjoyed it. Like, there's a lot of stuff I don't like, but I like the Jaw stuff. And I think the opening sequence is good. And there's a lot of kind of standalone things that I think do work. It's just when you put it all together and have these moments that fall quite flat with the comedy is when it kind of sinks and just doesn't reach the heights that perhaps it should. So for me, Bond in Space sounds pretty good. Uh, but when I look at my list, I think that means that I couldn't put it above like the classic films. So that means I'm looking at The Man with a Golden Gun, which is currently my second highest Roger Moore film. It's not going anywhere near The Spy Who Loved Me. And I would say I enjoyed The Man with the Golden Gun more. I think there was just more I enjoyed about that film. Or I felt a little bit more consistent. And then I look at Live and Let Die. And that one's a little bit more tricky. Because I think there is a lot of stuff in Moonraker that work. But when I look back to Live and Let Die, I kind of feel the same. I did enjoy that film, despite the terrible boat chase. So I think I'm going to put it underneath Live and Let Die. Um, I'm not going to say it's... I'm not even going to entertain the idea of putting it underneath Die Himself Forever. Like... This doesn't reach that level for me. Uh, so I'm going to put it at number 10. So underneath Live and Let Die and above Diamonds Are Forever. But I would still say overall I did enjoy it. Like I didn't come away like annoyed or regretting my time with it. It's just as a complete package I think it falls down. But there is enough that I liked about it that I would still say like yeah pretty good time. Pretty good time here. And I like it more than I think I used to before the rewatch. It's just... Yeah, when I compare it to the other Bond films, it's just down there for me. And so I'm gonna to have to put it at number ten. Wow, that's so, like that's mad. So you like you saying all that stuff about liking it, but it's second to last. Well, I like all these films. I like one the to thing, ten. Yeah, I like them all. So I'm not comparing a film I hate to compare it. Like you know, Diamonds Are Forever is the only one I hate. Like everything else, I like Live and They Die. I think that's a good film. And I think I like Moonraker and I think it's a good film. I just have to rank it below it because I had a better time with Live and Let Die. So do you think going forward there's going to be it's going to be films now in between Moonraker and Diamonds Are Forever? I think so, yeah. I don't see Moonraker being bottom five, but it probably is still going to be quite low down there. But I don't see it being bottom five. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, it just goes to show like this the solidness of these early films for you where you can like this film but all those other ones are still better yeah yeah that's that's the problem i had i just man with the golden gun when i looked at it initially i was like no i actually did quite like a lot of parts of that film 
And I think the best of the Man with the Golden Gun is just better than the best of Moonraker. And then I just kind of like live and let die a little bit more. But that's just a personal taste. I totally get why someone would like Moonraker over Live and Let Die. Mm. Speaking of which, so mm. <laughs> um, for me, as I mentioned, this is this is my number four on my top Bond films previously when we first started this podcast. And I had a feeling that it wasn't, and the fact that it was one I kind of watched most recently before starting this, I had a feeling it wasn't going to move too far. Um it's it's such a mixture of good and bad though it's it's as i said before it's like the spy love me on steroids it does some things it takes that and does some things really well um and it takes that and does some things really badly because of it so bad stuff wise like i really I, the, the rio section in particular is the part that really drags for me which is a nice as i say it's a nice difference to the ending usually being the bit that drags but yeah just the bit before in rio i didn't like the cable start cable car stuff um that being said, I didn't love the Bondola bit in Venice, but it's fine. Um, and yeah, the ambulance bit back in Rio and like the Mexican weird cowboy bit. That's random. Get rid of that. Uh, Jaws, I am kind of sad how much they just took him as a comedic character completely. And as you've said, once you kind of let your mind accept that, it's not as bad. But I still wish they would have tried to keep him more sinister. Um, but that just wasn't to be. Um, and also. I, I just didn't find Bond very likable in this film. He just has a lot of people killed behind him <laughs> unnecessarily, like these poor people. And also just his chemistry with most people I didn't love. I think he, a lot of cocky Bond and just a lot of, yeah, just unlikable Bond in this one, unfortunately. That being said, I really did like the music. We both said that we would like the music here. Um, I liked a lot of the action scenes were quite good. I liked the whole centrifuge room. I liked the end scene. I liked the the spaceship, the space station battle. I think all the space station stuff was pretty darn good. Um, the fight with Chang I thought was pretty good. And I thought Drax was a pretty good villain. I, I liked Drax a lot more than Stromberg personally. I think it did have a better connection with, with Bond to me. So I think that brings it, that brings it up. That being said, uh, it's still going below the spy who loved me. Um, still not quite as good as that so it's going just underneath uh, just like before it's going at number four for me no sorry number three um number three so my top three is still from rush of love the spy love me and then moonraker and thunderball next okay yeah. so you're still looking at moonraker and thunderball and saying moonraker is better yeah as i thought i'm the more i watch films the more i'm gonna find ones that top thunderball to me so that's why it just slides in neatly here yeah, I look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like for me, like Thunderball is clearly like personally again, I I definitely prefer Thunderball to Moonraker, but like they're eight spaces apart on mine. I should also mm. say in terms of um, Moonraker being number ten for me and below those is it goes back to what I said, kind of I think at the bow chase about boredom. Like that is another thing where overall I'd still say liked it and glad I watched it. But that was the most bored I've ever watched a Bond film, which kind of brings it down in that list. Yeah. Um, and I even with Live and Let Die with the terrible boat chase, I never felt boredom. And I think that's the worst thing you can do with a Bond film, be bored. So enough good stuff in there, which I would still say, yes, I liked it. But yeah, don't bore me, Bond. Don't do that. <laughs> it really, a Bond film really, it can do a lot of things, but it should not be boring. It can be bad, but bad is better than boring. Yes, in yeah, for the most part. So that was Moonraker. I am not looking forward to the next few weeks. I think you should look forward to the next one, at least. I hope it's, so. It's a bit of a come down from what we've just had the last two podcasts of. I think, you know, they noticed that they went a bit too far maybe with this one. So in Fear Eyes Only, we're going to get, I think, a bit more, I don't want to say gritty because it's still Roger Moore, but a bit more maybe down to earth of a story. I mean, I know it's supposed to be quite a... Like people do like this one, but I've just got a bad feeling. I got a real bad feeling that, that I'm not going to enjoy it. And if I don't enjoy it, then I, oh my god! Did you like, like what I did there? By the way, down to earth. No, never mind. Ah, there, he, there he is. <laughs> right at the strong. end. I'm still going. Damn. <laughs> I still got it. Still, still got it, folks. But yeah, I'm just a little bit nervous. I hope I do like uh, for your eyes only, but. After that, it's like, what, Octopussy and 
uh, oh. <laughs> abuse or kill. Yeah, it doesn't last long. This this feeling. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like like you have the kind of slow Guy Hamilton Roger Moore films. Then you have these like bombastic Lewis Gilbert ones, and then you have the the John Glenn era, which is a uh, certainly an era. Mm hmm. Oh. All right. <laughs> I should be optimistic. Let's be optimistic. Yeah, let's be optimistic. I, I, I actually am because I put this one, I, I put the next one quite high up on my bottom film. So I'm looking forward to watching it and hopefully changing my mind. I hope so too. If I rank it above The Man with the Golden Gun, that's a success in my eyes. I'm just yeah. worried that I'm going to create the Roger Moore depressed, <laughs> the pit, <laughs> grim <laughs> era of my list. Yeah. 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 Well, we'll see. We'll see. He's only getting older, so I'm not excited about that. <laughs> don't worry they put more and more makeup on as it goes on. oh there we go yeah 80s just plaster makeup. it on plaster Smart, it on yeah. by the end just stop sending him to hot countries you're halfway there i just use like one of those you know homer's shotgun makeup <laughs> i just blast him <laughs> yeah a q version of that yeah exactly all right so any last thoughts before we go <sighs> i still can't believe you believe you made that comment about uh <laughs> Jaws and rusting. That. Don't bring it up again. Just leave it. <laughs> I have to. It's great. No, I'm going to be thinking about that now. I really shouldn't leave it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for planting that image. <laughs> for context for people, like, the reason why I've made that laugh is because it's like 20 to 12 at the moment. <laughs> we record these a little late. Uh, so I like the idea of Joe going to bed. I imagine a big nightcap being like, ah, rust. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be dreaming of Jaws tonight. Dreaming of Jaws. Oh, that, oh, that's a hell of a line. Dreaming of Shorts tonight. We've got to end it there. All right. Okay. Thank you very much for listening. You have been listening to episode 11 of the Bond Revisited podcast. The Bond Revisited podcast will return next week with For Your Eyes Only. <laughs> <laughs>